are intrinsic physical properties, such as surface reflectance properties, three so our phenomenally red experiences might attribute a specific physical property, which we can call physical redness. On this view, color experiences have Russell Lian content that involves the attribution of these properties. However, it is possible that experiences with the same phenomenal character, perhaps in a different community, can have different Russell Lian contents of this sort due to differences in the perceiver's environment. It follows that Russell Lian content is not phenomenal content. For free gene content. If one thought that all content were Russell Lian content, one might conclude from the foregoing that experiences, or at least color experiences, do not have phenomenal content. This would require denying the strong intuition that experiences are accessible for accuracy in virtue of their phenomenal character. The alternative is to hold that phenomenal content is something other than Russell Lian content. In the previous chapter I suggested that perceptual experiences, like linguistic expressions, have both Russell Lian and free gene content. Where the Russell Lian content of a color experience involves a property attributed by the experience, such as a reflectance property, the free gene content will be a mode of presentation of that property. On the face of it, color experiences attribute colors under a distinctive mode of presentation, one quite distinct from a physical mode of presentation of a reflectance property. It is natural to suggest that this distinctive mode of presentation corresponds to a distinctive sort of free gene content. On the model suggested in the last chapter, where Russell Lian content involves extensions, objects and properties, free gene content involves conditions on extensions. In particular, the free gene content associated with a color experience involves a condition that a property must satisfy in order to be the property attributed by the experience. For a phenomenally red experience, the condition is something like the following, the attributed property must be the property that normally causes phenomenally red experiences, in normal conditions for the perceiver. This free gene content is a natural candidate for the phenomenal content associated with phenomenal redness. Free gene content accommodates inversion scenarios quite straightforwardly. We have seen that two phenomenally red experiences in different environments can have different Russell Lian contents, one might attribute physical redness, while the other attributes physical greenness. But their free gene contents will be exactly the same, both are the condition that picks the property that normally causes phenomenally red experiences in the perceiver. As in Chapter 11, the perceiver will be picked out under an index Eichel mode of presentation that can be shared between two different perceivers. Due to differences in the environment, this common free gene content yields distinct Russell Lian contents, the condition picks out physical redness in an ordinary environment and physical greenness in the alternative environment. All of this suggests that free gene content is a plausible candidate to be phenomenal content. The free gene content of a given color experience can itself be seen as a condition of satisfaction. To a first approximation, the free gene content of a phenomenally red experience will be satisfied when there is an object at the appropriate location relative to the perceiver that instantiates the property that normally causes phenomenally red experiences in the perceiver. To a second approximation, one might want to give a corresponding free gene treatment to the attributed location property, as I discuss later, and one might want to give a free gene treatment to the object of the experience, for example, holding that the Russell Lian content of the experience is the specific object and that the corresponding free gene content is the condition that picks out the object that is causing the current experience. For now. I abstract away from these matters and concentrate on that aspect of the content that is associated with color. Still, however we flesh out the details, this free gene content will be a condition of satisfaction for the experience. If the perceiver's environment meets the condition, then the experience will be veridical, if it does not, the experience will be non-veridical. The arguments in the previous chapter suggest that free gene content is a much more plausible candidate to be phenomenal content than either physicalist or dispositionalist Russell Lian content. Compared to physicalist Russell Lian content, it accommodates inversion scenarios much better and also accommodates the intuition that phenomenology is internally determined. 
compared to dispositional Russell Lian content, it accommodates the claim that the properties attributed by color experiences are non-relational, it avoids problems associated with index eichel individuation of dispositional properties, and it more easily accommodates the claim that things could have been as they perceptually seem to be even had there been no observers. So there is good reason to think that phenomenal content may be free gene content. 5. Phenomenological Adequacy The hypothesis that phenomenal content is free gene content has many virtues. In particular, it seems to capture our intuitions about the environments in which an experience with a given phenomenal character will be veridical, yielding a condition of satisfaction that is determined by phenomenal character. Still, there remains a cluster of worries about the view. This cluster of worries concerns what we might call the phenomenological adequacy of the view. Simply put, the worry is that free gene content does not seem to adequately reflect the phenomenal character of an experience. In particular, one can argue that when we introspect and reflect on the way that the world is presented in the phenomenology of perceptual experience, the phenomenology seems to have properties that are in tension with the free gene view of phenomenal content. These properties include the following. Relationality. Intuitively, it seems to us that when we have an experience as of a colored object, there is a certain property, intuitively, a color property, that the object seems to have. And intuitively, it is natural to hold that the phenomenology of the experience alone suffices for it to seem that there is an object with that very property. That is, reflection on phenomenology suggests that there is an internal connection between phenomenology and certain properties that objects seem to have. One could summarize this by saying that the phenomenology of color experience seems to be relational, in virtue of its phenomenology, a specific color experience seems to relate us to a specific color property. If this point is correct, it suggests that color experiences have Russell Lee and phenomenal content. In a critical discussion of the free gene view, Shoemaker, 2006, brings this point out by an appeal to the Murian transparency intuition. According to this intuition, we attend to the phenomenal character of an experience by attending to the properties that objects in the world appear to have. An extension of this intuition suggests that we discern similarities and differences in phenomenal character by discerning similarities and differences in the properties that objects in the world seem to have. This suggests a strong connection between phenomenal character and Russell Lian content. Shoemaker says. The phenomenal character of veridical experiences of a given color can be different in different circumstances, example different lighting conditions, and for creatures with different sorts of perceptual systems. So the same color will have to have a number of distinct modes of presentation associated with it. To say that this variation is only a variation in the how of perceptual representation and in no way a variation in what is represented seems to me at odds with the phenomenology. When the light brown object in shadow and the dark brown object not in shadow look the same to me, the sameness is experienced as being out there and in such a case the perception can be perfectly veridical. Similarity in the presenting manifests itself in represented similarity in what is represented and in the absence of perceptual illusion requires that there is similarity in what is represented. More generally, the best gloss on the Murian transparency intuition is that the qualitative character that figures in the perception of the color of an object is experienced as in or on the perceived object. Shoemaker 2006, 475. One can also bring out the point by appealing to an inversion scenario. Jack and Jill are phenomenal duplicates but live in different environments. Jack's phenomenally green experiences are normally caused by objects with property X, while Jill's experiences are normally caused by objects with property Y. Shoemaker's point suggests that even if Jack's and Jill's experiences are associated with distinct properties, X and Y, there is a strong intuitive sense in which the objects look to be the same to Jack and to Jill. That is, the phenomenal similarity suggests that there is a common property, intuitively, a sort of greenness, such that the relevant objects look to have that property both to Jack and to Jill. This intuitive point stands in tension with the free gene view. The free gene view entails that Jack's and Jill's experiences share a mode of presentation, 
but it does not entail that the experiences represent a common property. In fact, it suggests that Jack's and Jill's experiences represent distinct properties, X and Y. So it is difficult for the free gene view to accommodate any internal connection between an experience's phenomenal character and the properties that it represents. A related point is that phenomenologically, a color experience appears to represent an object as having a certain specific and determinate property. Intuitively, the specificity and determinacy are tied very closely to the specific and determinate phenomenal character of the experience. According to the free gene view, while an experience may represent a specific and determinate property, its phenomenal character leaves the nature of this property wide open. The determinate property represented may depend on matters quite extrinsic to the phenomenology. This seems to conflict with a strong phenomenological intuition. Simplicity A second objection is that free gene contents seem to be overly complex. One might say that they over-intellectualize the content of an experience. According to this objection, the phenomenological structure of a visual experience is relatively simple. The experience represents certain objects as having color and shape properties and so on, and one cannot find anything like the normal cause of such and such an experience in the visual phenomenology. On the face of it, the normal cause relation is not phenomenologically present at all. It is something imposed after the fact by theorists rather than directly reflecting the experience's phenomenology. A related objection turns on the fact that free gene contents require reference to experiences. Properties are picked out as the normal cause of a certain type of experience, and objects might be picked out as the cause of a certain token experience. Here one can object that the perceptual phenomenology does not, or at least need not, involve representation of experiences, it need only involve representation of the world. This is another often invoked aspect of the transparency of experiences. The phenomenology of perception usually seems to present the world directly, not in virtue of representation of any experiential intermediaries. Again, to invoke the representation of experience seems to over-intellectualize the experience by introducing complexity that is not apparent in the experience's phenomenology. Internal Unity A final objection is that it seems that there can be internal unity among the contents of experiences that have quite different phenomenal character. For example, one can argue that there is an internal unity between the representation of space in visual and tactile experience in virtue of which these are constrained to represent a common set of spatial properties. Phenomenologically, it seems that when an object looks flat and when it feels flat, it looks and feels to have the same property, flatness. This commonality seems to hold in virtue of an internal relationship between the phenomenology of visual and tactile experiences. It is arguable that something similar applies to experiences as of the same color in quite different lighting conditions. For example, experiences of a white object both in shadow and out of shadow may have quite different phenomenal characters, but it is arguable that the experiences are internally related in a way so that both represent the object as being white. This internal unity is not straightforwardly accommodated by a free gene view, assuming that the free gene view might also apply to experiences of space. One might think that because visual and tactile experiences of space are phenomenally quite different, they will be associated with quite different free gene modes of presentation. One will represent the normal cause of certain visual experiences, and another will represent the normal cause of certain tactile experiences. It might turn out that as a matter of contingent fact these normal causes coincide, so that the properties represented coincide, but nothing in the experiences themselves guarantees this. This stands in tension with the intuition that there is an internal phenomenological connection between tactile and visual representations of space, according to which these have common contents in virtue of their phenomenology. The same goes for the case of phenomenally different experiences as of the same color. The free gene view suggests that these will have distinct modes of presentation that at best contingently pick out a common property, which stands in tension with the intuition that these experiences have common representational content by virtue of their phenomenology. 
I do not think that any of these three objections from relationality, simplicity, and internal unity are knockdown objections to the free gene view. For a start, all of them rest on phenomenological intuitions that could be disputed. I will not dispute them, however. I am inclined to give each of the intuitions some prima facie weight. But even if one takes the intuitions at face value, it is not clear that any of them entail that the free gene view is false. Rather, all of them can be seen as pointing to a certain incompleteness in the free gene view, the free gene account so far is not a full story about the phenomenal content of experience. For a full story, the free gene view needs to be supplemented. The relationality objection, for example, suggests that there is a russell lien aspect to the phenomenal content of perceptual experience, in that phenomenally identical experiences involve representation of some common property. The intuitions here are somewhat equivocal. In the Jack and Jill case, for example, at the same time as we have the intuition that some common property is phenomenologically represented, as a russell lien view of phenomenal content would suggest, we also have the intuition that different properties might be represented by virtue of distinct environmental connections, as a free gene view of phenomenal content would suggest. If we are pluralists about content, these two intuitions need not contradict each other. Rather, they might be reconciled if we adopt a view that posits both a Russell Lien and a free gene aspect to the phenomenal content of experiences. The intuition here does not entail that free gene content is not phenomenal content. Rather, it suggests that free gene content is not all there is to phenomenal content. The force of the simplicity objection is somewhat unclear. Construed as an argument against free gene phenomenal content, it turns on the tacit premise that the phenomenal content of an experience must have a structure that directly mirrors the phenomenological structure of the experience, or perhaps that it directly mirrors the way it seems to us on introspection that the world is perceptually presented. We might call this somewhat elusive idea the mirroring constraint. A proponent of the free gene view might reply simply that the mirroring constraint is an unreasonable constraint on an account of the phenomenal content of experience. As I have defined it, phenomenal content is content that supervenes on the phenomenal character of an experience. There is nothing in this definition that requires a tighter connection than mere supervenience, and the simplicity objection does not give any reason to deny supervenience. So the free gene may hold that unless one has an argument that supervenience of content on phenomenal character requires mirroring, or unless we redefine the notion of phenomenal content to build in the mirroring constraint, there is no objection to the claim that free gene content is phenomenal content. Still, the simplicity objection once again suggests a certain incompleteness in the free gene view. One might reasonably hold that the supervenience of content on phenomenal character requires some sort of explanation. If there were a direct correspondence between the elements of the content and the elements of phenomenal character, this explanation would be much easier to give. As it is, the extra complexity of free gene content, such as the invocation of causation and experience, raises the question of how this complex content is connected to the simple experience. In particular, if one adopts a view on which phenomenal content is somehow grounded in the phenomenology of an experience, then one will need to tell a story about how a complex free gene content can be grounded in a simple experience. And if one thinks that the phenomenology of an experience is grounded in its phenomenal content, then the same applies in reverse. So there is at least a significant explanatory question here. Finally, the free gene view could handle the internal unity objection by saying that visual and tactile experiences of space share a common phenomenal type, in effect, a cross-modal type, and it is this phenomenal type that is relevant to the free gene mode of presentation of these experiences, the property that normally causes experiences of type T. If so, then the different experiences will be constrained to represent a common class of properties. One could likewise suggest that phenomenally distinct experiences of the same color, shadowed and unshadowed, for example, share a phenomenal type and draw the same conclusion. This raises the question, however, of just how we assign the relevant phenomenal types. Any given experience belongs to many different phenomenal types, 
and the selection of the cross-modal phenomenal type, in the spatial case, or the phenomenal type shared by shadowed and unshadowed experiences, in the color case, may seem suspiciously ad hoc. At least, we need to fill in the free gene view with an account of how the mode of presentation associated with a given experience is determined, by specifying a principled basis for the choice of a phenomenal type. One can summarize all these worries by saying that as it stands, the free gene view does not seem to fully reflect the presentational phenomenology of perceptual experience, the way that it seems to directly and immediately present certain objects and properties in the world. It is natural to hold that this presentational phenomenology is closely connected to the phenomenal content of experience. So, to make progress, we need to attend more closely to this presentational phenomenology and to how it might be connected to phenomenal content. 6. Back to Primitivism It is useful at this point to ask, what view of the content of perceptual experience is the most phenomenologically adequate? That is, if we were simply to aim to take the phenomenology of perceptual experience at face value, what account of content would we come up with? In particular, what view of the content of color experience best mirrors its presentational phenomenology? Here, I think the answer is clear. The view of content that most directly mirrors the phenomenology of color experience is primitivism. Phenomenologically, it seems to us as if visual experience presents simple intrinsic qualities of objects in the world, spread out over the surface of the object. When I have a phenomenally read experience of an object, the object seems to be simply, primitively, red. The apparent redness does not seem to be a microphysical property, or a mental property, or a disposition, or an unspecified property that plays an appropriate causal role. Rather, it seems to be a simple qualitative property with a distinctive sensuous nature. We might call this property perfect redness, the sort of property that might have been instantiated in Eden. One might say, phenomenologically, it seems that visual experience presents the world to us as an Edenic world. Taking the phenomenology completely at face value, visual experience presents a world where perfect redness and perfect blueness are instantiated on the surface of objects, as they were in Eden. These are simple intrinsic qualities whose nature we seem to grasp fully in perceptual experience. For the world to be exactly the way that my phenomenology seems to present it as being, the world would have to be an Edenic world in which these properties are instantiated. This suggests a view on which color experiences attribute primitive properties such as perfect redness and perfect blueness to objects. According to this view, color experiences have a Russell Lien content involving the attribution of these primitive properties. Furthermore, this content is naturally taken to be phenomenal content. Intuitively, the nature of the primitive properties that are presented to one is fully determined by the phenomenology of the experience. If an experience attributes a primitive property, any phenomenally identical experience will attribute the same primitive property. So this view is a sort of Russell Lien primitivism about phenomenal content. For all its virtues with respect to phenomenological adequacy, the Russell Lien primitivist view has a familiar problem. There is good reason to believe that the relevant primitive properties are not instantiated in our world. That is, there is good reason to believe that none of the objects we perceive are perfectly red or perfectly green. If this is correct, then the primitivist view entails that all color experiences are illusory. 4. A first reason for doubting that these properties exist surfaced when we ate from the tree of illusion. This made it clear that there is no necessary connection between primitive properties and perceptual experiences and strongly suggested that, if there is a connection, it is merely causal and contingent. Once we have accepted that one sometimes has phenomenally red experiences in the absence of perfect redness, it is natural to start to wonder whether the same goes for all of our phenomenally red experiences. This is a relatively weak reason as the existence of illusions is compatible with the existence of veridical perception, but it is enough to generate initial doubts. A second and stronger reason came when we ate from the tree of science. Science suggests that when we see a red object, 
our perception of the object is mediated by the reflection or radiation of light from the surface of the object to our eyes and then to our brains. The properties of the object that are responsible for the reflection or radiation of the light appear to be complex physical properties such as surface spectral reflectances, ultimately grounded in microphysical configurations. Science does not reveal any primitive properties in the object, and furthermore, the hypothesis that objects have the relevant primitive properties seems quite unnecessary in order to explain color perception. Still, someone might suggest that objects have the primitive properties all the same, perhaps supervening in some fashion on the microphysical properties of the object. In response, one might suggest that this picture will metaphysically complicate the world. It seems at least conceivable that objects with the relevant microphysical properties could fail to instantiate the relevant primitive properties. So it looks as if the relevant primitive properties are a significant addition to the world over and above the microphysical supervenient space. A primitivist might respond in turn by denying that any metaphysical addition is involved, perhaps denying an inference from conceivability to metaphysical possibility, or by accepting that physicalism about ordinary objects is false. 5. But even if so, there is a remaining problem. The third and strongest reason for doubting that primitive properties are instantiated stems from an elaboration of the inversion argument given earlier. 6. Take an ordinary object such as a red apple. It is familiar from everyday experience that such an object can cause phenomenally red experiences of the apple and, in some circumstances, can cause phenomenally green experiences of the apple without any change in its intrinsic properties. It then seems that there is no obstacle to the existence of a community in which objects with the intrinsic properties of this apple normally cause phenomenally green experiences. 7. We can even imagine that the very same apple normally causes phenomenally red experiences in one community and normally causes phenomenally green experiences in the other. We can now ask, when a subject in the first community has a phenomenally red experience of the apple, and a subject in the second community has a phenomenally green experience of the apple, which of these experiences is veridical? Intuitively, there is a case for saying that both experiences are veridical. But this is an unhappy answer for the primitivist. On the primitivist view, any phenomenally red experience attributes perfect redness, and any phenomenally green experience attributes perfect greenness. If both experiences are veridical, it follows that the apple instantiates both perfect redness and perfect greenness. The argument generalizes. For any phenomenal color, it seems that there is a community in which the apple normally causes experiences with that phenomenal color. Taking the current line, it follows that the apple instantiates every perfect color. The choice of an apple was unimportant here, so it seems to follow that every object instantiates every perfect color. It follows that no color experience of an object can be illusory with respect to color. Whatever the phenomenal color of the experience, the object will have the corresponding primitive property, so the experience will be veridical. This conclusion is perhaps even more counterintuitive than the conclusion that all color experiences are illusory. A primitivist might suggest that one of the experiences is veridical and one of them is not. But this imposes an asymmetry on what otherwise seems to be a quite symmetrical situation. When a subject in one community has a phenomenally red experience of the apple and a subject in the other community has a phenomenally green experience of the apple, both subjects' perceptual mechanisms are functioning in the way that is normal in those communities. Furthermore, the perceptual mechanisms themselves, involving light and brain, seem to be symmetrically well functioning in both communities. A primitivist may hold the line and assert that one of the experiences is veridical and one is falsitical simply because the apple is perfectly red and it is not perfectly green. But this line leads to the conclusion that color experiences in one of the communities are normally falsitical, after all, objects like the apple normally cause phenomenally green experiences in that community, where corresponding experiences in the other community are normally veridical. Apart from the unappealing asymmetry, this view yields a serious skeptical worry. It seems that we have little reason to believe that we are in a community that normally perceives veridically as opposed to falsitically. After all, 
nature and evolution will be indifferent between these two communities. Evolutionary processes will be indifferent among perceivers in which apples produce phenomenally red experiences, perceivers in which apples produce phenomenally green experiences, and perceivers in which apples produce phenomenally blue experiences. Any such perceiver could easily come to exist through minor differences in environmental conditions or brain wiring. 8. If we accept the earlier reasoning, only a very small subset of the class of such possible perceivers will normally have veridical experiences, and there is no particular reason to think that we are among them. Once these options are ruled out, the reasonable conclusion is that neither experience is veridical, the apple is neither perfectly red nor perfectly green. Generalizing from this case, the reasoning suggests that primitive properties are not instantiated at all. I think that this is clearly the most reasonable view for a primitivist to take, on this view, experiences attribute primitive properties, but their objects never possess these properties. Still, this view has the consequence that all color experiences are illusory. This is a counter-intuitive conclusion and runs counter to our usual judgments about the veridicality of experience. On the face of it, there is a significant difference between a phenomenally red experience of a red wall and a phenomenally red experience of a white wall that looks red because, unknown to the subject, it is illuminated by red light. As we ordinarily classify experiences, the former is veridical and the latter is not. In classifying both experiences as falsitical, primitivism cannot respect this distinction. 7. Perfect and imperfect veridicality. Here is where things stand. The free gene view of phenomenal content seems to most accurately capture our judgments about veridicality, but it is not especially phenomenologically adequate. The primitivist view of phenomenal content is the most phenomenologically adequate view, but it yields implausible consequences about veridicality. For a way forward, what we need is an account that captures both the phenomenological virtues of the primitivist view and the truth conditional virtues of the free gene view. In what follows I argue that such an account is available. One can begin to motivate such a view with the following pair of intuitions. One for a color experience to be perfectly veridical for it to be as veridical as it could be its object would have to have perfect colors. The perfect veridicality of color experience would require that our world be an Edenic world, in which objects instantiate primitive color properties. 2. Even if the object of an experience lacks perfect colors, a color experience can be imperfectly veridical, veridical according to our ordinary standard of veridicality. Even after the fall from Eden, our imperfect world has objects with properties that suffice to make our experiences veridical by our ordinary standards. This pair of intuitions has strong support. The first is supported by the phenomenological observations in the previous section. If we were to take our experience completely at face value, we would accept that we were in a world where primitive properties such as perfect redness and perfect blueness are spread over the surface of objects. The second is supported by our ordinary judgments about veridicality. When an ordinary white wall looks white to us, then even if it merely instantiates physical properties and not perfect whiteness, it is good enough to qualify as veridical by our ordinary standards. These two intuitions need not contradict each other. Instead, they suggest that we possess two notions of satisfaction for an experience, perfect and imperfect veridicality. An experience can be imperfectly veridical, or veridical in the ordinary sense, without being perfectly veridical. The terminology should not be taken to suggest that when an experience is imperfectly veridical, it is not really veridical. In fact, it is plausible that imperfect veridicality is the property that our ordinary term veridicality denotes. We speak truly when we say that a phenomenally red experience of an ordinary red object is veridical. It is just that the experience is not perfectly veridical. To capture this, one could also call imperfect veridicality ordinary veridicality or veridicality simpliciter. Or one could use veridical for imperfect veridicality and ultra veridical for perfect veridicality. But I will usually stick to the terminology above. Corresponding to these distinct notions of satisfaction, one will have distinct associated conditions of satisfaction. 
imperfect veridicality will be associated with something like the free gene condition of satisfaction discussed earlier, a phenomenally read experience will be imperfectly veridical iff its object has the property that normally causes phenomenally read experiences. Perfect veridicality will be associated with the primitivist condition of satisfaction, a phenomenally read experience will be perfectly veridical iff its object instantiates perfect redness. I'm perfect and perfect veridicality can therefore be seen as associated with distinct contents of an experience. We might call the content associated with perfect veridicality the Edenic content of an experience and the content associated with imperfect veridicality the ordinary content of the experience. As we have already seen, our ordinary assessments of veridicality can be seen as associated with two contents in turn. For example, a phenomenally read experience has a free gene content, satisfied IFF its object has the property that normally causes a phenomenally read experience, and a Russell Lien content, satisfied IFF its object has physical redness. We might call these contents the ordinary free gene content and the ordinary Russell Lien content of the experience. One could also, in principle, associate assessments of perfect veridicality with both a free gene and a Russell Lien content, but here the free gene content is much the same as the Russell Lien content. The Russell Lien content involves the attribution of perfect redness, it is satisfied in a world IFF the relevant object is perfectly read there. Unlike the ordinary Russell Lien content mentioned previously, this content does not depend on how the subject's environment turns out. Regardless of how the environment turns out, the experience in question will attribute perfect redness. So there is no non-trivial dependence of the property attributed on the way the subject's environment turns out. It follows that the Edenic free gene content of the experience, which captures the way that the perfect veridicality of the experience depends on the way the environment turns out, is satisfied IFF the object of the experience has perfect redness. There may be some differences between the Edenic free gene and Russell Lien contents here in the treatment of objects, as opposed to properties, and in the formal modeling, with worlds and centered worlds, but where the color property aspect of the content is concerned, the contents behave in very similar ways. So for most purposes one can simply speak of the Edenic content of the experience, one that is satisfied IFF a relevant object has perfect redness. Nine. So we have found three distinctive sorts of content associated with an experience, an Edenic content, an ordinary free gene content, and an ordinary Russell Lien content. We have seen already that the ordinary Russell Lien content is not plausibly a phenomenal content, phenomenally identical experiences can have distinct, ordinary, Russell Lien contents. However, for all we have said, both Edenic contents and ordinary free gene contents are phenomenal contents. It is plausible that any phenomenally read experience will have the ordinary free gene condition of satisfaction, where satisfaction is understood as imperfect veridicality, and will also have the primitivist condition of satisfaction, where satisfaction is understood as perfect veridicality. So we have more than one phenomenal content for an experience depending on the associated notion of satisfaction. 8. A two-stage view of phenomenal content. Perfect and imperfect veridicality are not independent of each other. It is plausible to suggest that there is an intimate relation between the two and that there is an intimate relation between the associated sorts of phenomenal content. A natural picture of this relation suggests itself. A phenomenally read experience is perfectly veridical iff its object instantiates perfect redness. A phenomenally read experience is imperfectly veridical IFF its object instantiates a property that matches perfect redness. Here, to match perfect redness is, roughly, to play the role that perfect redness plays in Eden. The key role played by perfect redness in Eden is that it brings about phenomenally read experiences. So a property matches perfect redness if it causes phenomenally read experiences. This yields a condition of satisfaction that mirrors the ordinary free gene content discussed earlier. The notion of matching is what links imperfect veridicality to perfect veridicality. I will say more about this notion later, but one can motivate the idea as follows. For our experiences to be perfectly veridical, we would have to live in Eden. 
but we have undergone the fall from Eden, no primitive color properties are instantiated by objects in our world. So the best that objects in our world can do is to have properties that can play the role that primitive properties play in Eden. Of course, no property instantiated in our world can play that role perfectly, but some can play it well enough by virtue of normally bringing about phenomenally red experiences. Such a property might be called imperfect redness. In our world, imperfect redness is plausibly some sort of physical property such as a surface spectral reflectance. More generally, the following is a plausible thesis. If an experience is such that its perfect veridicality conditions require the instantiation of primitive property X, then the experience's imperfect veridicality conditions will require the instantiation of a property that matches X. As before, a property matches X, roughly, if it plays the role that X plays in Eden. The key role is causing experiences of the appropriate phenomenal type. In our world, these properties will typically be physical properties, the imperfect counterparts of X. This relation suggests the following two-stage picture of the phenomenal content of experience. On this picture, the most fundamental sort of content of an experience is its Edenic content, which requires the instantiation of appropriate primitive properties. This content then determines the ordinary free gene content of the experience, the experience is imperfectly veridical if its object has properties that match the properties attributed by the experience's Edenic content. 10. On the two-stage view, the ordinary free gene content of a phenomenally red experience will be satisfied, in an environment, IFF a relevant object instantiates a property that matches perfect redness, in that environment. This ordinary free gene content will itself be associated with an ordinary russell lien content, one that is satisfied IFF the, actual, object of the experience has P, where P is the property that matches perfect redness in the environment of the original experience. On this view, all phenomenally red experiences will have the same free gene content, but they may have different russell lien contents depending on their environment. Of course, this free gene content gives exactly the same results as the free gene content discussed earlier, an object will instantiate a property that matches perfect redness IFF it instantiates a property that normally causes phenomenally red experiences. But the two-stage view gives a more refined account of how this free gene content is grounded, one that more clearly shows its roots in the phenomenology of the experience. The view also has the promise of being more phenomenologically adequate than the original free gene view seemed to be, by giving a major role to the Edenic content that directly reflects the experience's phenomenology. The resulting view is a sort of semi-primitivist Freyanaism, a version of the free gene view on which the free gene content is grounded in a primitivist Edenic content. On this view, Eden acts as a sort of regulative ideal in determining the content of our color experiences. Our world is not Eden, but our perceptual experience requires our world to match Eden as well as possible. Eden is central to the content of our experience, it is directly reflected in the perfect veridicality conditions of the experience, and it plays a key role in determining the ordinary veridicality conditions of our experiences. One might put the two-stage view as follows. Our experience presents an Edenic world and thereby represents an ordinary world. We might say that the perfect veridicality conditions of the experience are its presentational content, and the imperfect veridicality conditions of the experience are its representational content. As pluralists we can allow that experiences have both sorts of content, with an intimate relation between them. Presentational content most directly reflects the phenomenology of an experience, representational content most directly reflects its intuitive conditions of satisfaction. Because of this, the two-stage view yields natural answers to the objections to the free gene view that were grounded in phenomenological adequacy. On the relationality objection, the two-stage view accommodates relationality by noting that there are certain specific and determinate properties the perfect color properties that are presented in virtue of the phenomenology of color experience. When Jack and Jill both have phenomenally green experiences in different environments, the two experiences have a common Edenic content, and so both are presented with perfect greenness. 
This captures the intuitive sense in which objects look to be the same to both Jack and Jill. At the same time, the level of ordinary free gene and Russell Lian content captures the intuitive sense in which objects look to be different to Jack and Jill. By acknowledging ethnic phenomenal content in addition to free gene phenomenal content, we capture the sense in which perceptual phenomenology seems to be Russell Lian and relational. On the simplicity objection, in the two stage view, the simplicity of phenomenological structure is directly mirrored at the level of ethnic content. In ethnic content, there need be no reference to normal causes and no reference to experiences. Instead, simple properties are attributed directly. The residual question for the free gene view concerned how a complex free gene content might be grounded in simple phenomenology. The two-stage view begins to answer this question. A given experience is most directly associated with a simple ethnic content, and this ethnic content is then associated with a free gene content by the matching relation. There is still an explanatory question about just where the matching relation comes from and how it might be grounded, I address this question later in the chapter. But the two-stage view already gives us a skeleton around which we can build an explanatory connection between phenomenology and free gene content. On the internal unity objection, the two-stage view can accommodate the internal unity between visual and tactile experience of space by holding that the ethnic content of both visual and tactile experiences involves the attribution of perfect spatial properties, although the other perfect properties attributed by the experiences may differ. If so, then internal unity is present at the level of ethnic content. Further, the free gene content of each will invoke the properties that match perfect spatial properties, in effect, the common typing of visual and spatial experiences is induced by the commonality in their ethnic content, and this common free gene content will entail a common, ordinary Russell Lian content. So the unity at the level of ethnic content will lead to unity at the level of ordinary content. Something similar applies to the case of representing the same color under different illumination, I will discuss this case in some detail shortly. The two-stage view respects the insights of both the primitivist and the free gene views in obvious ways. Like the original free gene view, it can also respect certain key elements of dispositionalist and physicalist views. On the two-stage view, dispositions to cause relevant sorts of experiences still play a key role, not as the properties that are represented by experiences but as a sort of reference fixer for those properties. The properties that are represented by the experience, at the standard of imperfect veridicality, are themselves plausibly physical properties at least in the actual world. We might say that the view generates a broadly dispositionalist ordinary free gene content and a broadly physicalist ordinary Russell Lian content. 9 Eden and Ethnic Content What constraints are imposed by Ethnic content? The view I have proposed raises many questions. In the remainder of this chapter I address some of these questions and in doing so flesh out a number of aspects of the view. These include questions about Eden and Edenic content, about colors and color constancy, about matching and free gene content, and about generalizing the model beyond the case of color. The order of these topics is arbitrary to some extent, so it is possible to skip to the topics that seem the most pressing. A world with respect to which our visual experience is perfectly veridical is an Edenic world. I defer until later the question of whether Edenic worlds are metaphysically possible. It is natural to ask, what is the character of an Edenic world? A full answer to this question depends on a full analysis of the phenomenology of visual experience, which cannot be given here, but we can say a few things. As before, I will concentrate mostly on the aspects of phenomenology and representation associated with color and leave other aspects until later. For any given experience, there will be many worlds with respect to which it is perfectly veridical. A visual experience even a total visual experience corresponding to an entire visual field typically makes quite limited claims on the world and is neutral about the rest. For example, a visual experience typically presents things as being a certain way in a certain location and is neutral about how things are outside that location. So, strictly speaking, in order to make an experience perfectly veridical, 
a world need merely be ethnic in certain relevant respects in a certain relatively limited area and may be quite non-ethnic outside that area. Correspondingly, there will be a very large range of worlds that satisfy the relevant ethnic content. Here we can focus on what is required in order to satisfy the content. In a world that satisfies a typical ethnic content, primitive color properties such as perfect redness and perfect blueness are instantiated. Most often, visual phenomenology presents color as instantiated on the surface of objects, so an ethnic world will contain objects with perfect colors instantiated at certain locations on their surfaces. Strictly speaking, it will contain objects with certain perfect location color properties, properties of having certain perfect colors at certain locations. Occasionally we have the phenomenology of volumes of color, as with certain transparent colored objects or perhaps with smoke and flames. In these cases, the corresponding ethnic world will have objects in which the relevant perfect colors are instantiated at locations throughout the relevant volume. It may be that sometimes we have the phenomenology of color not associated with objects at all, perhaps our experience of the sky is like this, just representing blueness at a certain distance in front of us. If so, then a corresponding ethnic world will simply have perfect color qualities instantiated, by the world, at relevant locations. 11. From the fable at the beginning of the chapter, one might infer that ethnic worlds must meet a number of further constraints, perceivers must be directly acquainted with objects and properties in those worlds, illusion must be impossible, and there must be no microphysical structure. On my view this is not quite right, however. Ethnic content puts relatively simple constraints on the world that involve the instantiation of perfect properties by objects in the environment, and the further constraints above are not part of ethnic content itself. Their relation to ethnic content is somewhat more subtle than this. Perfect color properties are plausibly intrinsic color properties. By virtue of presenting an object as having a perfect color at a certain location, an experience does not seem to make claims about how things are outside that location. So, when an object is perfectly red in Eden, it is this way by virtue of its intrinsic nature. In particular, it seems that an object can be perfectly red without anyone experiencing the object as perfectly red. The phenomenology of color does not seem to be the phenomenology of properties that require a perceiver in order to be instantiated. The phenomenology of pain is arguably different in this respect, as I will discuss later. It seems coherent to suppose that there is a world in which perfect colors are instantiated but in which there are no perceivers at all. One could hold a view on which, for an experience to be perfectly veridical, a subject must perceive the relevant perfect colors. According to such a view, the character of visual experience is such that in addition to representing the presence of colors, visual experiences also represent the perception of colors. If one held this view, one would hold that no such experience is perfectly veridical unless the relevant perfect colors are perceived by a subject, the subject at the center of the relevant centered world, perhaps by direct acquaintance. I am inclined to think that the character of visual experience is not like this, however. The phenomenology of color vision clearly makes claims about objects in the world, but it does not obviously make claims about us and our perceptual relation to these objects. As theorists who introspectively reflect on our phenomenology, we can say that it seems, introspectively, as if we are acquainted with objects and properties in the world. But it is not obvious that perceptual phenomenology itself makes such a claim. To suggest that it does is arguably to over-intellectualize perceptual experience. If perceptual experience does not make such claims, then the ethnic content of a visual experience will require the relevant perfect properties to be instantiated, but it will not require that we stand in any particular perceptual relation to those properties. If this is correct, then in order to satisfy the ethnic content of an experience, a world must be ethnic in that perfect properties are instantiated within it, but it need not be a world in which we have not yet eaten from the tree of illusion. If an experience does not represent itself, it cannot represent that it is known illusory. Likewise, 
a world that satisfies the Edenic content of an experience need not be one in which we have not yet eaten from the tree of science. The phenomenology of vision is arguably quite neutral on whether the world has the relevant scientific structure as long as it also has primitive properties, and there is no obvious reason why a possible world could not have both. To reinforce this view, we can note that the argument from the existence of illusions and scientific structure to the non-existence of perfect colors in our world was not a deductive argument. Rather, it was a sort of abductive argument, it undercut our reasons for accepting, instantiated, perfect colors by suggesting that they are not needed to explain our visual experience. It remained coherent to suppose that primitive properties are instantiated in our world, but there was now good reason to reject the hypothesis as unnecessarily complex. On this view, eating from the trees, by discovering the existence of illusions and scientific structure, did not directly contradict the Edenic contents of our experience, but it gave us good reason to believe that our world is not an Edenic world. A more complete account of the Edenic content of color experience would require careful attention to all sorts of phenomenological details that I have largely ignored so far, such as the phenomenal representation of the distribution of colors in space, the fineness of grain of color representation, the different levels of detail of color experience in the foreground and background of a visual field, and so on. I cannot deal with all of this here, but as a case study I will shortly pay attention to one such detail, the phenomenon of color constancy. What is the character of Edenic perception? Even if perceivers are not presented in the Edenic content of an experience, it is natural to speculate about how perception might work in an Edenic world. One way to put this is to ask, what sort of world maximally reflects how things seem to us both perceptually and introspectively? Even if perception makes no claims about our perceptual experiences and our perceptual relation to the world, introspection does. It seems to us, introspectively and perceptually, as if we stand in certain sorts of relations to the world. For this seeming to be maximally veridical, an Edenic world must contain subjects who stand in certain intimate relations to perfect properties in the world. We can call a world in which these seemings are maximally veridical a pure Edenic world. Of course, there are, possibly impure, Edenic worlds in which subjects perceive perfect colors via a mediated causal mechanism, at least to the extent that we perceive imperfect colors via such a mechanism in our world. But it is natural to think that this is not the best they could do. It seems reasonable to hold that in Eden, subjects could have a sort of direct acquaintance with perfect colors. Perfect colors seem to be the sort of properties that are particularly apt for direct acquaintance, after all. And phenomenologically, there is something to be said for the claim that we seem to perceive colors directly. Certainly there does not seem to be a mediating causal mechanism, and one could suggest more strongly that at least introspectively, there seems not to be a mediating causal mechanism. It is natural to suggest that in the purest Edenic worlds, subjects do not perceive instances of perfect color by virtue of having color experiences that are distinct from but related to those instances. That would seem to require a contingent mediating connection. Instead, Edenic subjects perceive instances of perfect colors by standing in a direct perceptual relation to them, perhaps the relation of acquaintance. Edenic subjects still have color experiences, there is something it is like to be them. But their color experiences have their phenomenal character precisely in virtue of the perfect colors that the subject is acquainted with. It is natural to say that the experiences themselves are constituted by a direct perceptual relation to the relevant instances of perfect color in the environment. 12. We might say that in Eden, if not in our world, perceptual experience extends outside the head. In the purest Edenic worlds, there are no illusions, if we take both introspection and perception to be maximally veridical, we conclude that things are just as they seem. In such a world, all color experience involves direct acquaintance with instances of perfect color in the environment. As soon as we eat from the tree of illusion, we have good reason to believe that we are not in such a world. But this need not cast us out of Eden entirely. There are somewhat less pure Edenic worlds in which there are illusions and hallucinations, 
perceiver sometimes have experiences as of perfect redness when the perceived object is perfectly blue or when there is no object to be perceived. In these cases, the color experience cannot consist of a direct perceptual relation to an instance of perfect redness, because the subject stands in no such relation. Instead, it seems that the character of the experience is constituted independently of the properties of the perceived object. In these impure Edenic worlds, an illusory or hallucinatory color experience involves a relevant relation to the property of perfect redness that is not mediated by a relation to an instance of this property. Something like this view is suggested as an account of hallucination in the actual world by Johnston 2004. If so, then in such a world there may be phenomenally identical experiences, say, veridical and falsitical phenomenally red experiences, whose underlying metaphysical nature is quite distinct, one is constituted by a perceptual relation to a property instance in the subject's environment, and one is not. This picture is reminiscent of that held by some disjunctivists about perceptual experience in our world. We might say that in Eden, if not in our world, a disjunctive view of the metaphysics of perceptual experience is correct. Is Eden a possible world? Eden does not exist, but could it have existed? That is, is there a possible world in which there are perfect colors? Could God have created such a world, if he had so chosen? I am not certain of the answer to this question, but I am inclined to say yes, there are Edenic possible worlds. To start with, it seems that perceptual experience gives us some grip on what it would be for an object to be perfectly red or perfectly blue. It would have to be exactly like that, precisely as that object is presented to us as being in experience. It seems that we can use this grip to form concepts of qualities such as perfect redness and perfect blueness, I have been deploying these concepts throughout this chapter. Furthermore, there is no obvious incoherence in the idea that an object could be perfectly red or perfectly blue. On the face of it we can conceive of such an object, so there is a prima facie case for believing that such an object is possible. One can also reason as follows. There are good reasons to think that perfect redness is not instantiated in our world, but these reasons are empirical reasons, not a priori reasons. It was eating from the tree of illusion and the tree of science that led us to doubt that we live in an Edenic world. Moreover, eating from these trees was an empirical process based on empirical discoveries about the world. Before eating from these trees, there was no special reason to doubt that our experience was perfectly veridical. In particular, it is hard to see how one could be led to the conclusion that perfect redness is not instantiated by a priori reasoning alone, although see below. So the hypothesis that our world is Edenic seems at least to be conceivable, and it is reasonable to suggest that it cannot be ruled out a priori. I have argued earlier, Chapter 6, that this sort of conceivability is a good guide to metaphysical possibility. In particular, there is good reason to believe that if a hypothesis is ideally negatively conceivable in that it cannot be ruled out by idealized a priori reasoning, then there is a metaphysically possible world that verifies the hypothesis. There is even better reason to believe that if a hypothesis is ideally positively conceivable, in that one can imagine a situation in which the hypothesis actually obtains, in a way that holds up on idealized a priori reflection, then there is a metaphysically possible world that verifies the hypothesis. The hypothesis that our world is Edenic, that is, that perfect colors are instantiated in our world, seems to be at least prima facie negatively conceivable, it cannot easily be ruled out a priori, and prima facie positively conceivable, we can imagine that it actually obtains. Furthermore, it is not clear how this hypothesis could be undercut by further a priori reasoning. If it cannot, then the hypothesis is ideally, negatively and positively, conceivable. If so, and if the conceivability possibility thesis is correct, then there is a metaphysically possible world that verifies the hypothesis. Verification is a technical notion from two-dimensional semantics, verification goes with primary intentions, satisfaction with secondary intentions, but the technicalities do not matter too much in this case, the primary and secondary intentions of perfect color concepts are plausibly identical, 
so that if a world verifies the hypothesis that perfect colors are instantiated, it also satisfies the hypothesis. So, if this reasoning is correct, one can simply say that it is metaphysically possible that perfect colors are instantiated. One could resist the conclusion either by denying that the Edenic hypothesis is conceivable in the relevant senses or by denying the connection between conceivability in the relevant senses and possibility. Speaking for myself, I am reasonably confident about the latter, but I am not certain about the former. I do not see any obvious way of ruling out the Edenic hypothesis a priori, but I cannot be sure that there is no such way. We will see that in the case of perfect pains, discussed later, there is arguably such a way. These considerations do not generalize to colors, but they make salient the possibility that other considerations might. For now, I am inclined to think that an Edenic world is metaphysically possible, but I am not certain of this. Is there a property of perfect redness? If what I have said so far is right, there is no instantiated property of perfect redness, but it is natural to hold that perfect redness may be an uninstantiated property. It seems that we have a grip on such a property in experience, we grasp what it would be for an object to have the property of perfect redness. Certainly, if an Edenic world is metaphysically possible, then objects in those worlds will be perfectly red, and it seems reasonable to conclude that they have the property of perfect redness. Even if an Edenic world is metaphysically impossible, one might still hold that there is such a property, albeit a necessarily uninstantiated property, like the property of being a round square. These issues will interact with one's views on the metaphysics of properties to some extent. For example, if one thinks that properties are just sets of possible objects, or if one thinks that properties are very sparse relative to predicates, one might resist some of the reasoning here. But overall I think there is a good prima facie case for thinking that there is a property of perfect redness. If there is no such property or if there is no metaphysically possible Edenic world, then some of the details in this chapter might have to change. If there is no metaphysically possible Edenic world, one cannot model the conditions of satisfaction associated with perfect veridicality using sets of, or functions over, metaphysically possible worlds. If there is no property of perfect redness, one cannot say that there is a content that attributes this property to an object. Even if so, however, one could understand the contents in other terms. For example, one could understand Edenic contents in terms of sets of epistemically possible scenarios rather than metaphysically possible worlds, or one could understand Edenic conditions of satisfaction using something like free gene concepts rather than properties. One could also regard Eden as some sort of mere world model, not yet a possible world. Such a world model might still play a key role in determining the ordinary free gene contents of perception via the requirement that the actual world must match the world model in various respects. In this fashion numerous key elements of the two-stage model of perceptual content could be preserved. If there is a property of perfect redness, what sort of property is it? It is most natural to conceive of perfect redness as a sort of simple, irreducible quality, one that might be instantiated on the surface of objects in some possible world. Perfect color properties might not all be maximally simple. For example, they might be seen as a sort of composition from simpler perfect properties, such as certain perfect unique hues, so that a particular shade of perfect orange may be a composite of perfect redness and perfect yellowness to certain degrees and a certain amount of perfect brightness but the underlying properties are naturally held to be irreducible. In particular, it is natural to hold that perfect colors are not reducible to physical properties. If one accepts the earlier arguments that perfect color properties are not instantiated in our world, this consequence follows naturally. Even if one thought that perfect color properties are instantiated in our world, one could still argue that they are irreducible to physical properties, by analogues of familiar arguments concerning phenomenal properties. 13 For example, one could argue that one can conceive of a physically identical world in which they are not instantiated and infer that such a world is metaphysically possible. Alternatively, 
one could argue that someone without color vision could know all about the physical properties of objects without knowing about their perfect colors. Still, it is at least coherent to hold a view on which experiences have Edenic content that represents the instantiation of perfect color properties and to hold that as a matter of empirical fact, perfect color properties are identical to certain physical properties, such as surface reflectances. On this view, our concepts of perfect color properties may be simple and irreducible concepts, but they pick out the same properties as those picked out by certain physical properties. Such a view would be analogous to certain type B materialist views about phenomenal properties, according to which phenomenal properties are empirically identical to certain physical properties because simple phenomenal concepts pick out the same properties as certain physical concepts. On the resulting view, experiences could be seen to have a Russellian phenomenal content that represents the instantiation of certain physical properties, although the experience does not represent these properties as physical properties. On this sort of view, our experiences might be perfectly veridical even in a purely physical world. I do not find this view plausible myself, it is vulnerable to the usual objections to Russellian physicalist views based on inversion scenarios, for example, requiring either strong externalism about phenomenology or arbitrary asymmetries among inverted communities, and it is also subject to the conceivability arguments presented earlier. But there is at least an interesting variety of Russell-Lian physicalism regarding phenomenal content in the vicinity. 14. One could likewise hold a view on which perfect color properties are empirically identical to certain dispositional properties, or one could hold a view on which perfect color properties are distinct from physical and dispositional properties but on which they metaphysically supervene on such properties. 15. These views will be confronted with familiar problems, for example, the question of how to individuate the properties while still retaining plausible results about veridicality and illusion, for the view on which perfect colors are identical to or supervene on dispositional properties, and the questions of inversion and conceivability, for the view on which perfect colors supervene on intrinsic physical properties. But again, views of this sort are at least worth close consideration. Finally, it is possible to hold that perfect color properties are identical to certain mental properties, such as those instantiated by one's visual field. This view agrees with the ordinary Edenic view that perfect colors are not instantiated by ordinary external objects but holds that they are instantiated by certain mental objects, though they need not be represented as mental properties. The resulting view, a version of projectivism, does not suffer from the problems for the physicalist and dispositionalist views outlined above. 16. I am inclined to reject this view myself because of familiar problems with holding that mental objects instantiate color properties or their analogues, Chisholm's 1942 speckled hen problem, for example, and because the view becomes particularly hard to accept when extending beyond the case of color, it is hard to accept that mental objects instantiate perfect height, for example, of the sort that we represent in spatial experience. But the question of whether perfect properties might be instantiated in mental objects is at least well worth considering, and the corresponding version of projectivism might be able to accommodate many of the features of the two-stage view that I have been advocating. For the remainder of this chapter I assume that perfect color properties are irreducible properties that are not instantiated in our world. But at least some aspects of the discussion may generalize to the other views I have outlined. How can we represent perfect redness? If perfect redness is never instantiated in our world, then we have never had contact with any instances of it. If so, one might wonder how perfect redness can be represented in the content of our experiences. Construed as an objection, this point turns on the tacit premise that representing a property requires contact with instances of it. In reply, one can observe that we can certainly represent other uninstantiated properties, the property of being phlogistonated, Hume's missing shade of blue, and can even represent uninstantiable properties, being a round square. An opponent might suggest that these are complex properties whose representation derives from the representation of simpler properties and so might propose the modified premise that representing a simple property requires contact with instances of it. It is far from clear why we should accept this, however. 
For example, there seem to be perfectly coherent Humean views of causation on which we represent the simple property, or relation, of causation in our experience and in our thought but on which no causation is present in the world. Certainly, there are cases in which representing a property crucially depends on contact with instances of it, but there are also many cases of representation that do not work like this. One can plausibly represent the property of being a philosopher without being acquainted with any philosophers. On the Humean view just discussed, the same goes for causation. One might divide representations into those that are subject to twin earth thought experiments, so that twins in a different environment would represent different properties, and those that are not. Representations in the first class, including especially the representation of natural kinds such as water, may have content that depends on instantiation of the relevant property in the environment. But representations in the second class, including perhaps representations of philosophers and causation, at least if this representation does not involve deference to a surrounding linguistic community, do not depend on instances of the property in this way. In these cases, representation of a property comes not from instances of that property in the environment but rather from some sort of internal grasp of what it would take for something to instantiate the property. It is plausible that representation of perfect redness falls into the second class. To say this much is just to respond to the objection and not to fully answer the question. The residual question concerns just how our mental states get to have a given Edenic content. I will not answer this question here. We do not yet have a good theory of how our mental states represent any properties at all, and the cases of narrow representation, such as the representation of philosophers and causation, are particularly ill understood. To properly answer these questions and the analogous question about Edenic content requires a theory of the roots of intentionality. I would speculate, however, that the roots of Edenic content lie deep in the heart of phenomenology itself. Horgan and Chinson, 2002, have suggested that there is a distinctive sort of phenomenal intentionality that is grounded in phenomenology rather than in extrinsic causal connections. It is not unreasonable to suppose that Edenic content is a basic sort of phenomenal intentionality perhaps even the most basic sort. This could be combined with a variety of views about the metaphysics of phenomenal intentionality. For example, one could hold that such intentionality is grounded in the projection of properties of certain mental objects, as on the projectivist view. Or one could hold that the representation of Edenic content is even more primitive than this. If one is inclined to think that there is something irreducible about phenomenology, one might naturally hold that perceptual phenomenology simply consists in certain primitive relations to certain primitive properties, the presentation of perfect redness, for example. In any case, it is likely that understanding the roots of Edenic content will be closely tied to understanding the metaphysics of phenomenology. 10 Colors and Color Constancy What about color constancy? Color constancy is the phenomenon wherein instances of the same color in the environment, when illuminated by quite different sorts of lighting so that they reflect different sorts of light, nevertheless seem to have the same color. A paradigmatic example is a shadow. When we see a surface that is partly in shadow, although there is something different about the appearance of the shadowed portion of the surface, it often does not seem to us as if the object has a different color in the shadowed portion. One might say that although there is a sense in which the shadowed and unshadowed portions look different, there is also a sense in which they look the same. Certainly, the shadowed and unshadowed portions produce phenomenally distinct experiences, but we often do not judge the object to have a different color in those areas. To say this much is to stay neutral on the representational content of the relevant experience. But it is natural to wonder just how the content of such experiences should be analyzed. In particular, it is natural to wonder how the two-stage model can handle such contents. To address this question, one can ask as before, how would the world have to be in order for experiences of this sort to be perfectly veridical? A definite answer to this question requires a close phenomenological analysis. I will not give a full analysis here, but I will outline some options. It is useful to focus on the case of shadows. 
As an example, we can take a white floor on which an object casts a crisp dark shadow. I will take it that there are visual cues indicating that a shadow is being cast, so that we judge that the floor is still white in the relevant area, though we also judge that it is in shadow. What is the content of this experience? How would the world have to be in order for the experience to be perfectly veridical? The answer depends on how we analyze the phenomenology of the experience. To start, one might take either a simple or a complex view of the phenomenology. On the simple view, the apparent sameness in color between the shadowed and the unshadowed areas is not present in visual phenomenology at all. Rather, the sameness is detected only at the level of visual judgment or perhaps at the level of other perceptual mechanisms whose contents are not reflected in phenomenology. For simplicity, let us say it is at the level of visual judgment. On this view, the phenomenal character of the experience of the floor may be the same as the phenomenal character of a floor where the relevant portion of the floor is painted the relevant shade of gray and in which the floor is under constant illumination, it might also be the same as in a case where the floor is in shadow in the relevant portion but where there are no cues. We can stipulate that the last two cases involve exactly the same retinal stimulation, so that there is not much doubt that the resulting experiences are phenomenally identical. On the simple view, the original shadow case will differ merely in that relevant cues lead to a judgment of sameness in that case but not in the others. The simple view will say something similar about all cases of color constancy, the constancy is present at the level of judgment, not at the level of perceptual experience. The simple view is naturally associated with a view on which the local phenomenology of color experience is three-dimensional, the relevant experiences can be arranged in a three-dimensional color solid that exhausts the relevant dimensions of variation. At least, the view will hold that if there are further dimensions of variation, then variations due to shadows, illumination, and so on are not among them. On this view, the local phenomenology of perceiving the shadow will be the same as the local phenomenology of veridically perceiving an unshadowed object that is the relevant shade of gray. It is natural to hold that the Edenic content of such an experience involves the attribution of perfect grayness. It follows that on this view, the perfect veridicality of a shadow experience will require the instantiation of the relevant shade of perfect grayness in the object of perception. If we accept the simple view, then if a shadow is cast in a pure Edenic world, one without illusion, the color of the object will change. On the simple view, what are the imperfect veridicality conditions of such an experience? An experience of the shadow will be correct IFF the floor instantiates a property that matches perfect grayness. A property matches perfect grayness, to a first approximation, if it normally causes phenomenally gray experiences. If we take it that there is a canonical normal condition that involves unshadowed light, then this property will be something like a certain specific surface reflectance that the shadowed area of the floor does not instantiate, so the experience will be, imperfectly, falsitical. If we allow that there is a wide range of normal conditions that includes both shadowed and unshadowed light, things are more complicated. I discuss this complication further in the next section. One other position compatible with the simple view holds that while the local phenomenology of seeing the partially shadowed floor is the same as the local phenomenology of seeing a partially gray floor without cues, the global phenomenology of the two cases is different, because of the difference in cues, and this difference in global phenomenology makes for a difference in conditions of veridicality. This view requires a certain anti-atomism about perceptual content, the veridicality conditions of an experience of a color at a location are not determined just by the local phenomenology associated with the location but also by the phenomenology of the entire visual experience. That is, two experiences can have the same local phenomenology but different local content due to different global phenomenology. This view leads to a complicated further range of options about perceptual content, on some of which the shadow experience may end up being imperfectly, veridical. These options end up roughly mirroring the options for the complex view that follows, which also postulates differences in local content, this time associated with differences in local phenomenology, so I will not discuss them further here. The alternative to the simple view is the complex view, 
on which the apparent sameness in color between the shadowed and unshadowed areas is present in some fashion in the visual phenomenology of seeing the floor. On this view, the experience of seeing the partially shadowed floor is phenomenally different from the experience of seeing a partially gray floor under uniform lighting, and the phenomenal difference is present in the visual phenomenology associated with the floor itself, and not merely in the experience of background cues. On this view, the presence or absence of cues makes a difference to the visual experience of the floor itself, one might say that the cues play a pre-experiential role and not just a pre-judgmental role. This view is naturally associated with a view on which the local phenomenology of color experience is more than three-dimensional. For the sameness to be accommodated in visual phenomenology, it is natural to hold that the color contents associated with the shadowed and unshadowed areas are in some respect the same. If local phenomenology three-dimensional and if differences in local content went along with differences in local phenomenology, the alternative that rejects this second thesis collapses into the anti-atomistic version of the simple view presented earlier, then this sameness in local content would entail that the local phenomenology of seeing the shadowed and unshadowed white regions is exactly the same. That claim is not phenomenologically plausible. So the complex view suggests that the local phenomenology of seeing color has more than three relevant dimensions of variation, with correspondingly more dimensions of variation in representational content. On this view, the shadowed and unshadowed areas will be represented as being the same in some respect, intuitively, both will be represented as white. They will also be represented as being different in some respect, intuitively, one will be represented as being in shadow and one will not. These respects of sameness and difference will both be present in the phenomenology. One can argue that this view is more phenomenologically attractive than the simple view in allowing phenomenological and representational differences between seeing something as shadowed white and as unshadowed white, on the one hand, and between seeing something as shadowed white and as unshadowed gray, on the other. I am inclined to favor the complex view over the simple view for this reason, although the correct characterization of the phenomenology is far from obvious, and neither view is obviously correct or incorrect. If the complex view is correct, what should we say about the Edenic content of an experience of shadowed white? Phenomenologically, such an experience seems to characterize the intrinsic properties of a surface, if one takes the experience completely at face value, there seems to be an intrinsic, although perhaps temporary, difference between the shadowed and unshadowed parts of the floor. So it is natural to say that the Edenic content of the experience attributes a complex intrinsic property to the floor. One might see this property as the conjunction of two intrinsic properties, roughly, perfect whiteness and perfect shadow. That is, the Edenic content presents the floor as being perfectly white, infused in the relevant areas with a perfect shadow. This conjunctive treatment of perfect shadowed white is not mandatory, one could see the property as a certain mode of perfect white rather than as a conjunction of perfect white with an independent perfect shadow property. The conjunctive proposal has a certain phenomenological plausibility, however, insofar as one can see differently colored areas as subject to the same sort of shadow. On this view, perfect shadows are things that can come and go in Eden, while the perfect color of an object stays the same. When a perfect shadow is cast on a perfectly white object, the shadow is on the object in the sense that it affects the intrinsic nature of the object's surface. Of course there are different sorts of shadows corresponding to different degrees of shadowing, each of which can come and go while an object's perfect color stays the same. Strictly speaking, it is best to talk of shadow properties instantiated at locations on objects rather than talking of shadows. While we sometimes have the phenomenology of seeing shadows as objects, it is arguable that more often we do not. One might worry that this view cannot adequately capture the dimension of sameness between shadowed white and unshadowed gray. There is a clear respect in which these experiences are phenomenally similar, and one might argue that this respect corresponds to a representational similarity, perhaps one could say that the objects of such experience seem the same with respect to superficial color or something along those lines. The representational claim is not obviously mandatory here, but if one accepts it, 
one might elaborate the Ednik model by saying that there is a respect in which any objects with perfect shadowed white and perfect unshadowed gray are similar to each other. One might say that both of these perfect properties entail perfect superficial grayness, for example. This might either be seen as a composite property or simply as corresponding to another way of carving up the underlying multidimensional space. What are the imperfect veridicality conditions of such an experience? Presumably an experience as of shadowed white is veridical iff its object has a property that matches perfect shadowed white, or, on the conjunctive treatment of shadowed white, iff it has a property that matches perfect white and a property that matches perfect shadow. The former is plausibly a physical property such as a certain surface reflectance, although see below. As for the latter, it will be a property that normally causes experiences as of the appropriate sort of shadow. It seems that no intrinsic property of surfaces is a good candidate here. Rather, the reasonable candidates are all relational, for example, the property of being subject to the occlusion of a light source to a relevant degree in the relevant area. This is a relational property rather than an intrinsic property, so it does not match the property of perfect shadow as well as it could. But with no intrinsic property being even a candidate, it seems that this property may match well enough. If so, then we can say the experience is imperfectly veridical iff the object has the relevant physical property, imperfect whiteness, and the relevant relational property, imperfect shadow. If it has one but not the other, one can say that the experience is imperfectly veridical in one respect but not the other. One can extend something like this treatment to other cases of color constancy and to cases of variation in illumination in general. One might hold that whenever there are relevant cues about illumination, these make a difference to the complex phenomenology of an experience with a corresponding difference in content. If the perceptual system is doing its job, then the object will be represented as having the same color, but it will also be represented as being different in some relevant respect, analogous to the presence or absence of shadows earlier. The difference in phenomenology seems to involve a difference in intrinsic, if temporary, properties, so the associated Ednik properties are intrinsic, one might call them perfect illumination properties, with the recognition that perfect illumination is intrinsic rather than extrinsic. There will plausibly be a complex space of such perfect illumination properties, perhaps a three-dimensional space, and a corresponding space of matching imperfect properties, which may once again be relational properties, such as the property of being illuminated by certain sorts of light. Once we consider color and illumination together, we will plausibly have at least a six-dimensional space of complex Ednik properties in the vicinity and a corresponding space of imperfect physical-slash-relational properties. One might wonder about the experience of darkness. What happens in Eden when darkness falls? I am inclined to say that darkness is in some respects like the experience of shadow, but more pervasive. As darkness falls, darkness seems to pervade the environment, present at every location. The whole space appears to become dark. Objects do not seem to change their colors, exactly, although the representation of their colors may become much less specific, and it eventually becomes absent altogether, as does the representation of objects, in pitch blackness. So it is natural to say that in Eden, when things become dark, perfect darkness is present throughout the relevant volume of space, intrinsically altering that volume, although it need not alter objects' colors. In Eden, when darkness falls, perfect darkness pervades. What are imperfect colors? The imperfect colors are the properties that match the perfect colors, in our world, and whose instantiation or non-instantiation makes our color experiences veridical or falsitical. Just which properties are these? So far, I have said that these are the intrinsic physical properties that serve as the normal cause of experiences with the corresponding phenomenal properties. A first approximation suggests that these may be certain surface reflectance properties or, better, the categorical basis of the relevant surface reflectance dispositions. But there are some tricky issues. One tricky issue, stressed by Hardin, 1987, 
arises from the fact that there is no such thing as a canonical normal condition for the perception of colors. Instead, there is a wide range of normal conditions, including bright sunlight, muted cloudy light, shaded light, and so on. For a given subject, the same object may cause experiences with different phenomenal characters in each of these conditions. So it is not obvious that there will be any specific physical property that can be singled out as the normal cause of a given phenomenal character property. 1. How we handle this issue depends on whether we take the simple view or the complex view of color constancy. On the complex view, as long as the mechanisms of color constancy work reasonably well, then the same object may cause experiences that are the same in certain key respects while differing in others. For example, a white object will cause an experience of shadowed white in shadowed conditions and an experience of unshadowed white in unshadowed conditions. On the complex view, the Edenic contents of these experiences attribute the same perfect color property, perfect whiteness, but different perfect illumination properties, perfect shadow and perfect unshadow. We can put this by saying that the experiences have the same phenomenal color property and different phenomenal illumination properties. On this view, while a given object may trigger experiences with different phenomenal character in different conditions, these experiences will usually attribute the same phenomenal color, though different phenomenal illuminations, associated with the same perfect color property. So on this view, the wide range of normal conditions is not incompatible with the existence of a reasonably specific property that typically causes experiences with the relevant phenomenal color, that is, experiences that attribute the relevant perfect color, across the range of normal conditions. If we take the simple view of color constancy, the issue is more difficult. According to this view, a white object may cause quite different experiences under bright and shadowed light, let us call them phenomenally white and phenomenally gray experiences. On this view, there is no relevant phenomenal property that is shared by such experiences, any sameness in content enters only at the level of judgment. A phenomenally gray experience may be caused by a white object in one condition and by a gray object in another condition, where both conditions are equally normal. So it appears that on the simple view, there is no fine-grained intrinsic property that can serve as the normal cause of a phenomenally gray experience. A similar issue could arise on the complex view if it turns out that the mechanisms of color constancy are sufficiently unreliable. Appealing to dispositional properties will not help as the fine-grained dispositional properties of a white and a gray object differ as much as their intrinsic properties. Here a number of reactions are possible. One could hold that one condition, example bright midday sunlight, is singled out as normal. One could hold that the matching imperfect property is not an intrinsic or a dispositional property of the object but a, transient, relational property, such as the property of, currently, causing phenomenally gray experiences or the property of reflecting a certain sort of light or the disjunction of being white under shadowed light, gray under unshadowed light, and so on. Alternatively, one could hold that it turns out empirically that no imperfect property matches perfect grayness, so that the, imperfect, free gene content of such an experience determines no non-trivial russell Lian content in the actual world, it is akin in certain respects to a sentence containing an empty description. In my view the most plausible line for a proponent of the simple view to take is to hold that the normal cause of phenomenally gray experiences is a disjunctive or coarse-grained intrinsic property, one whose instances include white objects, gray objects, and any objects that cause phenomenally gray objects in some normal condition. On this view, a phenomenally gray experience of any such object will be veridical. This view has the advantage of capturing our intuitions that no such experience in reasonably normal conditions should be privileged over others and that at least some of these experiences are veridical. The disadvantage of this view is that it suggests that the imperfect, color properties attributed by color experiences are less fine-grained than one might have thought, so that a phenomenally gray and a phenomenally white experience do not attribute incompatible, imperfect, properties even when they occur simultaneously. On reflection, however, this consequence does not seem too bad. The incompatibility is still captured at the level of Edenic content, 
and if one takes the simple view and thinks of shadowed cases, it is reasonably intuitive that phenomenally grey and phenomenally white experiences might be compatible, for example, that both might veridically represent a white floor. 2. Properties such as imperfect redness will be disjunctive in other respects. Color experience is most often caused by the reflection of light from objects, but it is also caused by the radiation of light from light sources, by the transmission of light from semi-transparent sources, and so on. The relevant cause of phenomenal color experiences in the first case will be something like a surface reflectance, or its categorical basis, but in other cases it will be something like a radiation profile, or its categorical basis. It seems reasonable to hold that color experiences of radiating objects and the like can be just as, imperfectly, veridical as those of reflecting objects. So imperfect redness is best seen as a disjunction of a range of reflectance properties, radiation properties, and other properties that can serve as the relevant basis. What are colors? What does this view say about the nature of colors? Philosophers argue about whether colors, such as redness, are best seen as physical properties, dispositional properties, mental properties, primitive properties, or something else. So far I have taken no stand on this matter. What view of colors does the two-stage view suggest? It is reasonable to hold that much of the issue here is terminological. We can acknowledge a role for properties of each of these sorts. Once we understand the precise role that each plays, we understand the substantive issues in the vicinity, whichever of them we choose to call color. That being said, the terminological issue is not wholly without content. There are certain core roles that we expect colors to play, and different properties are differently suited for the label color to the extent that they play more or fewer of these core roles. On the two-stage view, the natural candidates to be called colors are perfect colors and imperfect colors. Both of these can be seen as playing one crucial role associated with colors, they are properties attributed in color experiences. Perfect colors are attributed in Edenic contents, and imperfect colors are attributed in ordinary contents. Perfect colors play certain further core roles that imperfect colors do not. We seem to be acquainted with their intrinsic nature in color experience, and the perfect colors arguably stand in relevant intrinsic structural relations to each other in a way that imperfect colors do not. Still, perhaps the core role of colors is that they are the properties whose instantiation is relevant to the truth of ordinary color attributions. That is, an utterance of that apple is red will be true if and only if the apple instantiates redness. Furthermore, it is natural to hold that some apples really are red. The two-stage view is partly driven by the thesis that some ordinary color experiences are veridical, even if they are not perfectly veridical. It seems equally reasonable to hold that apples really are red, even if they are not perfectly red. If so, this suggests that redness is not perfect redness but imperfect redness. So I am inclined to say that color terms, in their ordinary uses, designate imperfect color properties. Just which properties these are depends on how matching is understood. To the extent that matching is somewhat indeterminate, the designation of color terms may be somewhat indeterminate. But I am inclined to think that our ordinary uses of color terms designate certain disjunctive physical properties, with properties such as surface reflectance properties among the disjunct. The physical properties designated by ordinary color terms will be relatively coarse-grained, but there will be more fine-grained physical properties in the vicinity, which we might regard as the different shades of these colors. 3. Of course, one can also reasonably use color terms to refer to ethnic properties, perfect redness, phenomenal properties, phenomenal redness, and maybe other properties as well. On this view, there are multiply interlocked families of properties, the perfect colors, the imperfect colors, possibly further families of imperfect colors associated with different notions of matching, and the phenomenal colors. As long as we understand the complex relationships between these families, as well as the roles that each can play, not much of real substance rests on which of these families we deem to be the true family of colors. 
there is nothing especially original or distinctive about the view of the ontology of color that emerges from the two-stage view. In identifying colors, in the core sense, with physical properties, the resulting ontology of colors may be very similar to that of the physicalist about color. The various families of color properties that are introduced may also be acknowledged by the primitivist. Although primitivists about color identify perfect color properties with the colors, they may also recognize that physical and dispositional properties play some of the roles of the colors. For example, Mond, 1995, says that terms such as red refer in their core sense to the perfect colors, which he calls virtual colors, but also in an extended or metonymic sense to the physical properties that I have called imperfect colors. So the ontology recognized by the sort of primitivist view is not dissimilar to that recognized by the two-stage view. What is distinctive about the two-stage view is not its associated ontology of colors but rather its view of perceptual content. On the primitivist view, experiences have a single content, an ethnic content, that determines their veridicality. On the two-stage view, experiences have two layers of content, an ethnic content, which reflects their phenomenology, and a free gene content, which determines their veridicality. It is this two-layered view of content that is responsible for most of the explanatory power of the two-stage view. Is this indirect realism? One might worry that this view is a form of indirect realism about color perception. According to standard indirect realism, we perceive objects in the world only indirectly, in virtue of directly perceiving certain intermediate objects such as sense data, which opponents see as a veil of perception that cuts off perceivers from the external world. The two-stage view I have outlined is certainly not a variety of standard indirect realism, as it does not invoke any intermediate objects as objects of perception. But one might worry that it is a form of indirect realism about the perception of properties. In particular, one might suggest that, on this view, instantiated color properties, that is, imperfect color properties, are perceived only indirectly, in virtue of directly perceiving perfect color properties. This objection invokes the relation of perception between subjects and properties. This relation is analogous to the relation of perception between subjects and objects. It is natural to say that when I veridically perceive a green square in the environment, I perceive both the square and its greenness. So far in this chapter, I have focused on the relation of perceptual representation but not on the relation of perception. These seem to be different relations, one can perceptually represent an object or a property without perceiving it, in a hallucination, for example. The standard view of the perceptual relation between subjects and objects holds that it is a causal relation. To perceive an object is roughly to have a perceptual experience that is appropriately caused by the object, and perhaps that has a phenomenal character that is appropriately related to the character of the object. The standard view of the perceptual relation between subjects and properties is presumably something similar. To perceive a property is roughly to have a perceptual experience whose phenomenal character is appropriately causally related to an instance of that property, and perhaps whose phenomenal character represents the instantiation of the property or otherwise matches the property in some fashion. If we adopt this standard view of the perceptual relation, there is no threat of indirect realism. In a typical veridical experience of a green object, the phenomenal character of my experience is causally related to the relevant instance of physical greenness and represents the instantiation of physical greenness in its Russellian content. By contrast, the phenomenal character of my experience is not causally related to any instance of perfect greenness, as there are no such instances. So it seems that on the two-stage view, as much as on other views of perceptual experience, we perceive imperfect colors directly and not in virtue of perceiving any other property. It is true that on the two-stage view, perception is not as direct as perception could be. There is a sense in which perception in Eden is more direct than it is in our non-Edenic world. In Eden, perception works by direct acquaintance, and there need be no mediation between objects and properties perceived and a perceptual experience. In our world, there is complex causal mediation. 
This does not entail that our perception is perceptually mediated, though, as on the indirect realist view. We might say that, in Eden, an especially strong perceptual relation obtains, one that we might call perfect perception. Perfect perception of an object or property requires unmediated acquaintance with the object or the property and perhaps also that the object or the property itself be a constituent of one's perceptual experience. By contrast, imperfect perception requires only the appropriate sort of causal connection to an object or a property. As before, it is plausible to suggest that if we took the deliverances of both perception and introspection fully at face value, we would conclude that we live in an Edenic world in which we perfectly perceive objects and properties in that world. But after the fall from Eden, there is no perfect perception, there is just imperfect perception. We might call this view not indirect realism but imperfect realism. Our acquaintance with the world is not as direct as it would be in Eden, and perception does not reveal the intrinsic nature of things in the way that it does in Eden. But this is so for any causal theory of perception. Perception on the view I have outlined is no more and no less imperfect than on most causal theories. The idea of Eden just brings out the contrast, for all these theories, with the kind of perfect perception that we cannot have in our non-Edenic world. One might yearn for the kind of perfect contact with the world that we had in Eden, but after the fall, we have learned to live with the imperfection of perception. Matching and free gene content. What is matching? The notion of matching serves as a bridge between Edenic content and ordinary content. An experience is imperfectly veridical when its object has properties that match the perfect properties attributed by the experience. But what is it for a property to match a perfect property? To a first approximation, we can say that a property matches a given perfect property, for a given subject, if the property is the normal cause of the associated phenomenal property, in that subject. But this is clearly just a first approximation. A basic constraint is that at most one imperfect property can match a given perfect property. Or at least, at most one imperfect property can match a perfect property for a subject at a time. Different imperfect properties can match the same perfect properties for different subjects and probably for the same subject at widely separated times. Strictly speaking, matching is a three or four place relation involving subjects and times, but I usually leave the subject and the time in the background. But we need at most one matching property for a subject at a time so that the ordinary Russell Lian content of an experience can attribute a property to its object. Of course it could be, for all we have said, that matching imperfect properties are often disjunctive properties or determinable properties with many different determinants. It may also be that sometimes there is no imperfect property that matches a given perfect property. Matching is best understood as a holistic relation. Rather than saying that imperfect redness is the property that normally causes phenomenal redness, one can say that the set of imperfect color properties is that three-dimensional manifold of properties that serves as the normal causal basis for the associated three-dimensional manifold of phenomenal color properties. This requires that there is a mapping from imperfect properties to phenomenal properties such that in many or most cases a given imperfect property will normally cause the associated phenomenal property, but this relation need not hold in all cases. If there are exceptions associated with certain imperfect properties in the manifold, such as Kripke's killer yellow, a shade of yellow that always kills the perceiver if observed, or perhaps a Humean missing shade of blue that is never instantiated in our world for a lawful reason, this will not stop the manifold as a whole from matching, and the imperfect property will still be associated with a corresponding phenomenal property. When this mapping associates an imperfect property with a phenomenal property that attributes a given perfect property, we can say that the imperfect property matches the perfect property. Clearly, the notion of matching is a vague and messy one. One source of messiness arises from the issue discussed earlier, there is no precise delineation of the class of normal conditions. Even if there were such a delineation, there is no precise criterion for when a property causes an experience often enough in these conditions to count as its normal cause. Further, there is more to matching than normally causing an associated phenomenal property. 
we have seen that there are structural constraints, such as the constraint that imperfect color properties fall into the same sort of three-dimensional manifold as perfect color properties. There are also categorical constraints, such as the constraint that imperfect color properties be intrinsic properties if possible. It is presumably also desirable that, imperfect, color properties be properties that can stand in the sort of relations to, imperfect, spatial properties that perfect color properties stand into perfect spatial properties. One could attempt to encapsulate all these constraints and others in a full and precise definition of matching, but I am not optimistic about the prospects for such a definition any more than I am for definitions of other philosophically important notions such as perception and knowledge. An alternative approach is simply to say, matching is that relation M such that, necessarily, an experience is imperfectly veridical iff its objects have properties that bear M to the properties attributed by its Edenic content. In effect, this notion exploits our relatively pre-theoretical grip on imperfect veridicality, along with an independently grounded notion of Edenic content, explained in terms of perfect veridicality, say, to explicate the notion of matching. Of course, this explication does not say anything substantive about what matching involves. For a substantive characterization, we have to rely on judgments about the imperfect, veridicality and falsidicality of experiences. We do have quite clear judgments in many cases. And it is plausible that we judge experiences to be veridical precisely when objects in the world instantiate certain properties, properties that correspond in some fashion to the perfect properties in the Edenic content of our experiences. Even if we cannot give a full account antecedently of what this correspondence consists in, there is good reason to believe that it is present, and one can say quite a lot about what it involves in specific cases, as we have already done. For example, it usually seems to require normal causation of an associated phenomenal property, and there are other constraints as suggested by various cases. As in the case of analyzing knowledge, there will probably be no straightforward articulation of necessary and sufficient constraints, nevertheless, the consideration of cases can help us to flesh out the constraints in the vicinity. One might worry that this characterization taken together with the two-stage view will be circular. The two-stage view says that an experience is imperfectly veridical iff its objects have properties that match the relevant perfect properties. The characterization here says that matching is that relation M such that an experience is imperfectly veridical iff its objects have properties that bear M to the relevant perfect properties. There is no circularity, however. In the project of explication, we have a prior grip on the notion of imperfect veridicality, and we use this prior grip in order to explicate the notion of matching. Via this explication, we theoretically characterize a relation M. One can then use relation M for certain theoretical purposes, if one likes. At the very least, we can appeal to it in analyzing the relationship between imperfect and perfect conditions of veridicality. One might go further and hold that, metaphysically, for an experience to be imperfectly veridical is for its objects to bear M to the relevant perfect properties. Or one might hold that epistemically, our intuitive judgments about imperfect veridicality are mediated by a tacit prior grasp of M. I am cautious about making such further claims here, although I think there is something to them. In any case, there is no more circularity here than in any other case where one uses a pre-theoretical notion to help characterize a theoretical notion, which one then may use to help give a theoretical account of the pre-theoretical notion. Of course, our judgments about, imperfect, veridicality are not always clear. There are many cases in which we are not sure what to say or in which we are tugged in two different directions. Sometimes these judgments are cleared up on a certain amount of rational reflection, but sometimes they are not. When they cannot be cleared up in this way, the natural thing to say is that the relevant case is a vague case of imperfect veridicality. The vagueness of imperfect veridicality will give rise to a corresponding vagueness of matching, it will be vague whether the object in question instantiates a property that matches the relevant perfect property. There may be different ways of preceifying the notion of imperfect veridicality, 
which will give rise to corresponding precisifications of the notion of matching. But some vagueness and messiness in the notion of matching is just what we should expect, given the vagueness and messiness of imperfect veridicality. Is free gene content phenomenologically adequate? Although the two-stage view has a clearer grounding in phenomenological structure than the original free gene view, one might still worry about its phenomenological adequacy. The Edenic content of an experience, in which the two-stage content is grounded, seems to nicely mirror the structure of the phenomenology. But the imperfect free gene content does not. In particular, there is nothing discernible in the phenomenology of visual experience that obviously corresponds to matching. Certainly, it is hard to see that there is any clear phenomenology of normal causation in a typical visual experience. And to the extent that matching is messy and more complex than a notion based on normal causation, it seems all the more distant from the phenomenology. For example, we have seen that matching can often be vague, as can the associated free gene content, but the phenomenology itself need not be vague, or, if it is vague in some respects, it need not be vague in relevant respects. For example, it is plausibly vague in some cases whether an object has a property that matches perfect redness. But the associated phenomenally red experience may be quite precise, with the phenomenology of precisely presenting a specific property of the object. So one may ask, as we did before, whether this free gene view is phenomenologically adequate. I think one should concede that matching does not correspond directly to any element of the visual phenomenology. The phenomenology of visual experience is the same in our world and in Eden. The presentation of an Edenic world does not, or need not, involve attribution of normal causation and the like. So the phenomenology of ordinary visual experience does not, or need not, involve this, either. Perhaps there are some experiences that present causal and dispositional relations, but it seems wrong to say that every ordinary color experience does this. Where does matching come from then? I think the answer is clear, it comes from the inferential role of visual experience. The content of a mental state need not be something that one can read off the intrinsic properties of its vehicles. There is good reason to believe that quite generally, mental content is tied to inferential role. This is especially so in the case of free gene content, which was introduced by Freya to mirror the cognitive and inferential significance of thought and language. A belief expressed by Hesperus is Phosphorus has a very different inferential role from a belief expressed by Hesperus is Hesperus, and this difference in inferential role is reflected in a difference in their inferential content. It is even possible to define the free gene conditions of satisfaction of a belief partly in terms of the belief's inferential role, such as the conditions under which a subject will rationally accept or reject the belief, given information about the world, see Chalmers 2002 for such an account. Beliefs are not the only mental states that have inferential roles. Perceptual experiences also have an inferential role, broadly understood. Just as one belief can serve as grounds for accepting or rejecting another belief, a perceptual experience can likewise serve as grounds for accepting or rejecting beliefs and, more generally, for guiding our knowledge about the world. Most obviously, as discussed in the afterword to the previous chapter, one can endorse a perceptual experience, yielding a perceptual belief about the character of one's environment, and that belief can be used to accept or reject other beliefs in turn. For example, when one has a phenomenally red experience as of an object in one's environment, this can be used as grounds for accepting a belief that there is a red object in front of one. One would not normally call this relation between experience and belief an inference, but it can be seen as a sort of quasi-inferential relation. Just as with belief, the inferential role of a perceptual experience can be analyzed in part by asking, when given information about how things are in the world, will a subject accept or reject the perceptual experience? That is, will the subject accept or reject the belief that things are as they perceptually seem to be? If one takes an example, such as a subject having a phenomenally red experience as of an object in front of her, one finds a specific pattern of judgments. 
if the subject discovers that there is really no object in front of her, she will reject the experience, things are not as they seem. If she discovers that there is an object in front of her but it has the sort of physical makeup that usually causes phenomenally green experiences, causing phenomenally red experiences this time only due to unusual lighting, then she will reject the experience, again, things are not as they seem. But if she discovers that the object in front of her has the sort of makeup that usually causes phenomenally red experiences, then she will accept the experience, at least in the relevant respects, things are as they seem. In effect, the core inferential role of a perceptual experience is reflected in the pattern of judgments about veridicality and falsiticality that the subject of such an experience makes or, more strictly, in the pattern of judgments that should be rationally made. We have already seen that this pattern of judgments closely corresponds to the free gene content presented earlier. The pattern of judgments does not require that objects in the environment have any specific property such as a surface reflectance or even perfect redness. It requires only that the property be the property that plays the appropriate causal role. So as in the case of beliefs, this free gene content closely mirrors the experience's inferential role. 4. Here we can respond to the charge of phenomenological adequacy by rejecting the claim that phenomenal content must precisely mirror phenomenological structure. Phenomenal content can equally be grounded in inferential role. Of course, a proponent of the original free gene view could have made the same response, as I did in response to a similar worry in the last chapter. So how is the two-stage view any better in this respect? To see the difference, recall where things stood at the end of section 5. It was not clear that the objections from phenomenological adequacy had knocked down force, but they raised the issue of a serious explanatory incompleteness in the free gene view. Free gene content is supposed to be a sort of phenomenal content, such that necessarily, an experience with the same phenomenology has the same free gene content. But the presentational phenomenology of visual experience does not simply wear its free gene content on its sleeve. So there needs to be some explanatory story about how free gene content is related to the phenomenology of the experience and why it is that any experience with that phenomenology will have this free gene content. It is this explanatory story that the two-stage view provides. The presentational phenomenology of an experience immediately grounds an Edenic content. The free gene content is grounded in the Edenic content in virtue of inferential role. The subject is immediately presented, in visual phenomenology, with an Edenic world. But a rational subject need not hold the world to an Edenic standard. In effect, a rational subject will use the Edenic phenomenology of a phenomenally red experience to ground the claim that the object in front of her is red, but she need not make strong claims about the intrinsic nature of redness. That is left open, if the subject discovers that objects with property P typically cause red experiences, then she will decide that those objects are red and that if the original object has property P, then the original experience was veridical. In effect, the presentational phenomenology of the experience serves as direct ground for the first stage of the two-stage view, the Edenic content, and as indirect ground for the second stage, matching the Edenic content, by virtue of inferential role. Is free gene content phenomenal content? Once we observe that ordinary free gene content derives from inferential role, this may raise another worry, is free gene content really phenomenal content? The mere fact that free gene content does not completely mirror phenomenological structure here is no objection since the definition of phenomenal content does not require this sort of mirroring. However, the definition does require that any experience with the same phenomenology has the same phenomenal content. One may then worry, if inferential role is extrinsic to phenomenology, could not two phenomenally identical experiences have different inferential roles, yielding distinct free gene contents? Of course, there is an obvious sense in which phenomenally identical experiences can have different inferential roles. For example, if I believe that red snakes are poisonous and you do not, then relevantly similar visual experiences in the two of us might produce quite different beliefs. 
but this difference in inferential role need not be a difference in the core aspect of inferential role that is relevant to defining free gene content. This core aspect involves the subject's pattern of judgments of veridicality and falsiticality associated with the experience. More precisely, it turns on whether the subject should rationally accept or reject the experience, that is, judge that things are or are not as they perceptually seem to be, when given relevantly complete information about the world. Two subjects may have the same pattern of judgments here despite different beliefs. For example, in the preceding case, both subjects may well have the same rational dispositions to accept or reject the experience, given full information. Free gene content will be phenomenal content as long as the same experience rationalizes the same pattern of judgments, given relevant information, in all subjects. Of course, there may be differences in an associated actual pattern of judgments due to cognitive limitations, but a rational inferential role idealizes away from such limitations. This will be the case as long as, I, every phenomenally identical experience has the same Edenic content, Two, every subject should rationally accept an experience, given relevant information, IFF, according to that information, the relevant object has properties that match the properties attributed in the Edenic content, and, three, the matching relation is the same for all subjects. I think there is good reason to accept, I, and, two. We have already seen that Edenic content is a sort of phenomenal content. Further, the match involving inferential role is rational for any subject with a perceptual experience. Such an experience presents a world with a certain distribution of Edenic properties, and rational judgments of veridicality should turn on whether objects in the world have properties that match those Edenic properties. What is not so clear is whether one should accept, 3. We have already seen that the notion of matching is somewhat vague and imprecise. Could there not be subjects whose equally rational judgments invoke somewhat different matching relations, perhaps held to somewhat different standards in each case? For example, one might suggest that before the fall from Eden, the inferential role of our experiences required a strict standard of matching. Perhaps an Edenic subject would judge an experience falsitical if they discovered that its object merely has an imperfect property that serves as its normal cause. However, there is good reason to hold that even our Edenic counterparts have dispositions such that if they were to discover that their world is non-Edenic, they would still judge their experiences to be, imperfectly, veridical when their objects have the relevant imperfect properties. After all, when we discovered that our world was non-Edenic, these were the judgments that we made. So there is reason to believe that the free gene inferential role is present even in Eden. Still, one can ask whether there could be rational subjects, whether in Eden or outside, who have such a strict standard of matching that they will accept a phenomenally read experience only if the relevant object is perfectly read. If such subjects discover that the world is non-Edenic, they will reject all of their color experiences as falsitical. For such subjects, the relevant standard of matching would be the strict standard of identity, a property matches perfect redness IFF it is perfect redness. Certainly there could be a subject that has an actual pattern of judgments like this. The relevant question is, could this pattern of judgments be as rational as the pattern of judgments that we have been discussing? The answer is not obvious. Likewise, we can imagine subjects who make different judgments in difficult cases. For example, let us assume the simple view of color constancy. Then one subject might judge a phenomenally read experience to be veridical IFF the relevant object has the property that causes such experiences in bright sunlight. Another subject might judge such an experience to be veridical IFF the relevant object has any property in the range that might cause the experience in some normal condition. Still another subject might judge that no such experience is veridical as there is no single specific property that plays the right role. The question then is, could these patterns of judgment be equally rational? Finally, we can consider a possible difference between visual and olfactory experience. We do not usually judge olfactory experiences to be veridical or falsitical. 
We do not say that a rotten egg smell is veridical IFF there is sulfur dioxide nearby and falsitical IFF there is not, for example. This is not because the phenomenology of smell is not representational, intuitively, it seems to represent that certain smells are present in the world. It is just that we are not inclined to make judgments of veridicality and falsiticality, at best, we make judgments of misleadingness or otherwise. On the other hand, perhaps there could be subjects who make judgments of veridicality or falsiticality for phenomenally identical olfactory experiences. For example, one can imagine that if dogs could make judgments, this is what they would do. One could diagnose this by saying that for those subjects, but not for us, there are properties in the environment that match perfect smells. The question is whether both patterns of judgment are equally rational. It is possible to say no in all of these cases. One might hold that one pattern of judgments in these cases is rational and that the others are not. For example, one could argue that in the first case there is some irrationality in holding the world to an Edenic standard and that in the second case it is irrational to reject a color experience when its object has a property that normally causes that sort of experience. One could also hold that in at least some of these cases, insofar as it is possible for corresponding experiences to rationalize different patterns of judgment, there will be a corresponding difference in the phenomenology. For example, in case of olfactory experience, one could suggest that the phenomenology of smell in dogs and humans differs, perhaps dogs have a more strongly presentational phenomenology, for example. More generally, one might hold that certain differences in the character of presentational phenomenology might go along with differences in the associated standard of matching. In such cases, the existence of different rationalized patterns of judgment will be no obstacle to free gene content serving as a sort of phenomenal content. My own view is that it is not obvious that phenomenology underdetermines the standard of matching, but it is not obvious that it does not. Whether it does or not depends on difficult questions about the rational role of perception and also about its presentational phenomenology, which I cannot adjudicate here but I think that it is at least a live possibility that the standard of matching is underdetermined and that there could be distinct, equally rational patterns of judgment associated with the same sort of experience in different subjects. If this is so, then what follows? One could say that the phenomenally identical experiences have distinct free gene contents, in which case free gene content is not phenomenal content, or one could say that they have the same highly indeterminate free gene content, in which case imperfect veridicality is highly indeterminate. Perhaps the best thing to say in this event, however, is that these experiences have the same unsaturated free gene content. This content is one that is satisfied IFF the relevant object has properties that match the relevant primitive properties. However, the standard of matching is left unspecified by this unsaturated content, so the condition of satisfaction is in a certain sense incomplete. To yield a complete condition of satisfaction, the unsaturated content needs to be saturated by specifying a standard of matching. The resulting saturated free gene content will yield a reasonably determinate condition of imperfect veridicality. According to this view, only unsaturated free gene content and not saturated free gene content will be phenomenal content. 5. This is a step back from the original view of free gene content as phenomenal content, as an unsaturated free gene content is not a complete condition of satisfaction. That is, it is not the sort of thing that is true or false absolutely in a scenario. Correspondingly, the unsaturated free gene content of an experience does not determine whether or not the experience is imperfectly veridical in its environment. What determines imperfect veridicality is a saturated free gene content, which is not fully determined by phenomenal character. What determines saturated free gene content, if not phenomenology? One natural answer is inferential role, here conceived as something that might vary independently of phenomenology. In the different subjects discussed earlier, phenomenally identical experiences play different inferential roles, yielding different saturated free gene contents. In effect, the different inferential roles in different subjects, as reflected in a pattern of veridicality judgments, determine different standards of matching. 
In this way phenomenology and inferential role together determine a saturated free gene content and a condition of imperfect veridicality. An alternative suggestion is that saturated free gene content is determined not by inferential role but by a standard of assessment that is extrinsic to the subject. On this view, in effect, one could evaluate the same experience as either veridical or falsitical at different standards of assessment. I have already introduced dual standards of perfect and imperfect veridicality, on this view, there will be a range of different standards in the vicinity of imperfect veridicality. This range of standards will correspond to a range of different standards of matching. To evaluate an experience with an unsaturated free gene content, we must tacitly introduce a standard of matching. This standard will determine a saturated free gene content, and according to the standard the experience will qualify as veridical or falsitical. One can then say that our ordinary notion of veridicality tacitly invokes a certain standard of matching, one that is reasonably although not completely determinate. With this standard fixed, phenomenally identical experiences will have the same saturated free gene contents. However, there might have been different evaluators with a slightly different notion of veridicality, corresponding to a different standard of matching. With that standard fixed, phenomenally identical experiences will also have the same saturated free gene contents, but these contents will differ from those associated with our standard. One might say that on this view, any given experience is associated with a whole range of, saturated, free gene contents, depending on the corresponding notion of veridicality. Each of these free gene contents could be seen as a sort of phenomenal content. The two suggestions according to which saturated content is determined by inferential role or by an external standard yield a somewhat different treatment of cases. Take a subject whose inferential role holds her experiences to the Edenic standard, upon discovering that the world is non-Edenic, she rationally rejects her perceptual experiences. On the former view, we will say that her experience is non-veridical, it is her own rational inferential role that determines ordinary veridicality. On the latter view, we will say that her experience is veridical, it is our standards that determine the veridicality of an experience, according to the meaning of our term veridical. However, if she or someone sharing a similar standard were to say that her experience is non-veridical, they would also be correct they express a slightly different notion of satisfaction with their term veridical. On reflection I find the second suggestion somewhat more plausible and intuitive than the first, although the matter is far from obvious. In any case, whichever view we take, one can say the following. The phenomenal character of an experience determines an Edenic phenomenal content, and it determines an unsaturated free gene phenomenal content. According to the unsaturated phenomenal content, an experience is veridical iff the relevant object has properties that match the relevant Edenic properties. Once combined with a standard of matching, this unsaturated content determines a saturated free gene content. This saturated free gene content may or may not be phenomenal content, depending on what view one takes on the foregoing questions. If one thinks that there is only one rational standard of matching associated with the phenomenal character of the experience, then the saturated free gene content will be a phenomenal content. If one thinks that the associated standard of matching depends on a contingently associated inferential role in the subject, then the saturated free gene content will not be a phenomenal content. If one thinks that the standard of matching is determined by an external standard of assessment, then the free gene content will be a phenomenal content, but there will be a range of other free gene contents associated with different standards of veridicality. The choice among these three alternatives turns on difficult and subtle issues that I will not try to resolve here. In any case, we can be confident that phenomenal character determines Edenic content and unsaturated free gene content. The status of saturated free gene content as phenomenal content remains an open question. 12 Beyond Color I have concentrated on the content of color experience, but I think the two-stage model has much broader application. Here I will much more briefly discuss the extension to other aspects of perceptual experience. Spatial Experience Apart from colors, 
the most salient properties attributed in visual experience are spatial properties. Does the two-stage model of phenomenal content generalize to these? I am inclined to think that it does. One might think that spatial experience is more amenable to a straightforward russell Lien treatment than color experience. But as Thompson, forthcoming, argues, many of the same problems arise. A natural candidate for the russell Lien content of spatial experiences involves the attribution of spatial properties such as that of being in a certain, absolute, location. However, this content obviously cannot be phenomenal content since a phenomenally identical experience could be had by a subject light years away from that location. A natural next suggestion is a russell Lien content involving the attribution of relative spatial properties, or relations or relational property radicals, such as being six feet in front of the perceiver. But this cannot be phenomenal content either. In principle, a phenomenally identical experience could be had by a perceiver who is, and has always been, twice as big and in an environment where everything is twice as distant. Such an experience would not plausibly attribute the same relative spatial property, it would more plausibly attribute the relative property of being 12 feet away. One might then move to more relativized spatial properties, such as the property of being twice as distant or twice as big as some other object. Or one might suggest that phenomenal content can at least attribute shape properties, such as being square or circular. But as Thompson argues, similar problems arise. There could conceivably be an El Greco world in which everything is stretched ten times in one direction compared with our world but in which structure and dynamics are otherwise isomorphic. In such an environment, phenomenally square experiences would normally be caused by, what we call, long and thin rectangles. Further, there is good reason to think that such experiences would be veridical. Certainly, if we found that we inhabit a corner of the universe that is locally stretched in this fashion relative to the rest of the universe, we would not conclude that our spatial experiences are falsitical. Rather, the natural thing to say is that phenomenally square experiences attribute different properties in these environments, what we call, squareness in one environment and a certain sort of rectangularity in another. A more extreme case along these lines is given by a matrix scenario, in which phenomenally identical subjects have been hooked up for their lifetime to a computer simulation of the world. I argue in the next chapter that such subjects are not massively deluded about the world. Their beliefs such as there are tables, I have hands, and that is square are true, it is just that the underlying metaphysics of their environment is not what they expect, in effect, it is an underlying computational metaphysics. The same can be argued for their perceptual experiences, their experiences as of red square objects are as veridical as ours. However, such experiences need not be of, what we would call, square objects, there need be nothing square inside the computer. At best, there are objects with some very different property, which we might call virtual squareness. If phenomenally identical spatial experiences can be veridical in an environment that is spatially utterly unlike our own, this suggests that the phenomenal content of these experiences does not involve the attribution of ordinary spatial properties. In this way, one can argue against Russell Lian views of spatial phenomenal content in ways that directly parallel our earlier arguments in the case of color experience. The natural alternative is a free gene view of spatial phenomenal content. On this view, spatial experiences have russell Lien content, attributing spatial properties and relations, but this content is not phenomenal content. Rather, phenomenal content involves a free gene mode of presentation of spatial properties and relations, roughly, these are determined as that manifold of properties and relations that serves as the normal causal basis for the corresponding manifold of spatial experiences. On this view, the free gene content of a spatial experience is one that will be satisfied if the object has a property that normally causes the relevant sort of spatial experience, or if it has a complex of properties each of which normally causes the relevant sort of spatial aspect of the experience. One can then raise concerns about the phenomenological adequacy of this view, motivating a two-stage view of spatial phenomenal content. On the two-stage view, 
spatial experiences have an Edenic content that attributes perfect spatial properties, perfect squareness, perfect rectangularity, and so on. Arguably, even an Edenic content does not attribute absolute spatial properties but just relative properties. It is not clear that we have the phenomenology of being presented with absolute spatial properties, and one can make a case that even in Eden, there could be phenomenally identical veridical experiences at different locations. But we do have the phenomenology of being presented at least with absolute shapes and relative distances. So the Edenic contents of our experience will attribute perfect properties of this sort. It is plausible that these properties are not instantiated in our world, though arguing this takes a bit more work than in the case of color. If not, then our spatial experiences are not perfectly veridical. Our spatial experiences may nevertheless be imperfectly veridical in virtue of their objects instantiating imperfect spatial properties, those that match perfect spatial properties. These will be the properties that serve as the normal causal basis for our spatial experiences. Imperfect veridicality will be associated with a corresponding ordinary free gene content, one that is satisfied IFF relevant objects have properties that match the relevant perfect spatial properties. Phenomenally identical experiences will have the same Edenic contents and the same ordinary free gene contents, setting aside issues about standards of matching, but they may have different ordinary russell lian contents, because different properties may match the relevant perfect properties in different environments. The matrix provides a good illustration. The subjects here do not have perfectly veridical experiences, but they have imperfectly veridical experiences in virtue of the fact that relevant matching properties, virtual squareness and the like, are instantiated in their environment. So subjects in the matrix may share Edenic spatial contents with us, and may share ordinary free gene contents also, but they will have different ordinary russell lian contents. Of course, the two-stage model of spatial experience needs to be elaborated in numerous respects to handle all sorts of aspects of spatial content, for example, perspective, angle, size constancy, and mirror reflections. But there is reason to think it can help explain certain phenomena. For example, it is better suited than the original free gene view to accommodate internal connections between spatial representation in visual and tactile experience. On the original free gene view, it might seem that there can be no internal connection since the normal causes of visual spatial experience are not constrained to be the normal causes of tactile spatial experience. On the two-stage model, however, one can argue that the phenomenology entails that tactile and spatial experiences involve the attribution of common, perfect spatial properties in their Edenic content. If so, then the matching imperfect properties will be constrained to be the same, thus grounding an internal connection between tactile and spatial experience. It is a further question how this model should be extended to the representation of time and motion. I am inclined to say that the two-stage model can be extended to time, as well as to space, though this turns on subtle issues about the metaphysics of time. A natural suggestion is that the Edenic content of temporal experience requires a theoretic time, with some sort of true flow or passage. Our own universe may not instantiate these perfect temporal properties, but it may nevertheless instantiate matching B theoretic properties, involving relative location in a four-dimensional block universe, which are sufficient to make our temporal experiences imperfectly veridical, if not perfectly veridical. The representation of motion could be treated in a similar way. One might go so far as to suggest that Eden is a world with classical Euclidean space and an independent dimension of time, in which there is true passage and true change. Our own world is non-Euclidean, with time and space interdependent and with pale shadows of perfect passage and change. On this view, Einstein's theory of space-time was one more bite from the tree of science and one more step in our fall from Eden. The Experience of Objects Our initial characterization of the russell lian contents of visual experience characterized them as having the following form, object O has color C at location L. In the case of color and location I have argued that this russell lian content is not phenomenal content and have proposed a two-stage free gene treatment instead. In the case of color, 
we have seen that the relevant Russell Lian content is also not plausibly phenomenal content. Does this mean that we should also give a two-stage free gene treatment of the representation of objects? A natural first suggestion is that experiences of objects have an Edenic content involving the representation of certain specific perfect objects, as discussed below for example, perfect object O has perfect color C at perfect location L. However, this suggestion is implausible on reflection. In particular, it is implausible that the perfect veridicality of an experience of an object requires any particular Edenic object to be present. It seems that even in Eden there could be two phenomenally identical experiences of different objects. The phenomenology of object experience seems to present us directly with objects, but it does not seem to acquaint us with their intrinsic nature in a sense over and above acquainting us with their colors, shapes, and so on. If it did, then the phenomenology of object experience would be quite different from what it is, experiences of different tennis balls would typically have quite different phenomenal characters, for example. But the experience of objects does not seem to be this way. 6. Because of this, it is more natural to hold that even the Edenic content of object experience is existential. For example, one might hold that the Edenic content of an experience of a red sphere is satisfied iff there is a perfect sphere at the relevant location that is perfectly red. No specific object is required for the satisfaction of this content. On this view, Edenic content is not especially different from ordinary content in the representation of objects, so the two-stage model has no special role to play. Still, there may be a further role for the two-stage model. One might hold that a merely existential characterization of phenomenal content does not fully respect the directness of an experience of an object. 7. According to this objection, experience does not merely present that there is an object at a certain location with a certain color. Rather, it presents that that object is at a certain location with a certain color. One might accommodate this suggestion without moving all the way to object involving phenomenal contents, however. The phenomenology of perception does not seem to reveal the intrinsic hyacetistic natures of objects, but it does seem to present us with objects directly. To account for this, one can suggest that the experience of objects involves demonstrative modes of presentation. In Eden, one is directly acquainted with objects, and no mediation is involved. One can simply demonstrate an object as this object, and acquaintance does the rest. This sort of reference is analogous to the unmediated way we refer to ourselves in our world, with I, or perhaps to the unmediated way in which we ostend our conscious experiences. An Edenic content might correspondingly have the form that is C at L, where that is a primitive demonstrative, C is a perfect color, and L is a perfect location. The demonstrative here does not build in the identity of the object any more than the notion of I builds in a specific person, the same demonstrative could in principle refer to different objects, just as I can refer to different people. But neither is it associated with a substantive criterion of application. When the demonstrative has an object, it simply picks out the object directly as that object. In the two-dimensional model, one could say that in Eden, one can refer directly to perceived objects as entities at the center of a centered world. This Edenic content respects the direct presentational phenomenology of our experience of objects, but it is not clear that it has application outside Eden. In our world, we are not directly acquainted with objects outside ourselves, mediation is always involved. So our epistemic grip on objects is not as direct as it is in Eden, and the primitively demonstrative aspects of Edenic content are arguably not satisfied. Nevertheless, we stand in a weaker relevant relation to objects in our world, the relation of perception. One might say that in virtue of standing in this relation, the objectual aspects of our experience are imperfectly satisfied. There will be an associated condition of imperfect satisfaction. An object imperfectly satisfies the experience iff it is the object perceived with the experience, that is, if it is connected to the experience via an appropriate causal chain. One can think of this as a non-primitive demonstrative condition of satisfaction. 
It comes with substantive requirements but is grounded in a primitive connection to the experience itself. So, in effect, the objectual phenomenology of the experience can be perfectly or imperfectly satisfied. Perfect satisfaction turns on primitive acquaintance, and imperfect satisfaction requires at least a mediated perceptual connection. The imperfect satisfaction conditions of an experience can be seen as a sort of, ordinary, free gene mode of presentation, picking out the object that the experience is appropriately connected to. The experience as a whole will be imperfectly veridical iff the object that is appropriately connected to the experience has properties that match the relevant perfect properties. According to this view, the ordinary free gene content of the experience will involve a connectedness condition of this sort, and it will determine in turn a russell lien content involving the relevant objects and its imperfect properties. Of course, the ordinary free gene content is not a perfect mirror of the phenomenology. As usual, the phenomenology does not seem to involve reference to a causal condition or reference to the subject's experience. But this is just what we expect, Edenic contents mirror the phenomenology, and associated free gene contents capture veridicality conditions after the fall. If one takes this view, one will class so-called veridical hallucinations, hallucinations that happen to mirror the environment in front of one, as not really veridical at all. In these cases there is no object that one is perceiving, so the free gene content is not satisfied, and an object involving russell lien content is not determined. An alternative route to this result, Searle 1983, Siegel 2005, is to suggest that experiences have existential contents that attribute the relational property of being perceived with the relevant experience to the relevant object. Arguably, however, suggesting that this relational property is attributed along with color and location does not respect the subjunctive intuition that things could have been as they perceptually seem to be, even had there been no perceivers in the vicinity. By contrast, putting the perceptual requirement in the mode of presentation of the object allows this subjunctive intuition to be respected. There is perhaps one other role for the two-stage model in the representation of objects. The phenomenology of vision seems to present a world that is carved into objects at its joints. One does not simply perceive a distribution of mass and color. One perceives objects on top of other objects, each of which may be articulated into objectual parts. Depending on one's metaphysical views, one may think that the world does not respect this articulation into objects. One might think that macroscopic objects do not exist in the world's basic ontology, or one might give their existence some highly deflationary treatment on which their individuation is a matter of convention or conceptual scheme, or on which there is no deep fact of the matter about when there is an object or when there is not. But even if one's metaphysics is deflationary about objects, one's phenomenology is not. So perhaps, for our visual experiences to be perfectly veridical, there would have to be real, first-class, non-relative objects in the world. One might say that in Eden, there are perfect objects. If our world's ontology does not have perfect objects, or at least if it does not have perfect objects corresponding to the apparent objects of ordinary perception, then our experiences are not perfectly veridical in this respect. Still, they may be imperfectly veridical, by virtue of their being appropriately arranged matter in the environment, or by virtue of the environment satisfying some other deflationary condition. Once again, Eden sets the standard, and our imperfect world can only match it. Other Sensory Modalities The two-stage model can naturally be extended from visual experience to auditory and tactile experience. The details of these extensions depend on a careful analysis of the phenomenology of these experiences, combined with analysis of judgments about veridicality, but there is reason to believe that the model outlined in the case of vision will apply. The phenomenology of auditory experience, at a first approximation, seems to represent certain sounds as being present at certain locations. For example, in a musical experience, the phenomenology might suggest that a sound with a certain pitch, timbre, volume, and so on is being produced at a certain approximate location in front of me. As in the case of color, 
there are physical properties that one might plausibly identify with various pitch, timber, and volume properties and that one might hold to be attributed in an ordinary Russell Lian content. But these properties depend on the environment of the experience, and it seems that phenomenally identical experiences could have different Russell Lian contents of this sort. So one can move to a free gene phenomenal content in these cases and then, to respect phenomenological adequacy, hold that this content is grounded in the matching of an Edenic phenomenal content. In Eden, one may hold, there are perfect sounds, with perfect middle C pitch, perfect loudness, and so on. We grasp these simple intrinsic properties in our experience, but they are not instantiated in our world. Instead, in our world there are simply physical events such as air disturbances with associated physical properties that match the Edenic properties. This is enough to make our auditory experiences imperfectly veridical, if not perfectly veridical. Something similar goes for tactile experience. In Eden, objects may be perfectly smooth or perfectly slimy or perfectly velvety. These are intrinsic properties of objects or their surfaces, and we seem to be acquainted with these properties in our experience. But in our world there are just complex physical substitutes for these properties, such as imperfect sliminess and imperfect velvetiness. This is enough to satisfy the ordinary free gene content of our tactile experiences, if not the Edenic content, and enough to make our tactile experiences imperfectly veridical. Olfactory and gustatory experiences are trickier. The phenomenology of smell and taste seems to be representational. Intuitively, an olfactory experience represents that a certain smell is present in one's environment, perhaps in a certain broad location. A gustatory experience represents that something with a certain taste is in one's mouth or throat or on one's lips. But at the same time, we do not usually assess experiences of smell and taste for veridicality, and the notion of an illusory olfactory or gustatory experience does not get a strong grip on us. Certainly, there can be smell experiences that are caused by properties that do not normally produce such experiences, and the same applies to taste experiences, imagine a rewiring of the connection between receptors and the brain, for example, but it does not seem natural to describe such experiences as illusions. It is slightly more natural to speak of olfactory and gustatory hallucinations, when an experience is generated for reasons quite independent of external objects, but the intuition is not strong. Taste and smell differ in this way from hearing and touch. We certainly assess auditory experiences for veridicality and speak of auditory illusions if there is not a sound being produced where there seems to be. This way of speaking is less common in the case of touch, as touch seems to be the most reliable of the sensory modalities, but we can nevertheless make good sense of the idea of a tactile illusion or hallucination. An object might feel smooth although it is not really smooth, or one might feel that an object is present when there is no object at all. In these cases we have no hesitation in classifying a tactile experience as falsitical. In the case of taste and smell, by contrast, one hesitates. I suspect that this is partly because we use taste and smell much less to gather information about our environment than we do hearing and touch and partly, perhaps correspondingly, because the presentational element of their phenomenology is less striking. Still, there is some presentational phenomenology in the experience of smell and taste. We seem to have some grip on intrinsic qualitative properties that are presented, although it is somewhat less obvious than in the case of vision that the phenomenology presents intrinsic properties of objects or of the environment as opposed to intrinsic qualities of experiences, or corresponding relational properties of objects and environment. Overall, though, I am inclined to say that olfactory and gustatory experiences have Edenic contents, the former present perfect smells as being present in one's environment, and the latter present perfect tastes as being instantiated in one's mouth. It is the ordinary content of these experiences that is problematic. It is plausible that there are physical properties that normally cause the relevant olfactory and gustatory aspects of experiences, so one might think these would be the imperfect smells and tastes attributed in the ordinary content of these experiences. But because our assessments of veridicality are very unclear in these cases, 
it is likewise unclear whether these physical properties count as matching the relevant Edenic properties. In these cases, the standard for matching seems somewhat different from the case of vision and hearing perhaps because of a difference in presentational phenomenology or perhaps just because we apply a different standard because of different pragmatic purposes. So the status of ordinary free gene and russell lien content in these cases is unclear. But we can nevertheless invoke Edenic content to help characterize the phenomenology. Bodily sensations. What about bodily sensations, such as the pain experiences, itches, hunger, and orgasms? On the face of it, these have a strong presentational phenomenology. The experience of pain, for example, seems to present a certain painful quality as being instantiated in part of one's body, such as one's ankle. The experience of an itch seems to present a certain itchy quality as being presented on one's skin. In the phenomenology, these qualities seem to have a highly distinctive intrinsic qualitative nature. So it is natural to hold that bodily sensations have an associated Edenic content, attributing Edenic properties such as perfect painfulness and perfect itchiness to locations in one's body. There are two complications in this case. The first resembles the complication in the case of smell and taste. We do not generally assess bodily sensations for veridicality or falsidicality. Perhaps in an extreme case such as phantom limb pain, we are somewhat inclined to say there is some sort of falsidical pain hallucination, but we are not really inclined to speak of pain illusions or of illusory itch experiences. If we did, we would probably be talking of a case where we mistake the phenomenal character of an experience, not where we mistake its object. As in the case of smell and taste, it seems that there are physical properties, such as tissue damage and the like, that normally cause the relevant experiences. But we are not especially inclined to say that when these properties are absent, an experience as of pain or as of an itch is falsidical. Even if there is no associated tissue damage, for example, we are not inclined to say that an intense pain experience is illusory. So the ordinary free gene and russell lien content of these experiences seems somewhat unclear in the same way as in the case of smell and taste. A related complication concerns the Edenic content of bodily sensations. What are perfect pains like in Eden? That is, what sort of properties need to be instantiated in one's body in order for a painful experience to be perfectly veridical? Here there are conflicting requirements. First, the properties seem to be intrinsic properties whose nature we grasp in experience. The phenomenology of pain in one's ankle seems to attribute a quality that is intrinsic to one's ankle. But second, the properties seem to have a strong connection to experience itself. Can one conceive of one's ankle being in perfect pain without anyone experiencing the pain? It is not clear that we can. In this respect the phenomenology of pain is quite different from the phenomenology of color, where we have no trouble conceiving of an object being perfectly colored even though no one ever experiences its color. But, this seems strongly to suggest that perfect pain is a relational property because its instantiation places requirements on how things are outside the object in which it is instantiated. Is the property of perfect pain intrinsic or relational? Neither answer is entirely comfortable. If perfect pain is an intrinsic property of an ankle, it seems that its instantiation should be independent of whether an experience is present. But it is not clear that unexperienced perfect pain is conceivable. If perfect pain is a relational property, on the other hand, what relational property could it be, the property of causing a painful experience, or of having such and such intrinsic quality perceived in a painful experience? Neither of these seems apt to the phenomenology. Furthermore, the former seems to claim too little about what is going on in one's ankle, and the latter seems vulnerable to the objection that came up in the intrinsic case, we do not seem to have a grip on any relevant intrinsic quality here that we can conceive instantiated in the absence of a painful experience. Perhaps the best answer is the following, perfect pain is an intrinsic property, but one whose instantiation entails the existence of an associated painful experience or of associated phenomenal pain. We might think of it as an intrinsic property that, if instantiated, necessarily broadcasts further constraints on the world. 
In effect, it is an intrinsic property that stands in a necessary connection to distinct intrinsic properties of experience. It is a property whose instantiation brings about necessary connections between distinct existences. If this property could be instantiated, problems would follow. It is not clear that there can be necessary connections between distinct existences of this sort. It seems plausible that for any conceivable or possible situation in which an intrinsic property is instantiated in one's ankle, it should be conceivable or possible that the property is instantiated in an arbitrarily different context. But it is not conceivable or possible that there is perfect pain without pain experience. The natural conclusion is that perfect pain cannot be instantiated, there is no possible world in which there is perfect pain, and on reflection it is not even conceivable that there is perfect pain. In effect, the instantiation of perfect pain places incoherent requirements on the world. This does not entail that there is no property of perfect pain. There are other properties whose instantiation is impossible and inconceivable, that of being a round square, for example. One might hold that perfect pain is like this. On this view, one has a grip on the property of perfect pain based on one's experience. But one does not need to eat from the tree of illusion or the tree of science to know that perfect pain is not instantiated, one can know this simply on sufficient reflection. Perhaps there can be matching intrinsic properties, without the relational constraint, or matching relational properties, without the intrinsic constraint, but no property can play both roles. Still, one may hold that the property exists, and one can hold that it is attributed in the Edenic content of our pain experiences. 8. In effect, the Edenic content of pain sets a standard that is not just hard but impossible to meet. There are related instantiated properties, to be sure, that of causing painful experiences, for example, or that of having a certain sort of tissue damage. But because these fall so far short of playing the role of perfect pain, the former is not intrinsic, and the second has no strong connection to experience, one might suggest that they fail to match perfect pain. It is arguably because of this that we do not judge that the instantiation of these properties yields veridicality or falsiticality of pain experiences. The standard set by Eden is sufficiently high that there is little point in holding the world to it. What goes for pain also goes for other bodily sensations, such as the experience of itches, hunger, and orgasms. One finds the same combination in these cases. Phenomenology seems to present an intrinsic property, but one that cannot be instantiated without a corresponding experience. The natural conclusion is that the perfect properties cannot be instantiated at all. One might suggest that this model applies in some other domains, for example, one might suggest that gustatory experiences present properties that cannot be instantiated except while being tasted, so to speak. If this were so, it could help to explain our reluctance to assess such experiences as veridical or falsitical. The phenomenology here is less clear than in the case of pain, and it is not obvious whether the claim of a necessary connection to experience is correct, but the analogy between the cases at least deserves attention. It may be that some other Edenic properties that we have considered are not just uninstantiated but uninstantiable. For example, one might hold that perfect time, involving the flow of time or a moving now, is incoherent, perhaps for McTaggartian reasons. Or if one is sufficiently deflationary about objects, one might hold that perfect objects cannot exist in any possible world. Nevertheless, the impossibility of satisfying these contents does not automatically stop them from acting as a regulative ideal. Here, the impossible might serve to regulate our experience of the actual. High-level properties One might try to extend this model beyond the representation of simple properties such as color and shape in experience to the representation of high-level properties such as that of being a duck or being happy. It is plausible that representing such properties can make a difference to the phenomenology of experience, Siegel 2006. It is not clear that the phenomenal content of this sort of experience is easily analyzed using the two-stage model. One difficulty is that the deployment of concepts often plays a key role in such experiences, 
where the content of the experience is inherited from that of an associated concept rather than being determined by the two-stage model. When we see something as a book or as a duck, for example, it is plausible that the associated phenomenal content is inherited from the content of our concept of a book or of a duck. In these cases, we do not seem to have any grip on distinct perfect and imperfect veridicality conditions. Still, there are a few cases where the two-stage model is at least tempting. For example, there is a phenomenology of moral experience, and it is arguable that moral properties such as being good or bad can be represented in perception. One might naturally suggest that for moral experiences to be perfectly veridical, relevant objects would have to have perfect moral properties, the sort that are objective, intrinsically motivating, and so on. But it is arguable that in our world, and perhaps in every possible world, no such properties are instantiated. If so, our moral experiences cannot be perfectly veridical. But there are various properties, including response-dependent properties, community-relative properties, and so on, that arguably match these properties well enough. If so, our moral experiences can be imperfectly veridical. There has been no perfect goodness since the fall from Eden, but we can at least be consoled by imperfect goodness in the world. 13 Conclusion On the view I have presented, the most fundamental content of perceptual experience is its Edenic content. Other aspects of content such as ordinary free gene and russell lian content can be seen as deriving from Edenic content with the aid of the matching relation and the contribution of the environment. To understand the role of perceptual experience in representing the world, one needs to understand all of these levels of content. But to understand the phenomenology of perceptual experience in its own right, understanding Edenic content is the key. We have seen that the Edenic approach yields a very useful tool in doing phenomenology. To characterize the phenomenology of an experience, it is often helpful to characterize the sort of world in which that experience would be perfectly veridical. To do this, one sketches relevant aspects of the character of Eden. Doing this does not eliminate the need for thorough phenomenological investigation, and it does not solve the many associated hard methodological problems, but it at least provides an analytic tool that gives us some purchase in characterizing the contents of consciousness. I am inclined to think that Edenic content may also give us an entry point for understanding the metaphysics of experience. I have said little in this chapter about how it is possible for experiences to have Edenic contents or about which of Edenic content or phenomenal character is the more fundamental. My suspicion is that neither is more fundamental than the other. It may be that perceptual experience is fundamentally equivalent to the presentation of an Edenic world. If so, then if we can understand how the presentation of an Edenic world is possible, we will understand perceptual phenomenology. 13. The Matrix as Metaphysics One Brains in Vats The Matrix presents a version of an old philosophical fable, the brain in a vat. A disembodied brain is floating in a vat inside a scientist's laboratory. The scientist has arranged for the brain to be stimulated with the same sort of inputs that a normal embodied brain receives. To do this, the brain is connected to a giant computer simulation of a world. The simulation determines which inputs the brain receives. When the brain produces outputs, these are fed back into the simulation. The internal state of the brain is just like that of a normal brain despite the fact that it lacks a body. From the brain's point of view, things seem very much as they seem to you and me. The brain is massively diluted, it seems. It has all sorts of false beliefs about the world. It believes that it has a body, but in fact it has no body. It believes that it is walking outside in the sunlight, but in fact it is inside a dark lab. It believes it is one place, when in fact it may be somewhere quite different. Perhaps it thinks it is in Tucson, when it is actually in Australia or even in outer space. Neo's situation at the beginning of the Matrix is something like this. He thinks that he lives in a city, he thinks that he has hair, he thinks it is 1999, and he thinks that it is sunny outside. In reality, he is floating in a pod in space, he has no hair, 
the year is around 2199, and the world has been darkened by war. There are a few small differences from the paradigmatic VAT scenario, Neo's brain is located in a body, and the computer simulation is controlled by machines rather than by a scientist. But the essential details are much the same. In effect, Neo is a brain in a VAT. Let's say that a matrix, lowercase m, is an artificially designed computer simulation of a world. So the matrix in the movie is one example of a matrix. Let's also say that someone is invaded, or is in a matrix, if he or she has a cognitive system that receives its inputs from and sends its outputs to a matrix. Then the brain at the beginning is invaded, and so is Neo. We can imagine that a matrix simulates the entire physics of a world, keeping track of every last particle throughout space and time. Later we will look at ways in which the setup might be varied. An invaded being will be associated with a particular simulated body. A connection is arranged so that whenever this body receives sensory inputs inside the simulation, the invaded cognitive system will receive sensory inputs of the same sort. When the enervated cognitive system produces motor outputs, corresponding outputs will be fed to the motor organs of the simulated body. When the possibility of a matrix is raised, a question immediately follows. How do I know that I am not in a matrix? After all, there could be a brain in a vat structured exactly like my brain, hooked up to a matrix, with experiences indistinguishable from those I am having now. From the inside, there is no way to tell for sure that I am not in the situation of the brain in a vat. So it seems that there is no way to know for sure that I am not in a matrix. Let us call the hypothesis that I am in a matrix and have always been in a matrix the matrix hypothesis. Equivalently, the matrix hypothesis says that I am invaded and have always been invaded. This is not quite equivalent to the hypothesis that I am in the matrix, as the matrix is just one specific version of a matrix. For now I ignore some complications that are specific to the matrix in the movie, such as the fact that people sometimes travel back and forth between the matrix and the external world. These issues aside, we can think of the matrix hypothesis informally as saying that I am in the same sort of situation as people who have always been in the matrix. The matrix hypothesis is one that we should take seriously. As Nick Bostrom, 2003, has suggested, it is not out of the question that, in the history of the universe, technology will evolve that will allow beings to create computer simulations of entire worlds. There may well be vast numbers of such computer simulations, compared to just one real world. If so, there may well be many more beings who are in a matrix than beings who are not. Given all this, one might even infer that it is more likely that we are in a matrix than that we are not. Whether this is right or not, it certainly seems that we cannot be certain that we are not in a matrix. Serious consequences seem to follow. My invaded counterpart seems to be massively deluded. It thinks it is in Tucson, it thinks it is sitting at a desk writing an article, it thinks it has a body. On the face of it, all of these beliefs are false. Likewise, it seems that if I am invaded, my own corresponding beliefs are false. If I am invaded, I am not really in Tucson, I am not really sitting at a desk, and I may not even have a body. So if I do not know that I am not invaded, then I do not know that I am in Tucson, I do not know that I am sitting at a desk, and I do not know that I have a body. The matrix hypothesis threatens to undercut almost everything I know. It seems to be a skeptical hypothesis, a hypothesis that I cannot rule out and one that would falsify most of my beliefs if it were true. Where there is a skeptical hypothesis, it looks like none of these beliefs count as genuine knowledge. Of course, the beliefs might be true I might be lucky and not be invaded but I cannot rule out the possibility that they are false. So a skeptical hypothesis leads to skepticism about these beliefs, I believe these things, but I do not know them. To sum up the reasoning, I do not know that I am not in a matrix. If I am in a matrix, I am probably not in Tucson. So if I do not know that I am not in a matrix, then I do not know that I am in Tucson. 
The same goes for almost everything else I think I know about the external world. 2. Envatment reconsidered. This is a standard way of thinking about the VAT scenario. It seems that this view is also endorsed by the people who created the Matrix. On the DVD case for the movie, one sees the following. Perception, our day in, day out world is real. Reality, that world is a hoax, an elaborate deception spun by all powerful machines that control us. Whoa. I think this view is not right. Even if I am in a matrix, my world is perfectly real. A brain in a vat is not massively diluted, at least if it has always been in the vat. Neo does not have massively false beliefs about the external world. Instead, invatted beings have largely correct beliefs about their world. If so, the matrix hypothesis is not a skeptical hypothesis, and its possibility does not undercut everything that I think I know. Philosophers have held this sort of view before. The 18th century philosopher George Berkeley held, in effect, that appearance is reality. Recall Morpheus, what is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. If this is right, then the world perceived by invaded beings is perfectly real, these beings experience all the right appearances, and appearance is reality. So on this view, even invaded beings have true beliefs about the world. I have recently found myself embracing a similar conclusion, though for quite different reasons. I do not find the view that appearance is reality plausible, so I do not endorse Berkeley's reasoning. Until recently it has seemed quite obvious to me that brains in vats would have massively false beliefs. But I now think there is a line of reasoning that shows that this is wrong. I still think I cannot rule out the hypothesis that I am in a matrix. But I think that even if I am in a matrix, I am still in Tucson, I am still sitting at my desk, and so on. So the hypothesis that I am in a matrix is not a skeptical hypothesis. The same goes for Neo. At the beginning of the film, if he thinks, I have hair, he is correct. If he thinks, it is sunny outside, he is correct. The same goes, of course, for the original brain in a vat. When it thinks, I have a body, it is correct. When it thinks, I am walking, it is correct. This view may seem counterintuitive at first. Initially, it seemed quite counterintuitive to me. So I will now present the line of reasoning that has convinced me that it is correct. 3. The Metaphysical Hypothesis I will argue that the hypothesis that I am invaded is not a skeptical hypothesis but a metaphysical hypothesis. That is, it is a hypothesis about the underlying nature of reality. Where physics is concerned with the microscopic processes that underlie macroscopic reality, metaphysics is concerned with the fundamental nature of reality. A metaphysical hypothesis might make a claim about the reality that underlies physics itself. Alternatively, it might say something about the nature of our minds or the creation of our world. My view is that the matrix hypothesis should be regarded as a metaphysical hypothesis with all three of these elements. It makes a claim about the reality underlying physics, about the nature of our minds, and about the creation of the world. In particular, I think the matrix hypothesis is equivalent to a version of the following three-part metaphysical hypothesis. First, physical processes are fundamentally computational. Second, our cognitive systems are separate from physical processes but interact with them. Third, Physical reality was created by beings outside physical space-time. Importantly, nothing about this metaphysical hypothesis is skeptical. The metaphysical hypothesis here tells us about the processes underlying our ordinary reality, but it does not entail that this reality does not exist. We still have bodies, and there are still chairs and tables, it is just that their fundamental nature is a bit different from what we may have thought. In this manner, the metaphysical hypothesis is analogous to a physical hypothesis, such as one involving quantum mechanics. Both the physical hypothesis and the metaphysical hypothesis tell us about the processes underlying chairs. 
they do not entail that there are no chairs. Rather, they tell us what chairs are really like. I will make the case by introducing each of the three parts of the metaphysical hypothesis separately. I will suggest that each of them is coherent and cannot be conclusively ruled out. I will also suggest that none of them is a skeptical hypothesis, even if they are true, most of our ordinary beliefs are still correct. The same goes for a combination of all three hypotheses. I will then argue that the matrix hypothesis is equivalent to this combination. 1. The computational hypothesis. The computational hypothesis says, microphysical processes throughout space-time are constituted by underlying computational processes. The computational hypothesis says that physics as we know it is not the fundamental level of reality. Just as chemical processes underlie biological processes, and microphysical processes underlie chemical processes, something underlies microphysical processes. Underneath the level of quarks, electrons, and photons is a further level, the level of bits. These bits are governed by a computational algorithm, which at a higher level produces the processes that we think of as fundamental particles, forces, and so on. The computational hypothesis is highly speculative, but some people take it seriously. Most famously, Edward Fredkin has postulated that the universe is at bottom some sort of computer. More recently, Stephen Wolfram, 2002, has taken up the idea in his book A New Kind of Science, suggesting that at the fundamental level, physical reality may be a sort of cellular automata with interacting bits governed by simple rules. Furthermore, some physicists have looked into the possibility that the laws of physics might be formulated computationally or seen as the consequence of certain computational principles. One might worry that pure bits could not be the fundamental level of reality, a bit is just a zero or a one, and reality cannot really be zeros and ones. Or perhaps a bit is just a pure difference between two basic states, and there cannot be a reality made up of pure differences. Rather, bits always have to be implemented by more basic states such as voltages in a normal computer. I do not know whether this objection is right. I do not think it is completely out of the question that there could be a universe of pure bits, but this does not matter for present purposes. We can suppose that the computational level is itself constituted by an even more fundamental level at which the computational processes are implemented. It does not matter what that more fundamental level is. All that matters is that microphysical processes are constituted by computational processes, which may themselves be constituted by more basic processes. From now on I will regard the computational hypothesis as saying this. I do not know whether the computational hypothesis is correct, but I do not know that it is false. The hypothesis is coherent, if speculative, and I cannot conclusively rule it out. The computational hypothesis is not a skeptical hypothesis. If it is true, there are still electrons and protons. On this picture, electrons and protons will be analogous to molecules, they are made up of something more basic, but they still exist. Similarly, if the computational hypothesis is true, there are still tables and chairs, and macroscopic reality still exists. It just turns out that their fundamental reality is a little different from what we thought. The situation here is analogous to quantum mechanics or relativity. These may lead us to revise a few metaphysical beliefs about the external world, that the world is made of classical particles or that there is absolute time. However, most of our ordinary beliefs are left intact. Likewise, accepting the computational hypothesis may lead us to revise a few metaphysical beliefs, that electrons and protons are fundamental, for example. But most of our ordinary beliefs are unaffected. 2. The creation hypothesis. The creation hypothesis says, physical space-time and its contents were created by beings outside physical space-time. This is a familiar hypothesis. A version of it is believed by many people in our society and perhaps by the majority of the people in the world. If one believes that God created the world, and if one believes that God is outside physical space-time, then one believes the creation hypothesis. One need not believe in God to believe the creation hypothesis, though. 
perhaps our world was created by a relatively ordinary being in the next universe up, using the latest world-making technology in that universe. If so, the creation hypothesis is true. I do not know whether the creation hypothesis is true, but I do not know for certain that it is false. The hypothesis is clearly coherent, and I cannot conclusively rule it out. The creation hypothesis is not a skeptical hypothesis. Even if it is true, most of my ordinary beliefs are still true. I still have hands, I am still in Tucson, and so on. Perhaps a few of my beliefs will turn out to be false, for example if I am an atheist, or if I believe all reality started with the Big Bang. But most of my everyday beliefs about the external world will remain intact. If we combine the creation hypothesis with the computational hypothesis, we obtain the hypothesis that the computational processes constituting our space-time were created by beings outside space-time. Here, one might already discern a certain kinship with the matrix hypothesis. 3. The mind-body hypothesis. The mind-body hypothesis says, my mind is, and has always been, constituted by processes outside physical space-time and receives its perceptual inputs from and sends its outputs to processes in physical space-time. The mind-body hypothesis is also quite familiar and quite widely believed. Descartes believed something like this, on his view, we have non-physical minds that interact with our physical bodies. The hypothesis is less widely believed today than in Descartes' time, but there are still many people who accept the mind-body hypothesis. Whether or not the mind-body hypothesis is true, it is certainly coherent. Even if contemporary science tends to suggest that the hypothesis is false, we cannot rule it out conclusively. The mind-body hypothesis is not a skeptical hypothesis. Even if my mind is outside physical space-time, I still have a body, I am still in Tucson, and so on. At most, accepting this hypothesis would make us revise a few metaphysical beliefs about our minds. Our ordinary beliefs about external reality will remain largely intact. 4. The Metaphysical Hypothesis We can now put these hypotheses together. First we can consider the combination hypothesis, which combines all three. It says that physical space-time and its contents were created by beings outside physical space-time, that microphysical processes are constituted by computational processes, and that our minds are outside physical space-time but interact with it. As with the hypotheses taken individually, the combination hypothesis is coherent, and we cannot conclusively rule it out. Also, like the hypotheses taken individually, it is not a skeptical hypothesis. Accepting it might lead us to revise a few of our beliefs, but it would leave most of them intact. Finally, we can consider the metaphysical hypothesis, with a capital M. Like the combination hypothesis, this combines the creation hypothesis, the computational hypothesis, and the mind-body hypothesis. It also adds the following more specific claim, the computational processes underlying physical space-time were designed by the creators as a computer simulation of a world. It may also be useful to think of the metaphysical hypothesis as saying that the computational processes constituting physical space-time are part of a broader domain and that the creators and my cognitive system are also located within this domain. This addition is not strictly necessary for what follows, but it matches up with the most common way of thinking about the matrix hypothesis. The metaphysical hypothesis is a slightly more specific version of the combination hypothesis in that it specifies some relations among the various parts of the hypothesis. Again, the metaphysical hypothesis is a coherent hypothesis, and we cannot conclusively rule it out. And again, it is not a skeptical hypothesis. Even if we accept it, most of our ordinary beliefs about the external world will be left intact. For the matrix hypothesis as a metaphysical hypothesis. Recall that the matrix hypothesis says that I have, and have always had, a cognitive system that receives its inputs from and sends its outputs to an artificially designed computer simulation of a world. I will argue that the matrix hypothesis is equivalent to the metaphysical hypothesis in the following sense, if I accept the metaphysical hypothesis, 
I should accept the matrix hypothesis, and if I accept the matrix hypothesis, I should accept the metaphysical hypothesis. That is, the two hypotheses imply each other, where this means that if I accept one, I should accept the other. Take the first direction first, from the metaphysical hypothesis to the matrix hypothesis. The mind-body hypothesis implies that I have, and have always had, an isolated cognitive system that receives its inputs from and sends its outputs to processes in physical space-time. In conjunction with the computational hypothesis, this implies that my cognitive system receives inputs from and sends outputs to the computational processes that constitute physical space-time. The creation hypothesis, along with the rest of the metaphysical hypothesis, implies that these processes were artificially designed to simulate a world. It follows that I have, and have always had, an isolated cognitive system that receives its inputs from and sends its outputs to an artificially designed computer simulation of a world. This is just the matrix hypothesis. So the metaphysical hypothesis implies the matrix hypothesis. The other direction is closely related. To put it informally, if I'll accept the matrix hypothesis, I accept that what underlies apparent reality is just as the metaphysical hypothesis specifies. There is a domain containing my cognitive system, which is causally interacting with a computer simulation of physical space-time, which was created by other beings in that domain. This is just what has to obtain in order for the metaphysical hypothesis to obtain. If one accepts this, one should accept the creation hypothesis, the computational hypothesis, the mind-body hypothesis, and the relevant relations among these. This may be a little clearer through a picture. Here is the shape of the world according to the matrix hypothesis. At the fundamental level, this picture of the shape of the world is exactly the same as the picture of the metaphysical hypothesis given earlier. So if one accepts that the world is as it is according to the matrix hypothesis, one should accept that it is as it is according to the metaphysical hypothesis. One might make various objections. For example, one might object that the matrix hypothesis implies that a computer simulation of physical processes exists, but, unlike the metaphysical hypothesis, it does not imply that the physical processes themselves exist. I discuss this objection in section 6 and other objections in section 7. For now, though, I take it that there is a strong case that the matrix hypothesis implies the metaphysical hypothesis and vice versa. 5. Life in the matrix. If this is right, it follows that the matrix hypothesis is not a skeptical hypothesis. If I accept it, I should not infer that the external world does not exist, that I have no body, that there are no tables and chairs, or that I am not in Tucson. Rather, I should infer that the physical world is constituted by computations beneath the microphysical level. There are still tables, chairs, and bodies. These are made up fundamentally of bits and of whatever constitutes these bits. This world was created by other beings but is still perfectly real. My mind is separate from physical processes and interacts with them. My mind may not have been created by these beings, and it may not be made up of bits, but it still interacts with these bits. The result is a complex picture of the fundamental nature of reality. The picture is strange and surprising, perhaps, but it is a picture of a full-blooded external world. If we are in a matrix, this is simply the way that the world is. We can think of the matrix hypothesis as a creation myth for the information age. If it is correct, then the physical world was created, although it was not necessarily created by gods. Underlying the physical world is a giant computation, and creators created this world by implementing this computation. Our minds lie outside this physical structure, with an independent nature that interacts with this structure. Many of the same issues that arise with standard creation myths arise here. When was the world created? Strictly speaking, it was not created within our time at all. When did history begin? The creators might have started the simulation in 4004 BC, or in 1999, with the fossil record intact, but it would have been much easier for them to start the simulation at the Big Bang and let things run their course from there. 
In the Matrix, of course, the creators are machines. This gives an interesting twist to common theological readings of the movie. It is often held that Neo is the Christ figure in the movie, with Morpheus corresponding to John the Baptist, Cypher to Judas Iscariot, and so on. But on the reading I have given, the gods of the Matrix are the machines. Who, then, is the Christ figure? Agent Smith, of course. After all, he is the God's offspring, sent down to save the Matrix world from those who wish to destroy it. And in the second movie, he is even resurrected. Many of the same issues that arise on the standard mind-body hypothesis also arise here. When do our non-physical minds start to exist? It depends on just when new invaded cognitive systems are attached to the simulation, perhaps at the time of conception within the matrix or perhaps at the time of birth. Is there life after death? It depends on just what happens to the invaded systems once their simulated bodies die. How do mind and body interact? By causal links that are outside physical space and time. Even if we are not in a matrix, we can extend a version of this reasoning to other beings who are in a matrix. If they discover their situation and come to accept that they are in a matrix, they should not reject their ordinary beliefs about the external world. At most, they should come to revise their beliefs about the underlying nature of their world. They should come to accept that external objects are made of bits and so on. These beings are not massively deluded, most of their ordinary beliefs about their world are correct. There are a few qualifications here. One may worry about beliefs about other people's minds. I believe that my friends are conscious. If I am in a matrix, is this correct? In the matrix depicted in the movie, these beliefs are mostly fine. This is a multivit matrix, for each of my perceived friends, there is an invaded being in the external reality who is presumably conscious like me. The exception might be beings such as Agent Smith, who are not invaded but are entirely computational. Whether these beings are conscious depends on whether computation is enough for consciousness. I remain neutral on that issue here. We could circumvent this issue by building into the matrix hypothesis the requirement that all of the beings we perceive are invaded. However, even if we do not build in this requirement, we are not much worse off than in the actual world, where there is a legitimate issue about whether other beings are conscious, quite independent of whether we are in a matrix. One might also worry about beliefs about the distant past and about the far future. These will be unthreatened as long as the computer simulation covers all of space-time from the Big Bang until the end of the universe. This is built into the metaphysical hypothesis, and we can stipulate that it is built into the matrix hypothesis, too, by requiring that the computer simulation be a simulation of an entire world. There may be other simulations that start in the recent past, perhaps the matrix in the movie is like this, and there may be others that last for only a short while. In these cases, the invaded beings will have false beliefs about the past or the future in their worlds. But as long as the simulation covers the lifespan of these beings, it is plausible that they will have mostly correct beliefs about the current state of their environment. There may be some respects in which the beings in a matrix are deceived. It may be that the creators of the matrix control and interfere with much of what happens in the simulated world. The matrix in the movie may be like this, though the extent of the creator's control is not quite clear. If so, then these beings may have much less control over what happens than they think. But the same goes if there is an interfering god in a non-matrix world. Moreover, the matrix hypothesis does not imply that the creators interfere with the world, though it leaves the possibility open. At worst, the matrix hypothesis is no more skeptical in this respect than is the creation hypothesis in a non-matrix world. The inhabitants of a matrix may also be deceived in that reality is much bigger than they think. They might think their physical universe is all there is, when in fact there is much more in the world, including beings and objects that they can never see. Again, however, this sort of worry can arise equally in a non-matrix world. For example, 
cosmologists seriously entertain the hypothesis that our universe may stem from a black hole in the next universe up and that in reality there may be a whole tree of universes. If so, the world is also much bigger than we think, and there may be beings and objects that we can never see. But either way, the world that we see is perfectly real. Importantly, none of these sources of skepticism about other minds, the past and the future, our control over the world, and the extent of the world casts doubt on our belief in the reality of the world that we perceive. None of them leads us to doubt the existence of external objects such as tables and chairs in the way that the VAT hypothesis is supposed to do. Furthermore, none of these worries is especially tied to the matrix scenario. One can raise doubts about whether other minds exist, whether the past and the future exist, and whether we have control over our world quite independently of whether we are in a matrix. If this is right, then the matrix hypothesis does not raise the distinctive skeptical issues that it is often taken to raise. I suggested before that it is not out of the question that we really are in a matrix. One might have thought that this would be a worrying conclusion. But if I am right, it is not nearly as worrying as one might have feared. Even if we are in such a matrix, our world is no less real than we thought it was. It just has a surprising fundamental nature. 6. Objection, Simulation is not reality. This slightly technical section can be skipped without too much loss. A common objection is that a simulation is not the same as reality. The matrix hypothesis implies only that a simulation of physical processes exists. By contrast, the metaphysical hypothesis implies that physical processes really exist, they are explicitly mentioned in the computational hypothesis and elsewhere. If so, then the matrix hypothesis cannot imply the metaphysical hypothesis. On this view, if I am in a matrix, then physical processes do not really exist. In response, my argument does not require the general assumption that simulation is the same as reality. The argument works quite differently. However, the objection helps us to flesh out the informal argument that the matrix hypothesis implies the metaphysical hypothesis. Because the computational hypothesis is coherent, it is clearly possible that a computational level underlies real physical processes, and it is possible that the computations here are implemented by further processes in turn. So there is some sort of computational system that could yield reality here. But here, the objector will hold that not all computational systems are created equal. To say that some computational systems will yield real physical processes in this role is not to say that they all do. Perhaps some of them are merely simulations. If so, then the matrix hypothesis may not yield reality. To rebut this objection, we can appeal to two principles. First, any abstract computation that could be used to simulate physical space-time is such that it could turn out to underlie real physical processes. Second, Given an abstract computation that could underlie physical processes, the precise way in which it is implemented is irrelevant to whether it does underlie physical processes. In particular, the fact that the implementation was designed as a simulation is irrelevant. The conclusion then follows directly. On the first principle, let us think of abstract computations in purely formal terms, abstracting away from their manner of implementation. For an abstract computation to qualify as a simulation of physical reality, it must have computational elements that correspond to every particle in reality, likewise for fields, waves, or whatever is fundamental, dynamically evolving in a way that corresponds to each particle's evolution. But then, it is guaranteed that the computation will have a rich enough causal structure that it could in principle underlie physics in our world. Any computation will do as long as it has enough detail to correspond to the fine details of physical processes. On the second principle, given an abstract computation that could underlie physical reality, it does not matter how the computation is implemented. We can imagine discovering that some computational level underlies the level of atoms and electrons. Once we have discovered this, it is possible that this computational level is implemented by more basic processes. There are many hypotheses about what the underlying processes could be, but none of them is especially privileged, 
and none of them would lead us to reject the hypothesis that the computational level constitutes physical processes. That is, the computational hypothesis is implementation independent. As long as we have the right sort of abstract computation, the manner of implementation does not matter. In particular, it is irrelevant whether or not these implementing processes were artificially created, and it is irrelevant whether they were intended as a simulation. What matters is the intrinsic nature of the processes, not their origin. And what matters about this intrinsic nature is simply that they are arranged in such a way as to implement the right sort of computation. If so, the fact that the implementation originated as a simulation is irrelevant to whether it can constitute physical reality. There is one further constraint on the implementing processes, they must be connected to our experiences in the right sort of way. That is, when we have an experience of an object, the processes underlying the simulation of that object must be causally connected in the right sort of way to our experiences. If this is not the case, then there will be no reason to think that these computational processes underlie the physical processes that we perceive. If there is an isolated computer simulation to which nobody is connected in this way, we should say that it is simply a simulation. However, an appropriate hookup to our perceptual experiences is built into the matrix hypothesis on the most natural understanding of that hypothesis, so the matrix hypothesis has no problems here. Overall, then, we have seen that computational processes could underlie physical reality, that any abstract computation that qualifies as a simulation of physical reality could play this role, and that any implementation of this computation could constitute physical reality as long as it is hooked up to our experiences in the relevant way. The matrix hypothesis guarantees that we have an abstract computation of the right sort, and it guarantees that it is hooked up to our experiences in the relevant ways. So the matrix hypothesis implies that the computational hypothesis is correct and that the computer simulation constitutes genuine physical processes. 7 Other Objections When we look at a brain in a vat from the outside, it is hard to avoid the sense that it is diluted. This sense manifests itself in a number of related objections. These are not direct objections to the main argument I have given, but they are objections to its conclusion. Objection 1 a brain in a vat may think it is outside walking in the sun, when in fact it is alone in a dark room. Surely it is diluted. Response, the brain is alone in a dark room. But this does not imply that the person is alone in a dark room. By analogy, just say Descartes is right that we have disembodied minds outside space-time and made of ectoplasm. When I think, I am outside in the sun, an angel might look at my ectoplasmic mind and note that in fact it is not exposed to any sun at all. Does it follow that my thought is incorrect? Presumably not, I can be outside in the sun even if my ectoplasmic mind is not. The angel would be wrong to infer that I have an incorrect belief. Likewise, we should not infer that the invaded being has an incorrect belief. At least, it is no more diluted than a Cartesian mind. The moral is that the immediate surroundings of our minds may well be irrelevant to the truth of most of our beliefs. What matters is the processes that our minds are connected to by perceptual inputs and motor outputs. Once we recognize this, the objection falls away. Objection 2, an invaded being may believe that it is in Tucson when in fact it is in New York and has never been anywhere near Tucson. Surely this belief is diluted. Response. The invaded being's word Tucson does not refer to what we call Tucson. Rather, it refers to something else entirely, call this Tucson asterisk or virtual Tucson. We might think of this as a virtual location, more on this in a moment. When the being says to itself, I am in Tucson, it really is thinking that it is in Tucson, and it may well be in Tucson. Because Tucson is not Tucson asterisk, the fact that the being has never been in Tucson is irrelevant to whether its belief is true. A rough analogy is this, I look at my colleague Terry and say to myself, that's Terry. Elsewhere in the world, a duplicate of me looks at a duplicate of Terry. He says to himself, that's Terry, but he is not looking at the real Terry. Is his belief false? It seems not, 
my duplicates word Terry refers not to Terry but to his duplicate, Terry Star. My duplicate really is looking at Terry Asterisk, so his belief is true. The same sort of thing is happening in the case above. Objection 3, before he leaves the Matrix, Neo believes that he has hair. But in reality he has no hair, the body in the vat is bald. Surely this belief is deluded. Response, this case is like the last one. Neo's word hair does not refer to real hair but to something else that we might call hair asterisk, virtual hair. So the fact that Neo does not have real hair is irrelevant to whether his belief is true. Neo really does have virtual hair, so he is correct. Likewise, when a child in the movie tells Neo, there is no spoon, his concept refers to a virtual spoon, and there really is a virtual spoon. So the child is wrong. Objection 4, what sort of objects does an invaded being refer to? What are virtual hair, virtual Tucson, and so on? Response, these are all entities constituted by computational processes. If I am invaded, then the objects to which I refer, hair, Tucson, and so on, are all made of bits. If I am not invaded but another being is invaded, the objects that it refers to, hair, Tucson, and so on, are likewise made of bits. If the invaded being is hooked up to a simulation in my computer, then the objects to which it refers are constituted by patterns of bits inside my computer. We might call these things virtual objects. Virtual hands are not hands, assuming I am not invaded, but they exist inside the computer all the same. Virtual Tucson is not Tucson, but it exists inside the computer all the same. Objection 5 you just said that virtual hands are not real hands. Does this mean that if we are in a matrix, we do not have real hands? Response, no. If we are not in a matrix, but other beings are, we should say that their term hand refers to virtual hands, but our term does not. So in this case, our hands are not virtual hands. However, if we are in a matrix, then our term hand refers to something that is made of bits, virtual hands, or at least something that would be regarded as virtual hands by people in the next world up. That is, if we are in a matrix, real hands are made of bits. Things look quite different, and our words refer to different things, depending on whether our perspective is from inside or outside the matrix. This sort of perspective shift is common in thinking about the matrix scenario. From the first person perspective, we suppose that we are in a matrix. Here, real things in our world are made of bits, though the next world up might not be made of bits. From the third person perspective we suppose that someone else is in a matrix but that we are not. Here, real things in our world are not made of bits, but the next world down is made of bits. On the first way of doing things, our words refer to computational entities. On the second way of doing things, the invaded being's words refer to computational entities, but our words do not. Objection 6, just which pattern of bits is a given virtual object? Surely it will be impossible to pick out a precise set. Response, this question is like asking the following, just which part of the quantum wave function is this chair, and which part is the University of Arizona? These objects are all ultimately constituted by an underlying quantum wave function, but there may be no precise part of the micro-level wave function that we can say is the chair or the university. The chair and the university exist at a higher level. Likewise, if we are invaded, there may be no precise set of bits in the micro-level computational process that is the chair or the university. These exist at a higher level. Furthermore, if someone else is invaded, there may be no precise sets of bits in the computer simulation that are the objects to which they refer. However, just as a chair exists without being any precise part of the wave function, a virtual chair may exist without being any precise set of bits. Objection 7, an invaded being thinks it performs actions, and it thinks it has friends. Are these beliefs correct? Response one might try to say that the being performs actions asterisk and that it has friends star. However, 
for various reasons I think it is not plausible that words like action and friend can shift their meanings as easily as words like Tucson and hair. Instead, one can say truthfully, in our own language, that the invaded being performs actions and that it has friends. To be sure, it performs actions in its environment, and its environment is not our environment but the virtual environment. Moreover, its friends likewise inhabit the virtual environment, assuming that we have a multivate matrix or that computation suffices for consciousness. But the invaded being is not incorrect in this respect. Objection 8, set these technical points aside. Surely, if we are in a matrix, the world is nothing like we think it is. Response, I deny this. Even if we are in a matrix, there are still people, football games, and particles, arranged in space-time just as we think they are. It is just that the world has a further nature that goes beyond our initial conception. In particular, things in the world are realized computationally in a way that we might not have originally imagined. Still, this does not contradict any of our ordinary beliefs. At most, it will contradict a few of our more abstract metaphysical beliefs. But exactly the same goes for quantum mechanics, relativity theory, and so on. If we are in a matrix, we may not have many false beliefs, but there is much knowledge that we lack. For example, we do not know that the universe is realized computationally. But this is just what one should expect. Even if we are not in a matrix, there may well be much about the fundamental nature of reality that we do not know. We are not omniscient creatures, and our knowledge of the world is at best partial. This is simply the condition of a creature living in a world. 8 Other Skeptical Hypotheses The matrix hypothesis is one example of a traditional skeptical hypothesis, but it is not the only example. Other skeptical hypotheses are not quite as straightforward as the matrix hypothesis. Still, for many of them, a similar line of reasoning applies. In particular, one can argue that most of these are not global skeptical hypotheses, that is, their truth would not undercut all of our empirical beliefs about the physical world. At worst, most of them are partial skeptical hypotheses that undercut some of our empirical beliefs but leave many other beliefs intact. New Matrix Hypothesis, I was recently created, along with all of my memories, and was put in a newly created matrix. What if both the matrix and I have existed for only a short time? This hypothesis is a computational version of Bertrand Russell's recent creation hypothesis, the physical world was created only recently, with fossil record intact, and so was I, with memories intact. On that hypothesis, the external world that I perceive really exists, and most of my beliefs about its current state are plausibly true, but I have many false beliefs about the past. The same should be said of the new matrix hypothesis. One can argue, along the lines presented earlier, that the new matrix hypothesis is equivalent to a combination of the metaphysical hypothesis with the recent creation hypothesis. This combination is not a global skeptical hypothesis, though it is a partial skeptical hypothesis, where beliefs about the past are concerned. The same goes for the new matrix hypothesis. Recent matrix hypothesis, for most of my life I have not been invaded, but I was recently hooked up to a matrix. If I was recently put in a matrix without realizing it, it seems that many of my beliefs about my current environment are false. Let us say that just yesterday someone put me into a simulation in which I fly to Las Vegas and gamble at a casino. Then I may believe that I am in Las Vegas now and that I am in a casino, but these beliefs are false. I am really in a laboratory in Tucson. This result is quite different from the long-term matrix. The difference lies in the fact that my conception of external reality is anchored to the reality in which I have lived most of my life. If I have been invaded all of my life, my conception is anchored to the computationally constituted reality. But if I were just invaded yesterday, my conception is anchored to the external reality. So when I think that I am in Las Vegas, I am thinking that I am in the external Las Vegas, and this thought is false. Still, 
this does not undercut all of my beliefs about the external world. I believe that I was born in Sydney, that there is water in the oceans, and so on, and all of these beliefs are correct. It is only my recently acquired beliefs, stemming from my perception of the simulated environment, that will be false. So this is only a partially skeptical hypothesis, its possibility casts doubt on a subset of our empirical beliefs, but it does not cast doubt on all of them. Interestingly, the recent matrix hypothesis and the new matrix hypothesis give opposite results despite their similar nature. The recent matrix hypothesis yields true beliefs about the past but false beliefs about the present, whereas the new matrix hypothesis yields false beliefs about the past and true beliefs about the present. The differences are tied to the fact that in the recent matrix hypothesis, I really have a past existence for my beliefs to be about, and that past reality has played a role in anchoring the contents of my thoughts, which has no parallel under the new matrix hypothesis. Local matrix hypothesis, I am hooked up to a computer simulation of a fixed local environment in a world. On one way of doing this, a computer simulates a small fixed environment in a world, and the subjects in the simulation encounter some sort of barrier when they try to leave that area. For example, in the movie The Thirteenth Floor, just California is simulated, and when the subject tries to drive to Nevada, a road sign says closed for repair, with faint green electronic mountains in the distance. Of course, this is not the best way to create a matrix, as subjects are likely to discover the limits to their world. This hypothesis is analogous to a local creation hypothesis, on which creators create just a local part of the physical world. Under this hypothesis, we will have true beliefs about nearby matters but false beliefs about matters farther from home. By the usual sort of reasoning, the local matrix hypothesis can be seen as a combination of the metaphysical hypothesis with the local creation hypothesis so we should say the same thing about it as about the local creation hypothesis. Extendable local matrix hypothesis, I am hooked up to a computer simulation of a local environment in a world, which is extended when necessary depending on my movements. This hypothesis avoids the obvious difficulties with a fixed local matrix. Here, the creators simulate a local environment and extend it when necessary. For example, they might right now be concentrating on simulating a room in my house in Tucson. If I walk into another room or fly to another city, they will simulate those. Of course, they need to make sure that when I go to these places, they match my memories and beliefs reasonably well, with allowance for evolution in the meantime. The same goes for when I encounter familiar people or people I have only heard about. Presumably, the simulators keep up a database of the information about the world that has been settled so far, updating this information whenever necessary as time goes along and making up new details when they need them. This sort of simulation is quite unlike simulation in an ordinary matrix. In a matrix, the whole world is simulated at once. There are high startup costs, but once the simulation is up and running, it will take care of itself. By contrast, the extendable local matrix involves just in time simulation. This has much lower startup costs, but it requires much more work and creativity as the simulation evolves. This hypothesis is analogous to an extendable local creation hypothesis about ordinary reality, under which creators create just a local physical environment and extend it when necessary. Here, external reality exists, and many local beliefs are true, but again beliefs about matters farther from home are false. If we combine that hypothesis with the metaphysical hypothesis, the result is the extendable local matrix hypothesis. So if we are in an extendable local matrix, external reality still exists, but there is not as much of it as we thought. Of course, if I travel in the right direction, more of it may come into existence. The situation is reminiscent of the film The Truman Show. Truman lives in an artificial environment made up of actors and props that behave appropriately when he is around but may be completely different when he is absent. Truman has many true beliefs about his current environment. There really are tables and chairs in front of him and so on. 
but he is deeply mistaken about things outside his current environment and farther from home. It is common to think that while the Truman Show poses a disturbing skeptical scenario, the Matrix is much worse. But if I am right, things are reversed. If I am in a Matrix, then most of my beliefs about the external world are true. If I am in something like the Truman Show, then a great number of my beliefs are false. On reflection, it seems to me that this is the right conclusion. If we were to discover that we were, and always had been, in a matrix, this would be surprising, but we would quickly get used to it. If we were to discover that we were, and always had been, in a televised Truman show, we might well go insane. Macroscopic matrix hypothesis, I am hooked up to a computer simulation of macroscopic physical processes without microphysical detail. One can imagine that, for ease of simulation, the makers of a matrix might not bother to simulate low-level physics. Instead, they might just represent macroscopic objects in the world and their properties, for example, that there is a table with such and such a shape, position, and color, with a book on top of it with certain properties, and so on. They will need to make some effort to make sure that these objects behave in physically reasonable ways, and they will have to make special provisions for handling microphysical measurements, but one can imagine that at least a reasonable simulation could be created this way. This hypothesis is analogous to a macroscopic world hypothesis, there are no microphysical processes, and instead macroscopic physical objects exist as fundamental objects in the world, with properties of shape, color, position, and so on. This is a coherent way that our world could be, and it is not a global skeptical hypothesis, though it may lead to false scientific beliefs about lower levels of reality. The macroscopic matrix hypothesis can be seen as a combination of this hypothesis with a version of the metaphysical hypothesis. As such, it is not a global skeptical hypothesis, either. One can also combine these various hypotheses in various ways, yielding hypotheses such as a new local macroscopic matrix hypothesis. For the usual reasons, all of these can be seen as analogs of corresponding hypotheses about the physical world. So all of them are compatible with the existence of physical reality, and none is a global skeptical hypothesis. God hypothesis, physical reality is represented in the mind of God, and our own thoughts and perceptions depend on God's mind. A hypothesis like this was put forward by Berkeley as a view about how our world might really be. Berkeley intended this as a sort of metaphysical hypothesis about the nature of reality. Most other philosophers have differed from Berkeley in regarding this as a sort of skeptical hypothesis. If I am right, Berkeley is closer to the truth. The God hypothesis can be seen as a version of the matrix hypothesis, on which the simulation of the world is implemented in the mind of God. If this is right, we should say that physical processes really exist. It is just that at the most fundamental level, they are constituted by processes in the mind of God. Evil genius hypothesis, I have a disembodied mind, and an evil genius is feeding me sensory inputs to give the appearance of an external world. This is René Descartes' classical skeptical hypothesis. What should we say about it? This depends on just how the evil genius works. If the evil genius simulates an entire world in his head in order to determine what inputs I should receive, then we have a version of the God hypothesis. Here we should say that physical reality exists and is constituted by processes within the mind of the evil genius. If the evil genius is simulating only a small part of the physical world, just enough to give me reasonably consistent inputs, then we have an analog of the local matrix hypothesis, in either its fixed or flexible versions. Here we should say that just a local part of external reality exists. If the evil genius is not bothering to simulate the microphysical level but just the macroscopic level, then we have an analog of the macroscopic matrix hypothesis. Here we should say that local external macroscopic objects exist, but our beliefs about their microphysical nature are incorrect. The evil genius hypothesis is often taken to be a global skeptical hypothesis, but if the foregoing reasoning is right, this is incorrect. Even if the evil genius hypothesis is correct, 
some of the external reality that we apparently perceive really exists, though we may have some false beliefs about it depending on details. It is just that this external reality has an underlying nature that is quite different from what we may have thought. Dream hypothesis, I am now and have always been dreaming. Descartes raised the question, how do you know that you are not currently dreaming? Morpheus raises a similar question. Have you ever had a dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? The hypothesis that I am currently dreaming is analogous to a version of the recent Matrix hypothesis. I cannot rule it out conclusively, and if it is correct, then many of my beliefs about my current environment are incorrect. But presumably I still have many true beliefs about the external world that are anchored in the past. What if I have always been dreaming? That is, what if all of my apparent perceptual inputs have been generated by my own cognitive system without my realizing this? This case is analogous to the evil genius hypothesis, it is just that the role of the evil genius is played by a part of my own cognitive system. If my dream generating system simulates all of space-time, we have something like the original matrix hypothesis. If it models just my local environment or just some macroscopic processes, we have analogs of the more local versions of the evil genius hypothesis. In any of these cases, we should say that the objects that I am currently perceiving really exist, although objects farther from home may not. It is just that some of them are constituted by my own cognitive processes. Chaos hypothesis, I do not receive inputs from anywhere in the world. Instead, I have random, uncaused experiences. Through a huge coincidence, they are exactly the sort of regular, structured experiences with which I am familiar. The chaos hypothesis is an extraordinarily unlikely hypothesis, much more unlikely than anything considered earlier. But it is still one that could in principle obtain, even if it has minuscule probability. If I am chaotically enervated, do physical processes in the external world exist? I think we should say that they do not. My experiences of external objects are caused by nothing, and the set of experiences associated with my conception of a given object will have no common source. Indeed, my experiences are not caused by any reality external to them at all. So this is a genuine skeptical hypothesis. If accepted, it would cause us to reject most of our beliefs about the external world. So far, the only clear case of a global skeptical hypothesis is the chaos hypothesis. Unlike the previous hypotheses, accepting this hypothesis would undercut all of our substantive beliefs about the external world. Where does the difference come from? Arguably, what is crucial is that on the chaos hypothesis, there is no causal explanation of our experiences at all, and there is no explanation for the regularities in our experience. In all of the previous cases, there is some explanation for these regularities, though perhaps not the explanation that we expect. One might suggest that as long as a hypothesis involves some reasonable explanation for the regularities in our experience, then it will not be a global skeptical hypothesis. If so, then if we are granted the assumption that there is some explanation for the regularities in our experience, then it is safe to say that some of our beliefs about the external world are correct. This is not much, but it is something. Afterward, Philosophical Notes This chapter was written to be accessible to a wide audience, so it deliberately omits technical philosophical details, connections to the literature, and so on. In this afterward I remedy this omission. Readers without a background in philosophy may choose to skip or skim this section. Note 1, Putnam's Anti-Skeptical Argument Hilary Putnam, 1981, has argued that the hypothesis that I am, and have always been, a brain in a vat can be ruled out a priori. In effect, this is because my word brain refers to objects in my perceived world, and it cannot refer to objects in an outer world in which the vat would have to exist. For my sentence I am a brain in a vat to be true, I would have to be a brain of the sort that exists in the perceived world, but that cannot be the case. So the sentence must be false. 
an analogy, I can arguably rule out the hypothesis that I am in the matrix, capital M. My term the matrix refers to a specific system that I have seen in a movie in my perceived world. I could not be in that very system, as the system exists within the world that I perceive, so my hypothesis I am in the matrix must be false. This conclusion about the matrix seems reasonable, but there is a natural response. Perhaps this argument rules out the hypothesis that I am in the matrix, but I cannot rule out the hypothesis that I am in a matrix, where a matrix is a generic term for a computer simulation of a world. The term matrix may be anchored to the specific system in the movie, but the generic term matrix is not. Likewise, it is arguable that I can rule out the hypothesis that I am a brain in a vat, if brain is anchored to a specific sort of biological system in my perceived world. But I cannot rule out the hypothesis that I am invaded, where this simply says that I have a cognitive system that receives input from and sends outputs to a computer simulation of a world. The term invaded, and the terms used in its definition, are generic terms, not anchored to specific systems in perceived reality. By using this slightly different language, we can restate the skeptical hypothesis in a way that is invulnerable to Putnam's reasoning. More technically, Putnam's argument may work for brain and matrix because one is a natural kind term and the other is a name. These terms are subject to twin earth thought experiments, Putnam 1975, where duplicates can use corresponding terms with different referents. On Earth, Oscar's term water refers to H2O, but on Twin Earth, which contains the superficially identical XYZ in its oceans and lakes, Twin Oscar's term water refers to XYZ. Likewise, perhaps my term brain refers to biological brains, while an invaded being's term brain refers to virtual brains. If so, when an invaded being says, I am a brain in a vat, it is not referring to its biological brain, and its claim is false. However, not all terms are subject to twin earth thought experiments. In particular, semantically neutral terms are not, at least when used without semantic deference. Such terms plausibly include philosopher, friend, and many others. Other such terms include matrix and invaded, as defined earlier. If we work with hypotheses such as I am in a matrix and I am invaded rather than I am in the matrix or I am a brain in a vat, then Putnam's argument does not apply. Even if a brain in a vat could not truly think, I am a brain in a vat, it could truly think, I am invaded. So I think that Putnam's line of reasoning is ultimately a red herring. No. 2. The causal theory of reference. Despite this disagreement, my main conclusion is closely related to another suggestion of Putnam's. This is the suggestion that a brain in a vat may have true beliefs because it will refer to chemical processes or processes inside a computer. However, I reach this conclusion by a quite different route. Putnam argues by an appeal to the causal theory of reference, thoughts refer to what they are causally connected to, and the thoughts of an invaded being are causally connected to processes in a computer. This argument is clearly inconclusive because the causal theory of reference is so unconstrained. To say that a causal connection is required for reference is not to say what sort of causal connection suffices. There are many cases, like phlogiston, where terms fail to refer despite rich causal connections. Intuitively, it is natural to think that the brain in a vat is a case like this, so an appeal to the causal theory of reference does not seem to help. The argument I have given presupposes nothing about the theory of reference. Instead, it proceeds directly by considering first-order hypotheses about the world, the connections among these, and what we should say if they are true. In answering objections, I have made some claims about reference, and these claims are broadly compatible with the causal theory of reference. But importantly, these claims are very much consequences of the first-order argument rather than presuppositions of it. In general, I think that claims in the theory of reference are beholden to first-order judgments about cases rather than vice versa. Note 3, Skeptical Hypotheses I use skeptical hypothesis in a certain technical sense. A skeptical hypothesis, relative to a belief that P, is a hypothesis such that, I, 
we cannot rule it out with certainty, and, too, were we to accept it, we would reject the belief that p. A skeptical hypothesis with respect to a class of beliefs is one that is a skeptical hypothesis with respect to most or all of the beliefs in that class. A global skeptical hypothesis is a skeptical hypothesis with respect to all of our empirical beliefs. The existence of a skeptical hypothesis, with respect to a belief, casts doubt on the relevant belief in the following sense. Because we cannot rule out the hypothesis with certainty and because the hypothesis implies the negation of these beliefs, it seems, given a plausible closure principle about certainty, that our knowledge of these beliefs is not certain. If it is also the case that we do not know that the skeptical hypothesis does not obtain, as I think is the case for most of the hypotheses in this chapter, then it follows from an analogous closure principle that the beliefs in the class do not constitute knowledge. Some use skeptical hypothesis in a broader sense to apply to any hypothesis such that if it obtains, I do not know that p. A hypothesis under which I have accidentally true beliefs is a skeptical hypothesis in this sense but not in the previous sense. I have not argued here that the matrix hypothesis is not a skeptical hypothesis in this sense. I have argued that if the hypothesis obtains, our beliefs are true, but I have not argued that if it obtains, our beliefs constitute knowledge. Nevertheless, I am inclined to think that if we have knowledge in an ordinary, non-matrix world, we would also have knowledge in a matrix. Note 4, Empirical Beliefs. What is the relevant class of beliefs? Of course, there are some beliefs that even a no external world skeptical hypothesis might not undercut, the belief that I exist, the belief that 2 plus 2 equals 4, or the belief that there are no unicorns. Because of this, it is best to restrict attention to beliefs that, I, are about the external world, 2, are not justifiable a priori, and, 3, make a positive claim about the world, they could not be true in an empty world. For the purposes of this chapter we can think of these beliefs as our empirical beliefs. Claims about skeptical hypotheses undercutting beliefs should generally be understood as restricted to beliefs in this class. Note 5, the computational level. Considering the computational hypothesis, it is coherent to suppose that there is a computational level underneath physics, but it is not clear whether it is coherent to suppose that this level is fundamental. This last supposition in effect describes a world of pure bits. Such a world would be a world of pure differences, there would be two basic states that differ from one another without this difference being a difference in some deeper nature. Whether one thinks this is coherent or not is connected to whether one thinks that all differences must be grounded in some basic intrinsic nature, whether one thinks that all dispositions must have a categorical basis, and so on. For the purposes of this chapter, however, the issue can be set aside. Under the matrix hypothesis, the computation itself is implemented by processes in the world of the creator. As such, there will be a more basic level of intrinsic properties that serves as the basis for the differences between bits. Note 6, Cartesian Dualism. On the mind-body hypothesis, it is interesting to note that the matrix hypothesis shows a concrete way in which Cartesian substance dualism might have turned out to be true. It is sometimes held that the idea of physical processes interacting with a non-physical mind is not just implausible but also incoherent. The matrix hypothesis suggests fairly straightforwardly that this is wrong. Under this hypothesis, our cognitive system involves processes quite distinct from the processes in the physical world, but there is a straightforward causal story about how they interact. Some questions arise. For example, if the invaded cognitive system is producing a body's motor outputs, what role does the simulated brain play? Perhaps one could do without it, but this will cause all sorts of awkward results, not least when doctors in the matrix open the skull. It is more natural to think that the invaded brain and the simulated brain will always be in isomorphic states, receiving the same inputs and producing the same outputs. If the two systems start in isomorphic states and always receive the same inputs, then, setting aside indeterminism, they will always stay in isomorphic states. As a bonus, this may explain why death in the matrix leads to death in the outer world. 
Which of these actually controls the body? This depends on how things are set up. Things might be set up so the invaded system's outputs are not fed back to the simulation, in this case a version of epiphenomenalism will be true. Things might be set up so that motor impulses in the simulated body depend on the invaded system's outputs with the simulated brain's outputs being ignored, in this case a version of interactionism will be true. Interestingly, this last might be a version of interactionism that is compatible with causal closure of the physical. A third possibility is that the mechanism takes both sets of outputs into account, perhaps averaging the two. This could yield a sort of redundancy in the causation. Perhaps the controllers of the matrix might even sometimes switch between the two. In any of these cases, as long as the two systems stay in isomorphic states, the behavioral results will be the same. One might worry that there will be two conscious minds here in a fashion reminiscent of Daniel Dennett's story Where Am I? This depends on whether computation in the matrix is enough to support a mind. If anti-computationalists about the mind, such as John Searle, are right, there will be just one mind. If computationalists about the mind are right, there may well be two synchronized minds, which then raises the question, if I am in a matrix, which of the two minds is mine? The one mind view is certainly closer to the ordinary conception of reality, but the two mind view is not out of the question. One bonus of the computationalist view is that it allows us to entertain the hypothesis that we are in a computer simulation without a separate cognitive system attached. Instead, the creators just run the simulation, including a simulation of brains, and minds emerge within it. This is presumably much easier for the creators since it removes any worries tied to the creation and upkeep of the attached cognitive systems. Because of this, it seems quite plausible that there will be many simulations of this sort in the future, whereas it is unclear that there will be many of the more cumbersome matrix-style simulations. Because of this, Bostrom's 2003 argument that we may well be in a simulation applies more directly to this sort of simulation than to matrix-style simulations. The hypothesis that we are in this sort of computer simulation corresponds to a slimmed-down version of the metaphysical hypothesis on which the mind-body hypothesis is unnecessary. As before, this is a non-skeptical hypothesis, if we are in such a simulation, and if computationalism about the mind is true, then most of our beliefs about the external world are still correct. There are also other possibilities. One intriguing possibility, discussed in Chalmers 1990, is suggested by contemporary work in artificial life, which involves relatively simple simulated environments and complex rules by which simulated creatures interact with these environments. Here the algorithms responsible for the creature's mental processes are quite distinct from those governing the physics of the environment. In this sort of simulation, creatures will presumably never find underpinnings for their cognitive processes in their perceived world. If these creatures become scientists, they will be Cartesian dualists, holding, correctly, that their cognitive processes lie outside their physical world. It seems that this is another coherent way that Cartesian dualism might have turned out to be true. Note 7, Implication and Entailment I have argued that the matrix hypothesis implies the metaphysical hypothesis and vice versa. Here, implies is an epistemic relation, if one accepts the first, one should accept the second. I do not claim that the matrix hypothesis entails the metaphysical hypothesis in the sense that in any counterfactual world in which the matrix hypothesis holds, the metaphysical hypothesis holds. That claim seems to be false. For example, there are counterfactual worlds in which physical space-time is created by nobody, so the metaphysical hypothesis is false, and in which I am hooked up to an artificially designed computer simulation located within physical space-time, so the matrix hypothesis is true. Furthermore, if physics is not computational in the actual world, then physics in this world is not computational, either. One might say that the two hypotheses are a priori equivalent but not necessarily equivalent. Of course, the term physics as used by my invaded self in the counterfactual world will refer to something that is both computational and created. But physics as used by my current, 
non-invaded self picks out the outer non-computational physics of that world, not the computational processes. The difference arises from two different ways of considering the matrix hypothesis, as a hypothesis about what might actually be the case or as a hypothesis about what might have been the case but is not. The first hypothesis is reflected in indicative conditionals, if I am actually in a matrix, then I have hands, atoms are made of bits, and the metaphysical hypothesis is true. The second version is reflected in subjunctive conditionals, if I had been in a matrix, I would not have had hands, atoms would not have been made of bits, and the metaphysical hypothesis would not have been true. This is analogous to the different ways of thinking about Putnam's twin earth scenario, common in discussions of two-dimensional semantics, see the appendix. If I am actually in the XYZ world, then XYZ is water, but if I had been in the XYZ world, XYZ would not have been water, water would still have been H2O. On the first way of doing things, we consider a twin earth world as actual. On the second way of doing things, we consider a twin earth world as counterfactual. We can say that the twin earth world verifies water is XYZ but that it satisfies water is not XYZ, where verification and satisfaction correspond to considering something as actual and as counterfactual. Likewise, we can say that a matrix world verifies the metaphysical hypothesis, but it does not satisfy the metaphysical hypothesis. The reason is that the metaphysical hypothesis makes claims about physics and the physical world. Moreover, what counts as physics differs depending on whether the matrix world is considered as actual or counterfactual. If I am in a matrix, physics is computational, but if I had been in a matrix, physics would not have been computational. The matrix would have been computational, but the computer and my brain would all have been made from computation-independent physics. In this way, claims about physics and physical processes in a matrix world are analogous to claims about water in the twin earth world. Note 8, Meaning and Reference the responses to the first few objections in section 7 are clearly congenial to a causal account of reference. There I say that the truth of an invaded being's thoughts depends not on its immediate environment but on what it is causally connected to, that is, on the computational processes to which it is hooked up. As noted earlier, I did not need to assume the causal theory of reference to get to this conclusion but instead got there through a first order argument. However, once the conclusion is reached, there are many interesting points of contact. For example, the idea that my term hair refers to hair while my invaded counterpart's term refers to virtual hair has a familiar structure. The case is structurally analogous to a twin earth case, in which Oscar, on earth, refers to water, H2O, while his counterpart twin Oscar, on twin earth, refers to twin water, XYZ. In both cases, the terms refer to what they are causally connected to. These natural kind terms function by picking out a certain kind in the subject's environment, and the precise nature of that kind depends on the nature of the environment. Something similar applies to names for specific entities such as Tucson. The behavior of these terms can be modeled using the two-dimensional semantic framework. As before, when we consider a twin earth world as actual, it verifies water is XYZ, and when we consider it as counterfactual, it satisfies water is not XYZ. Likewise, when we consider a matrix world as actual, it verifies hair is made of bits, and when we consider it as counterfactual, it satisfies hair is not made of bits. The difference between considering something as actual or as counterfactual yields a perspective shift like the one in the response to objection 5. If the matrix world is considered as merely counterfactual, we should say that the beings in the matrix do not have hair, they have only virtual hair. However, if the matrix world is considered as actual, that is, if we hypothetically accept that we are in a matrix, we should say that the beings in the matrix have hair and that hair is itself a sort of virtual hair. The twin earth analogy may suggest that a wholly externalist view on which the meanings of our terms such as hair and the contents of our corresponding thoughts depend on our environment. 
but the two-dimensional approach also suggests that there is an internal aspect of content that is shared between twins and does not depend on the environment. The primary intention of a sentence is true at a world if the world verifies the sentence, while its secondary intention is true at a world if the world satisfies the sentence. Then Oscar and twin Oscar's sentences water is wet have different secondary intentions, roughly, true when H2O is wet or when XYZ is wet, respectively, but they have the same primary intention, roughly, true at worlds where the watery looking stuff is wet. Likewise, utterances of I have hair by me and my invaded counterpart have different secondary intentions, roughly, true at worlds where we have biological hair or computational hair, respectively, but they have the same primary intention, roughly, true at worlds where we have hair-like stuff. The primary intentions of our thought and our language represent a significant shared dimension of content. Note 9, Semantically Neutral Terms Why the Different Response to Objection 7, On Action and Friend I noted earlier, Note 1, that not all terms function like water and hair. There are numerous semantically neutral terms that are not subject to twin earth thought experiments, any two twins using these terms in different environments will use them with the same meaning, at least if they are using the terms without semantic deference. These terms arguably include and, friend, philosopher, action, experience, and invaded. So while an invaded being's term hand or hair or Tucson may mean something different from our corresponding term, an invaded being's term friend or philosopher or action will arguably mean the same as ours. It follows that if we are concerned with an invaded being's belief I have friends or I perform actions, we cannot use the twin earth response. These beliefs will be true if and only if the invaded being has friends and performs actions. Fortunately, it seems quite reasonable to say that the invaded being does have friends, in its environment, not in ours, and that it does perform actions, in its environment, not in ours. The same goes for other semantically neutral terms, it is for precisely this class of expressions that this response is reasonable. Note 10, The Ontology of Virtual Objects What is the ontology of virtual objects? This is a hard question, but it is no harder than the question of the ontology of ordinary macroscopic objects in a quantum mechanical world. The response to Objection 6 suggests that in both cases we should reject claims of token identity between microscopic and macroscopic levels. Tables are not identical to any object characterized purely in terms of quantum mechanics, likewise, virtual tables are not identical to any objects characterized purely in terms of bits. Nevertheless, facts about tables supervene on quantum mechanical facts, and facts about virtual tables supervene on computational facts. So it seems reasonable to say that tables are constituted by quantum processes and that virtual tables are constituted by computational processes. Further specificity in either case depends on delicate questions of metaphysics. Reflecting on the third-person case, in which we are looking at a brain in a vat in our world, one might protest that virtual objects do not really exist, there are not real objects corresponding to tables anywhere inside a computer. If one says this, though, one may be forced by parity into the view that tables do not truly exist in our quantum mechanical world. If one adopts a restricted ontology of objects in one case, one should adopt it in the other, if one adopts a liberal ontology in one case, one should adopt it in the other. The only reasonable way to treat the cases differently is to adopt a sort of contextualism about what counts as an object, or about what falls within the domain of a quantifier such as everything, depending on the context of the speaker. However, this will just reflect a parochial fact about our language rather than any deep fact about the world. In the deep respects, virtual objects are no less real than ordinary objects. 1. Note 11 the intrinsic nature of matter. The response to Objection 8 is reminiscent of the familiar point, associated with Russell and Kant, that we do not know the intrinsic nature of entities in the external world, see the discussion of type F monism in Chapter 5. When it comes to physical entities, perception and science may tell us how these entities affect us and how they relate to each other, 
but these methods tell us little about what the fundamental physical entities are like in themselves. That is, these methods reveal the causal structure of the external world, but they leave its intrinsic nature open. The metaphysical hypothesis is in part a hypothesis about what underlies this microphysical causal structure, microphysical entities are made of bits. The same goes for the matrix hypothesis. One might say that if we are in a matrix, the Kantian ding and sitch, thing in itself, is part of a computer and sitch. This hypothesis supplements our ordinary conception of the external world, but it does not really contradict it, as this ordinary conception is silent on the world's intrinsic nature. 2. Note 12, The Robustness of the Manifest Image One general moral is that the manifest image is robust. Our ordinary conception of the macroscopic world is not easily falsified by discoveries in science and metaphysics. As long as the physical world contains processes with the right sort of causal and counterfactual structure, then it will be compatible with the manifest image. Even a computer simulation has the relevant causal and counterfactual structure, as does a process in the mind of God. This is why they can support a robust external reality despite their surprising nature. This sort of flexibility in our conception of the world is closely tied to the semantic non-neutrality of many of our concepts. Those concepts such as water, hair, and electron, leave some flexibility in what their referent might turn out to be. We conceive of their referents roughly as whatever actual entity plays a certain causal role or has a certain appearance, while leaving open their intrinsic nature. One can likewise argue that the strongest constraints imposed by our conception of the world are plausibly those associated with semantically neutral concepts, which do not yield this sort of flexibility. These concepts plausibly include many of our causal and gnomic concepts, as well as many of our mental concepts. In these cases, we have a sort of direct grasp of how the world must be in order to satisfy the concepts. If so, then our causal and mental beliefs impose strong constraints on the way the actual world must be. One can argue that our most fundamental semantically neutral concepts are mental concepts, experience, belief, causal concepts, cause, law, logical and mathematical concepts, and, two, and categorical concepts, object property. There are also many semantically neutral concepts that involve more than one of these elements, friend, action, and computer are examples. If this is right, then the fundamental constraints that our beliefs impose on the external world are that it contains relevant mental states, in ourselves and in others, and that it contains objects and properties that stand in relevant causal relations to each other and to the mental states. This sort of conception is weak enough that it can be satisfied by a matrix, at least if it is a multivate matrix or if computationalism about the mind is true. In my opinion, this issue about the fundamental constraints that our beliefs impose on the world is the deepest philosophical issue that arises from thinking about the matrix. If what I have said in this chapter is right, it is precisely because these constraints are relatively weak that many hypotheses that one might have thought of as skeptical turn out to be compatible with our beliefs. In addition, it is this that enables us to produce some sort of response to the skeptical challenge. A little paradoxically, one might say that it is because we demand so little that we know so much. 3. Note 13, Computation and Causal Structure Why does a computer simulation of a world satisfy these constraints? The reason is tied to the nature of computation and implementation. Any formal computation can be regarded as giving a specification of, abstract, causal structure, specifying the precise manner of interaction between some set of formal states. To implement such a formal computation, the implementation must have concrete states that map directly onto these formal states, where the pattern of, causal and counteractual, interaction between these states precisely mirrors the pattern of interaction between the formal states, see Chalmers 1994. So any two implementations of the computation will share a certain specific causal structure. A computational description of the physical world will be required to mirror its causal structure down to the level of fundamental objects and properties. So any implementation of this computation will embody this causal structure, 
in transitions between implementing states, whether these be voltages, circuits, or something quite different. So insofar as our conception of the external world imposes constraints on causal structure that a real physical world can satisfy, these constraints will also be satisfied by a computer simulation. This relates to a point made by Hubert Dreyfus and Stephen Dreyfus 2005. Like me, the Dreyfuses take the view that most of the beliefs of the inhabitants of a matrix will be true, not false. However, the Dreyfuses suggest that many of their causal beliefs will be false, for example, their general belief that a physical universe with causal powers makes things happen in our world, and perhaps their specific beliefs that germs cause disease, that the sun causes things to get warm, and so on. On my view, this suggestion is incorrect. On my view, the world of someone living in a matrix has real causation going on everywhere within it, grounded in the real causation going on in the computer. Virtual germs in the computer really do cause virtual disease in the computer, so when matrix inhabitants say, germs cause disease, what they say is true. Of course, the mental constraints also need to be satisfied. In particular, it is important that the causal structure stand in the right sort of relation to our experiences, but this constraint will also be satisfied when we are hooked up to a matrix. Constraints regarding other minds will be satisfied as long as we are in a multivate matrix or if computationalism about the mind is true. In this way, a matrix has everything that is required to satisfy the crucial causal and mental constraints on our conception of the world. Note 14, Spatial Constraints Perhaps the most important line of objection to the argument in this chapter argues that there are further constraints that our beliefs impose on the world that the matrix hypothesis does not satisfy. For one could argue that a mere match in mental and causal structure is not enough. Most obviously, one might argue that the world needs to have the right spatial properties, where we have some sort of direct grip on what spatial properties are, perhaps because spatial concepts are semantically neutral. In addition, one could suggest that the problem with the matrix is that its spatial properties are all wrong. We believe that external entities are arranged in a certain spatial pattern, but no such spatial pattern exists inside the computer. In response, one can argue that these further constraints do not exist. It can be argued that spatial concepts are not semantically neutral but instead are subject to twin earth thought experiments. Here, as in the previous chapter, one can invoke Brad Thompson's thought experiments, 2003, involving a doubled earth where one meter refers to, what we call, two meters, an El Greco world where square refers to, what we call, rectangles, and so on. On this view, our spatial concepts pick out whatever manifold of properties and relations in the external world is causally responsible for our corresponding manifold of spatial experiences. In this respect, spatial concepts are analogous to color concepts. Here we do not have any direct grip on the basic nature of spatial properties. 5. Instead, once again, the basic constraints are mental and causal. This line of objection is tacitly engaged in section 6 of this chapter, where I suggest that if there is a computational level underlying physics, then any implementation of the relevant formal computation could serve in principle as a realization of that level without compromising physical reality. Perhaps opponents might deny that there could be a computational level underlying physics or at least might hold that there are constraints on what sort of implementation can serve. For example, they might hold that the implementing level itself must have an appropriate spatial arrangement. This line of response runs counter to the spirit of contemporary physics, however. Physicists have seriously entertained the idea that space as we understand it is not fundamental and that there is an underlying level, not described in terms of ordinary spatial notions, from which space emerges. The cellular automaton hypothesis is just one such proposal. Here, what is crucial is simply a pattern of causal interaction. If physicists discover that this pattern is realized in turn by an entirely different sort of level with very different properties, they will not conclude that ordinary physical space does not exist. Rather, they will conclude that space is itself constituted by something non-spatial. 
This sort of discovery might be surprising and revisionary, but again it will be no more so than quantum mechanics. Furthermore, as with quantum mechanics, we would almost certainly not regard it as a skeptical hypothesis about the macroscopic external world. If this is right, then our conception of the macroscopic world does not impose essentially spatial constraints on the fundamental level of reality. Similar issues arise with respect to time. In one respect, time poses fewer problems than space, as the computer simulation in a matrix unfolds in time in the same temporal order as time in the simulated world. So one cannot object that the relevant temporal arrangements are not present in the matrix in the way that one could object that the relevant spatial arrangements are not present. So even if temporal concepts were semantically neutral, the matrix hypothesis could still vindicate our temporal beliefs. Still, one can make a case that our concept of external time is not semantically neutral, it is notable that physicists have entertained hypotheses on which temporal notions play no role at the fundamental level. Rather, it picks out the external manifold of properties and relations that is responsible for our corresponding manifold of temporal experiences. If so, then any computer simulation with the right causal structure and the right relation to our experience will vindicate our temporal beliefs regardless of its intrinsic temporal nature. Note 15, Wither Skepticism The reasoning in this chapter does not offer a knockdown refutation of skepticism, because several skeptical hypotheses are left open. Still, it significantly strengthens one of the standard responses to skepticism. It is often held that although various skeptical hypotheses are compatible with our experiences, the hypothesis that there is a real physical world provides a simpler or better explanation of the regularities in our experiences than these skeptical hypotheses. If so, then, by an inference to the best explanation, we may be justified in believing in the real physical world. At this point, it is often objected that some skeptical hypotheses seem just as simple as the standard explanation, for example, the hypothesis that all of our experiences are caused by a computer simulation or by God. If so, this response to skepticism fails. If I am right, however, these equally simple hypotheses are not skeptical hypotheses at all. If so, then inference to the best explanation may work after all, because all of these simple hypotheses yield mostly true beliefs about an external world. The residual issue concerns the various remaining skeptical hypotheses on the table, such as the recent matrix hypothesis, the local matrix hypothesis, and so on. It seems reasonable to hold that these hypotheses are significantly less simple than the earlier hypotheses, however. All of them involve a non-uniform explanation of the regularities in our experiences. In the recent matrix hypothesis, present regularities and past regularities have very different explanations. In the local matrix hypothesis, beliefs about matters close to home and about those far from home have very different explanations. These hypotheses as a whole have a sort of dual mechanism structure that seems considerably more complex than the earlier uniform mechanism structures. If this is right, one can argue that inference to the best explanation justifies us in ruling out these hypotheses and in accepting the earlier non-skeptical hypotheses. Even if one thinks that some of these skeptical hypotheses offer reasonably good explanations of our experience, there is still a promising argument against global external world skepticism in the vicinity. If I am right, all of these skeptical hypotheses are at worst partial skeptical hypotheses, if they are correct, then a good many of our empirical beliefs will still be true, and there will still be an external world. To obtain a global skeptical hypothesis, we have to go all the way to the chaos hypothesis, but this is a hypothesis on which the regularities in our experience have no explanation at all. Even an extremely weak version of inference to the best explanation justifies us in ruling out this sort of hypothesis. If so, then this sort of reasoning may justify our belief in the existence of the external world. 6. Part 6. The Unity of Consciousness. 14. What is the Unity of Consciousness? With Tim Bain. 1. Introduction. At any given time, 
a subject has a multiplicity of conscious experiences. A subject might simultaneously have visual experiences of a red book and a green tree, auditory experiences of birds singing, bodily sensations of a faint hunger and a sharp pain in the shoulder, the emotional experience of a certain melancholy, while having a stream of conscious thoughts about the nature of reality. These experiences are distinct from each other, a subject could experience the red book without the singing birds and the singing birds without the red book. But at the same time, the experiences seem to be tied together in a deep way. They seem to be unified, by being aspects of a single, encompassing state of consciousness. This is a rough characterization of the unity of consciousness. There is some intuitive appeal to the idea that consciousness is unified and to the idea that it must be unified. But as soon as the issue is raised, a number of questions immediately arise. 1. What is the unity of consciousness? What does it mean to say that different states of consciousness are unified with each other, or that they are part of a single, encompassing state? The idea of unity is multifaceted and has been understood in many different ways by different thinkers. In some senses of unity, the claim that consciousness is unified may be obvious or trivial. In other senses, the claim may be obviously false. So the first project in this area is to distinguish between varieties of unity and to isolate those varieties that pose the most important questions. 2. Is consciousness necessarily unified? Some thinkers, Descartes and Kant, for example, have argued that some sort of unity is a deep and essential feature of consciousness. On this view, the conscious states of a subject are necessarily unified, it is impossible for there to be a subject whose conscious states are disunified. On the other side, some thinkers, example Nagel 1971, have argued that the unity of consciousness can break down. On this view, there are cases, especially neuropsychological cases, such as those involving patients with split brains, in which a subject's states of consciousness are disunified. Some, example Dennett 1992, hold more strongly that consciousness is often or usually disunified and that much of the apparent unity of consciousness is an illusion. 3. How can the unity of consciousness be explained? If consciousness really is unified and especially if it is necessarily unified, then it is natural to look for an explanation of this fact. What is it about consciousness that yields this unity? Is unity a primitive feature of consciousness, or is it explained by something deeper? Further, the unity of consciousness may put strong constraints on a theory of consciousness. If consciousness is necessarily unified, then a correct theory of consciousness should at least be compatible with this unity, and we can hope that it will explain it. We can see these three questions as clustering around the status of what we can call the unity thesis, UT. Unity thesis, necessarily, any set of conscious states of a subject at a time is unified. The first question raises the issue of how the notion of unity in the unity thesis is to be understood, what is it for a set of conscious states to be unified? The second question raises the issue of whether the unity thesis is true. The third question raises the issue of how, if the unity thesis is true, its truth might be explained. In this chapter we address all three of these questions. Our central project is to isolate a notion of unity on which the unity thesis is both substantive and plausible. That is, we aim to find a more precise version of the unity thesis that is neither trivially true nor obviously false. With such a thesis in hand, we look at certain arguments that have been made against the unity of consciousness to determine whether they are good arguments against the unity thesis as we understand it. Finally, after fleshing out the unity thesis further, we apply the thesis to certain currently popular philosophical theories of consciousness, arguing that the thesis is incompatible with these theories, if the unity thesis is true, then these theories are false. We do not aim to conclusively prove the unity thesis in this chapter, and indeed we are not certain that it is true. But we suggest at least that the thesis is plausible, that it captures a strong intuition about the nature of consciousness, and that there are no knockdown arguments against it. If the thesis is true, it is likely to have important consequences for a theory of consciousness.
two varieties of unity. To start with, we need to distinguish different notions of unity. In particular, we will distinguish various ways in which different states of consciousness might be said to be unified. Objectual unity. We can say that two states of consciousness are objectually unified when they are directed at the same object. For example, when I look at a red book, I have an experience of redness and an experience of rectangularity. The color experience and the shape experience here are unified in a particularly strong way. They are present in my consciousness as directed at a single entity, the book. The same goes for my experience of a blue car moving down the street. Here I experience color, shape, and motion, all of which are unified by being directed at the same object. I might even have an auditory experience of the car's engine and also experience this as directed at the same object. So there can be objectual unity across different sensory domains. For two experiences to be objectually unified, their object need not actually exist. If I hallucinate a red book, then my experiences of redness and of rectangularity will be objectually unified despite the book's non-existence. On the other side of the coin, two experiences can be experiences of the same object without being objectually unified. I might see a car's shape and hear its noise without anything in my conscious state tying the noise to the car, perhaps I perceive the noise as behind me due to an odd environmental effect. If so, the experiences are not objectually unified. For objectual unity, what matters is that two states are experienced as being directed at a common object. The notion of objectual unity is closely tied to a central issue in cognitive psychology and neurophysiology. When I look at a red square, the color and the shape may be represented in different parts of my visual system, but somehow these separate pieces of information are brought together so that I experience a single red square, so that I can identify and report a red square and so on. This phenomenon is often referred to as binding, and the question of how it is achieved is often referred to as the binding problem. The binding problem is in large part the problem of how objectual unity is possible. As we will see, this divides into two problems in turn. Objectual unity is an important phenomenon, but it will not be central for our purposes. Where objectual unity is concerned, the corresponding unity thesis is almost certainly false. While some sets of experiences are objectually unified with each other, it seems that most sets are not. For example, my experience of the color of the book and of the shape of the car are not objectually unified, they are experienced as being directed at different objects. My experiences of a bird singing and of a sharp pain do not seem to be directed at the same object at all. If so, then objectual unity cannot unify all of a subject's conscious states. For such a notion of unity, we must look elsewhere. Spatial unity. A related notion of unity is that of spatial unity. We can say that two conscious states are spatially unified when they represent objects as being part of the same space. For example, my experiences of a book and of a car are not directed at a common object, but they represent both objects as part of the same visual space. More generally, all of my visual experiences seem to be spatially unified in this way, every visual experience represents something spatially, and everything that is represented is represented as part of a common space. Auditory experiences usually represent objects as part of the same space, such auditory experiences are spatially unified with visual experiences. The notion of being represented as part of the same space can be fleshed out in various ways, but the crucial idea will be something like the following. A set of experiences is spatially unified if, I, each experience has spatial representational content and, 2, the representational content of each is comparable in the sense that the objects represented are represented as being in spatial relations to each other. So visual experience might represent a car as being near a tree, behind a truck, or to the left of a building. Auditory experience might represent exhaust noise as coming from the same area as the car, or it might represent a siren as being much farther away. This sort of comparability is endemic to much perceptual experience, and makes for a deep spatial unity in perception. Like objectual unity, however, 
spatial unity does not yield a plausible version of the unity thesis. Some experiences seem to have no spatial representational content at all. An emotional experience such as that of melancholy does not obviously represent anything as located within space. A conscious thought about philosophy might have no spatial content at all. If so, these conscious states are not spatially unified with other conscious states. As before, to find a notion of unity that unifies all of a subject's conscious states, we must look elsewhere. Subject Unity Let us say that two conscious states are subject unified when they are had by the same subject at the same time. So all of my current experiences my perceptual experiences, my bodily sensations, my emotional experiences and conscious thoughts are subject unified simply because they are all my experiences. If we construe the unity thesis as involving subject unity, the thesis is certainly plausible. If a set of conscious states is had by a subject at a time, then the states will be subject unified by definition. The trouble with this version of the unity thesis is that it is trivial. It is true by definition and tells us nothing substantive about consciousness. As such, it cannot capture the intuition that there is some non-trivial way in which consciousness is unified. So subject unity will not be our central focus here. Still, the notion of subject unity is at least useful in articulating the unity thesis. As it was characterized earlier, the unity thesis holds that if a set of experiences of a subject at a time is subject unified, then that set is unified. So in effect, the unity thesis states that subject unity entails unity. Now we simply need to find a notion of unity for which this entailment is both plausible and non-trivial. Subsumptive Unity We started the chapter by invoking the intuition that there is some substantial sense in which all of a subject's experiences including at least perceptual, bodily, emotional, and cognitive experiences are unified. This sense is not object or spatial unity since these notions do not apply to all of the relevant experiences. And this sense is not subject unity since the resulting unity holds trivially. Rather, it involves the idea that these experiences are somehow subsumed within a single state of consciousness. We can say that two conscious states are subsumptively unified when they are both subsumed by a single state of consciousness. The notion of one state being subsumed by another should be taken as intuitive for now, we will spell it out shortly. To take an example, it seems plausible that all of my visual experiences are subsumed by a single encompassing state of consciousness corresponding to my visual field. More generally, my visual and auditory experiences might all be subsumed by a single encompassing state of perceptual consciousness. And it does not seem unreasonable to suppose that there is a single encompassing state of consciousness that subsumes all of my experiences, perceptual, bodily, emotional, cognitive, and any others. We can think of this last encompassing state of consciousness for a given subject as the subject's total conscious state. When it exists, a subject's total conscious state might be thought of as the subject's conscious field. It can be thought of as involving at least a conjunction of each of many more specific conscious states, states of perceptual experience, bodily experience, emotional experience, and so on. However, what is important, on the unity thesis, is that this total state is not just a conjunction of conscious states but also a conscious state in its own right. If such a total conscious state exists, it can serve as the singularity behind the multiplicity the single state of consciousness in which all of a subject's states of consciousness are subsumed. 1. It is worth pointing out certain sorts of unity with which subsumptive unity should not be confused. We are not talking about gestalt unity, where the conscious experiences of two different objects are deeply related in a way that transforms each of the experiences and produces a gestalt experience with a novel content. We are also not talking about normative unity, which requires some special coherence or consistency among multiple contents of consciousness. As we have characterized subsumptive unity, two conscious states might be subsumptively unified whether or not their contents stand in a special gestalt relation to each other and whether or not they are especially consistent or coherent with one another. We are also not dealing with neurophysiological unity, 
which requires that conscious states involve a single area or mechanism in the brain. Finally, we are not dealing with diachronic unity, or the unity of consciousness across time. It might turn out that one or more of these notions is deeply related to the issues at hand, but none of them is our primary object of discussion. To spell out the notion of subsumptive unity, we need to go into more detail about just what consciousness involves and just what is involved in the idea of one conscious state being subsumed by another. This requires making some further distinctions. 3. Access Unity and Phenomenal Unity What is it for a mental state to be a conscious state? There is no single answer to this question. As many have pointed out, the notion of consciousness is ambiguous and is understood in different ways by different people, so to make progress we have to draw distinctions. For our purposes, the most useful distinction is Ned Bloch's distinction between access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness, Bloch 1995. A mental state is access conscious when a subject has a certain sort of access to the content of the state. More precisely, a state is access conscious if, by virtue of having the state, the content of the state is available for verbal report, for rational inference, and for the deliberate control of behavior. When I look at a red book, I can report the presence of the book, there's a red book, I can reason about it, example concluding that I must have put it there when reading yesterday, and I can use its presence in deliberately directing my behavior, example picking up the book and putting it back on the shelf. So my perception of the red book gives me the relevant sort of access to information about the red book. My perceptual state here is access conscious one can also say that in such a case, the subject is access conscious of the relevant object. So here, I am access conscious of the red book. In a similar way, many of my perceptual states are access conscious, and so are many of my emotional and cognitive states. Not all mental states are access conscious, however. In some cases, such as those involving subliminal perception, blind sight, or unconscious belief, a mental state represents information without that information being reportable or usable in reasoning and in rational control of behavior. The exact definition of access consciousness is somewhat flexible and can be varied for different purposes. The most important point is that a state's being access conscious is defined in terms of the causal role that the state plays within the cognitive system and in particular in terms of the role that the state plays in making information available to other parts of the system. A mental state is phenomenally conscious when there is something it is like to be in that state. When a state is phenomenally conscious, being in that state involves some sort of subjective experience. There is something it is like for me to see the red book I have a visual experience of the book so my perception of the book is phenomenally conscious. There is something it is like to hear the bird singing and to feel the pain in my shoulder, so these states are phenomenally conscious. There is something it is like to feel melancholy, and there is arguably something it is like when I think about philosophy. If so, then these states are phenomenally conscious. Phenomenal consciousness is often taken to be the most important sort of consciousness and to be the sort of consciousness that poses the most difficulty for scientific explanation. There is a close empirical connection between phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness. It is arguable that the two almost always go together empirically, when a state is phenomenally conscious, it is access conscious, and vice versa. That is, when there is something it is like to be in a state, a subject can usually report the contents of the state and use it to directly guide reasoning and behavior. And when a subject can report the contents of a state and use it to directly guide reasoning and behavior, there is usually something it is like to be in that state. So when I am phenomenally conscious of the red book, I am access conscious of it, and vice versa. Despite this empirical connection, there is plausibly a conceptual distinction between access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness. Access consciousness is defined in terms of the causal role that a state plays, whereas phenomenal consciousness is defined in terms of the way the state feels. It is arguable that we can at least imagine states that are access conscious without corresponding states of phenomenal consciousness, the philosopher's zombie, which is functionally like a normal human being but without any conscious experience, is one such imaginary case. 
and it seems that we can know about another being's states of access consciousness without knowing about their states of phenomenal consciousness, one might know what information is available for report and for behavioral control in a cognitive system without being in a position to know what it is like to be that system. When there is something it is like to have a mental state, we can say that the mental state has a phenomenology, or a phenomenal character. Slightly more formally, we can say that such mental states have phenomenal properties, or qualia, which characterize what it is like to be in them. We can also say that subjects have phenomenal properties, characterizing aspects of what it is like to be a subject at a given time. We can then say that a phenomenal state is an instantiation of such a property. For example, the state of experiencing a certain sort of reddish quality is a phenomenal state. When a subject is in a phenomenally conscious mental state, the subject will thereby be in a phenomenal state that reflects the phenomenology of being in the mental state. For example, if there is something it is like for a given subject to believe that Paris is in France, the subject will be in a corresponding phenomenal state. But the phenomenally conscious mental state, the state of believing that Paris is in France, and the phenomenal state may be distinct states, in that it may be possible to believe that Paris is in France while having a different phenomenology or no phenomenology at all. If so, the belief state is a phenomenally conscious mental state, but it is not a phenomenal state. There is a special class of phenomenally conscious mental states such that the mental state and the corresponding phenomenal states are identical, phenomenal states themselves. Phenomenal states are at the core of phenomenal consciousness. We can use the distinction between access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness to make a distinction between two corresponding notions of unity, access unity and phenomenal unity. Broadly speaking, two conscious states are access unified when they are jointly accessible, that is, when the subject has access to the contents of both states at once. Two conscious states are phenomenally unified when they are jointly experienced, when there is something it is like to be in both states at once. We can construct more precise versions of phenomenal and access unity by combining these distinctions with the distinctions outlined earlier between objectual unity, spatial unity, and field unity. These distinctions cross-classify each other, so that one can isolate notions of objectual phenomenal unity, objectual access unity, spatial access unity, subsumptive phenomenal unity, and so on. The distinction between phenomenal and access unity applies less clearly to the notion of subject unity, so we set that notion aside here. We can say that two conscious states are objectually access unified when their contents involve attributing properties to a single object of representation and these contents are jointly accessible within the system. The contents will be jointly accessible when their conjunction is available for report, reasoning, and the rational control of behavior. When I am conscious of a red square, I can report the presence of red and the presence of a square, but I can also report the presence of a red square. Similarly, the presence of a red square can be used in guiding my reasoning and my behavior. So my perception of red and my perception of a square are not just individually access conscious, they are also access unified. We can say that two conscious states are objectually phenomenally unified when they are experienced as representing a single object. When I am conscious of a red square, I experience the presence of red and I experience the presence of a square, but I also experience the presence of a red square. There is a distinctive sort of unity involved in what it is like to experience the redness and the squareness simultaneously here. The two states are unified by being experienced as aspects of a single object. Objectual access unity and objectual phenomenal unity correspond to two distinct aspects of the binding problem. It has often been pointed out that there are actually two binding problems, see example Revenchuo 1999. The first is that of how a system such as the brain manages to bring together two separately represented pieces of information, example representations of color and shape in different areas of the visual cortex, so that these can play a joint role in the control of behavior, example so that we can report the presence of a red square and a blue circle rather than a red circle and a blue square. This is a sort of engineering problem concerning the design of the cognitive system, one can think of it as the neurophysiological or cognitive binding problem. 
This binding problem is the problem of explaining objectual access unity. The second binding problem is that of explaining how it is that we perceptually experience separate pieces of information as bound together in pertaining to the same object. This is the problem of explaining objectual phenomenal unity. On the face of it, these two problems are distinct. One could solve the neurophysiological binding problem, giving an explanation of how two pieces of information are brought together in the brain to be jointly accessible while still having no explanation of why the jointly accessible information should be experienced. So objectual phenomenal unity and objectual access unity are at least conceptually distinct. One can make a similar distinction between spatial phenomenal unity and spatial access unity. We can say that two conscious states are spatially access unified when they have spatial representational contents that can be jointly accessed by the cognitive system, so that they can be spatially compared and the results of the comparison can be made available for report, reasoning, and behavioral control. For example, when I see a car and a tree, I do not just have access to their spatial locations individually, I also have access to the spatial locations jointly, in that I can report that the car is to the left of the tree. So these two perceptual states are spatially access unified. Two conscious states are spatially phenomenally unified when they involve experiencing entities as part of the same space as part of the same phenomenal space, one might say. I experience the car as being in the same space as the tree and to the left of it, so these two states are spatially phenomenally unified. The most important distinction is that between subsumptive phenomenal unity and subsumptive access unity. These notions apply to two arbitrary conscious states as long as they are phenomenally conscious in the first instance and access conscious in the second. Because these are the most important versions of unity, we henceforth usually speak simply of phenomenal unity and access unity, where it is understood that we are referring to subsumptive phenomenal unity and subsumptive access unity, respectively. Two conscious states are subsumptively access unified, or simply access unified, if the conjunction of their contents is available for verbal report, reasoning, and the deliberate control of behavior. So if mental state A has content P and mental state B has content Q, these states will be individually access conscious if the information that P is available for report and control and the information that Q is available for report and control. They will be jointly access conscious or they will be access unified, if the information that P and Q is available for report and control. More briefly, two states A and B are access unified if and only if the subject is access conscious of the conjunction of their contents. In this case, there is an access conscious mental state with the conjunctive content. This conjunctive mental state can be seen as subsuming the original states A and B. For example, when I see a book and feel a pain, I can report the presence of the book and the pain individually, but I can do more than that, I can report them jointly. I can also reason about the book and the pain jointly and use information about both to jointly control my behavior, example looking in the book for a remedy for the pain or ceasing to read the book to help alleviate the pain. Because of the accessibility of this conjunctive content, the two states are, subsumptively, access unified. Similarly, I can often jointly report or reason about an emotion and a sound, if so, the emotional state and the auditory state are access unified. It is worth noting that for a state to be access conscious, it is not required that the content of the state is actually accessed in the sense that it is directly used for report or control. What matters is that it is accessible in a certain direct sense, that it be poised for use, as Bloch puts it. The same goes for access unity. For two states to be access unified, they need not be jointly accessed at any given moment. What matters is that they are jointly accessible in that it would be possible for a subject to jointly report them and to use them jointly in reasoning and behavior control. Typically, our conscious states are not jointly accessed, but they are much more often jointly accessible. It is joint accessibility that matters for our notion of unity. We can use the notion of access unity to put forward a version of the unity thesis. Access unity thesis, necessarily, any set of access conscious states of a subject at a time is access unified. 
This thesis appeals to the notion of a set of states being access unified. This is a natural generalization of the notion of two states being access unified. We can say that a set of states is access unified if the contents of all of the states are jointly accessible. It might be objected that in requiring that any set of a subject's access conscious states be access unified, the thesis is highly implausible. A subject might have a large, possibly infinite, number of access conscious states, and the conjunction of the contents of these states might be so complex that it is implausible that a subject could have access to this conjunction. The full conjunction would not be reportable or directly available to guide reasoning and behavior. To get around this, we could put forward a slightly weakened version of the thesis. Pairwise access unity thesis, necessarily, any two access conscious states of a subject at a time are access unified. One might argue that the pairwise version is too weak to count as a full unity thesis, which requires unity of all states at a time, or that it suffers from the same problems as the full unity thesis, since it entails that conjunctions of conjunctions will be access conscious and so on. However, none of this matters here since as we argue in the next section, even a weak version of the access unity thesis, limited to pairwise unity of relatively simple access conscious states, is straightforwardly false. We can say that two conscious states are subsumptively phenomenally unified, or simply phenomenally unified, if there is something it is like for a subject to be in both states simultaneously. That is, two states are phenomenally unified when they have a CONJ ointment phenomenology, a phenomenology of having both states at once that subs ms the phenomenology of the individual states. When A and B are phenomenally conscious states, there is something it is like for a subject to have A, and there is something it is like for a subject to have B. When A and B are phenomenally unified, there is not just something it is like to have each state individually, there is something it is like to have A and B together. Here the phenomenology of being in A and B together will carry with it the phenomenology of being in A and the phenomenology of being in B. For example, when I look at a book while feeling a pain, there is something it is like to see the book, yielding a phenomenal state A, and there is something it is like to feel the pain, yielding a phenomenal state B, but there is more than this, there is something it is like to see the book while feeling the pain. Here there is a sort of CONJ ointment phenomenology that carries with it the phenomenology of seeing the book and the phenomenology of feeling the pain. As in the discussion of field unity, we can think of the CONJ ointment state here as involving at least the conjunction A and B of the original phenomenal states A and B. But importantly, the CONJ ointment state is itself a phenomenal state, a single complex state of consciousness that subs ms the individual states of consciousness A and B. It is this encompassing state of consciousness that unifies A and B. More generally, a set of conscious states is phenomenally unified if there is something it is like for a subject to have all the members of the set at once and if this phenomenology subs ms that of the individual states. As a special case, we can say that the set consisting of all of a subject's conscious states at a given time is phenomenally unified if there is something it is like for the subject to have all of these states at once, where this phenomenology subs ms the phenomenology of the individual states. If so, then the subject has a total phenomenal state that encompasses all of the subject's phenomenal states. One can think of a total phenomenal state as capturing what it is like to be a subject at a time. If a subject has a total phenomenal state, there is a clear sense in which all of a subject's phenomenal states are unified within it. We can put forward a phenomenal version of the unity thesis as follows. Phenomenal unity thesis, necessarily, any set of phenomenal states of a subject at a time is phenomenally unified. This is not quite the same as the thesis that any set of phenomenally conscious mental states of a subject at a time is phenomenally unified, but the two theses are clearly equivalent. The first version, regarding phenomenally conscious mental states, entails the second version, regarding phenomenal states, as a special case. In reverse, the second version entails that for any set of phenomenally conscious mental states, their associated phenomenal states will be phenomenally unified. 
so there will be a phenomenal state that subs ums each of the original phenomenal states. So there will be something it is like to be in all the original mental states simultaneously that subs ums what it is like to be in them individually. It follows that the original mental states will be phenomenally unified. One can also put forward slightly weaker versions of the phenomenal unity thesis. Pairwise phenomenal unity thesis, necessarily, any two phenomenal states of a subject at a time are phenomenally unified. Total phenomenal unity thesis, necessarily, the set of all phenomenal states of a subject at a time is phenomenally unified. The original phenomenal unity thesis clearly entails the pairwise unity thesis and the total unity thesis. The pairwise thesis does not obviously entail the first version. It is plausible that subsumption is transitive, so that, necessarily, if a subs um s b and b subs um s c, then a subs um s c. If so, the pairwise unity thesis will entail the phenomenal unity thesis for any finite set of phenomenal states, as any pair of these will be subsumed by a single phenomenal state, and any pair of those in turn will be subsumed by a single phenomenal state, and so on. But the pairwise thesis does not obviously entail the original thesis where infinite sets of phenomenal states are concerned. The total unity thesis entails the original phenomenal unity thesis, however. If there is a state that subs ums each phenomenal state of the subject, that state will also subsume each member of an arbitrary set of phenomenal states of the subject, so that set will be phenomenally unified. So the total unity thesis and the original phenomenal unity thesis are equivalent. 2. The total unity thesis arguably captures the central intuition behind the unity of consciousness. This thesis suggests that there is always a single phenomenal state that subs ums all of the phenomenal states of a subject at a time. That is, it suggests that any conscious subject at any time has a total phenomenal state. If a subject has a total phenomenal state, subsuming every specific phenomenal state of the subject, then the subject's consciousness will be unified in a deep way. It might be objected that when a subject experiences a number of phenomenal states at once, the original phenomenal states will be transformed. For example, it might be phenomenally different to see a red book in the context of a moving car than to see a red book on its own, and the phenomenal state that was present when one saw the book on its own might not be present at all. This may be so, but it is no objection to the unity thesis. The unity thesis says that the phenomenal states had by a subject at a time are subsumed by a complex phenomenal state. So the experience of a red book and a moving car at a given time should subsume the experience of the red book at that time and the experience of the moving car at that time. It is not required that the complex experience should subsume the experience of a red book as the subject might have it at a different time and in a different context. If the experience of the book is itself transformed by the context of the car, then it is the transformed experience that will be subsumed by the complex state. It might also be objected that these unity theses are trivial. If a subject has a set of phenomenal states, there will automatically be a phenomenal state that subs ums them, the conjunction of the original states. But this is not a trivial claim. It is trivial that if a subject is in a number of phenomenal states, the subject will be in the conjunction of those states. However, it is non-trivial that this conjunction will itself be, or be subsumed by, a phenomenal state. That is, it is non-trivial that there will be something it is like to be in the conjunctive state. This can be seen from the fact that some philosophers deny the total unity thesis, or at least entertain its denial. For example, when Hurley, 1998, discusses the possibility that the unity of consciousness could break down and that consciousness could be partially unified, so that two phenomenal states are each unified with a third state but not with each other, she says. Therefore, we cannot imagine what it is like for there to be partial unity. That doesn't show that partial unity is unintelligible, because being partially unified isn't the sort of thing there could be anything it is like to be. We shouldn't expect to be able to imagine what it is like. Hurley 1998,165 In general, it seems that a case in which the unity of consciousness breaks down would be precisely a case in which there is no total phenomenal state of the subject. 
that is, there is nothing it is like to be the subject at that time, or at least there is no single something it is like that captures all the phenomenal states of the subject. Such a subject would have states with a local phenomenal character, but there would be no global phenomenal character involved in having these states. It is certainly very hard to see how this could be the case. Indeed, one might suspect, as we do, that such a scenario is impossible and perhaps incoherent. But to say this is not to say that the unity thesis is trivial, it is a substantive thesis about the nature of consciousness. This is reflected by the fact that, as we discuss later in the chapter, certain theories of consciousness entail that the unity thesis is false. If so, then the thesis puts substantive constraints on a theory of consciousness. For when access unity breaks down, the access unity thesis holds that necessarily, any two access conscious states are access unified. This entails that whenever a subject is access conscious of and is access conscious of Q, the subject will be access conscious of P and Q. This thesis is clearly false. To see that the thesis is false, we need a case in which a subject is access conscious of and access conscious of Q without being access conscious of P and Q. For this to happen, it should be the case that P is reportable and available for guiding reasoning and behavior and that Q is reportable and available for guiding reasoning and behavior but that P and Q is not reportable and not available for guiding reasoning and behavior. This can happen in a quite straightforward way. All that is required is that there be an access bottleneck. This will be a pathway of information access through which only a limited amount of information can pass at one time. If and Q are both accessible only through the bottleneck, and if each carries an amount of information that is near the capacity of the bottleneck, then and Q will be individually accessible, but the conjunctive content P and Q will not. This is not merely a description of an imaginary case. Such access bottlenecks can occur in real cognitive systems and are revealed by a number of experiments in the psychological literature. Perhaps the clearest example of such a bottleneck is given by a famous experiment by George Sperling, 1960. In Sperling's experiment, a subject is presented with a matrix consisting of three rows with four letters each. The matrix is flashed only briefly, for 250 milliseconds. After the matrix vanishes, a tone sounds, indicating whether the subject is to report the contents of the first, second, or third row. When subjects are required to report the contents of the top row, on average they correctly report 3.3 of the four letters in that row. The same occurs when they are required to report the contents of the middle or the bottom row. But when subjects are asked to report the contents of the entire matrix, on average they correctly report 4.5 of the 12 letters. So, to simplify a little, it seems that the subject has access to the information in any single row, but the subject does not have joint access to the information in all three rows. In this case, it is natural to hold that the subject, just after the matrix disappears, before the tone sounds, is access conscious of the contents of any individual row. Recalling that access consciousness requires accessibility for report and for reasoning and behavior, the contents of each row are available for report, individually, and could presumably be used to guide both reasoning about those contents and behavior. But it also seems that the subject is not access conscious of the conjunctive contents of the whole matrix or of any two rows. The conjunctive contents of more than one row are not available for verbal report and presumably are not available to guide reasoning and behavior. If so, then a subject can be access conscious of P, one row, and of Q, another row, without being access conscious of P and Q, both rows. So two access conscious states of a subject at a time can fail to be access unified, and the access unity thesis is false. We do not claim that the Sperling experiment alone proves that the access unity thesis is false. There are other possible interpretations of the experiment. For example, one could hold that the subject has some sort of internal access to the conjunctive content but that the process of report destroys this access. However, the interpretation we have suggested is a natural one. On the face of it, the conjunctive content does not seem to be available for any sort of reasoning or control, 
although the individual contents are available taken singly. And importantly, whether or not this interpretation is correct of the actual case, it seems to be a perfectly coherent interpretation that describes a perfectly reasonable way for a cognitive system to function. Indeed, given a natural design for cognitive systems with limited resources, we would expect certain restrictions on the flow of information in access and control, and we would expect access bottlenecks to arise in some cases. It may be that most of the time, when a subject has access to P and to Q, the subject has access to P and Q. But this sort of joint access clearly cannot hold necessarily. So even if there is a reasonably high degree of access unity in ordinary conscious states, this sort of access unity cannot hold across the board. This breakdown of access unity does not entail a breakdown of phenomenal unity. This can be seen by examining the Sperling case. It is difficult to know exactly what is going on in the phenomenology of the subject who is undergoing the Sperling experiment before being asked about the contents of a row. Perhaps the details of all nine letters are present in the subject's phenomenology, as some subjects report, perhaps these details are not present, and there is merely an indeterminate patch in each cell of the matrix, or perhaps there is something in between. Still, whatever the exact phenomenology here, there is little reason to suppose that phenomenal unity breaks down. No matter what it is like for a subject to experience each individual cell of the matrix in the Sperling case, it is plausible that there will be something it is like for the subject to see the entire matrix. It is also plausible that the phenomenology of seeing the matrix will subsume the phenomenology of seeing the individual cells. If the phenomenology of seeing a cell involves just a hazy patch, then the phenomenology of seeing the matrix will plausibly involve nine hazy patches. If the phenomenology of seeing a cell involves a detailed shape, then the phenomenology of seeing the matrix will plausibly involve nine detailed shapes. Either way, the individual phenomenal states are subsumed by the overall phenomenal state, so there is no reason to deny phenomenal unity here. At most, this sort of case suggests that a subject does not always have simultaneous access to the contents of all of the subject's phenomenal states. If the subject is indeed experiencing the details of all nine letters, then the subject is in a position where the contents of these experiences can be accessed and reported only a few at a time and not all at the same time. There is nothing paradoxical or contradictory about this. It simply suggests that a subject's access to a total phenomenal state is sometimes piecemeal. But this is just what we might expect. One consequence of this is that access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness can come apart. We have seen that the subject is access conscious of the individual letters but not of their conjunction. It is also natural to hold that either, I, the subject is phenomenally conscious of neither the individual letters nor their conjunctions, or, 2, the subject is phenomenally conscious of both the individual letters and their conjunction. In case, I, a subject is access conscious of an individual letter but not phenomenally conscious of it. In case, 2, a subject is phenomenally conscious of the conjunction but not access conscious of it. Either way, access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness of a given content can come apart. Our own view is that description, too, is somewhat more plausible. If this is so, we can still hold that access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness are correlated with each other for simple contents. But access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness will not always be correlated for complex contents. The moral of all this is that a breakdown of access unity does not entail a breakdown in phenomenal unity. There is a sense in which a breakdown of access unity is a disunity in consciousness, but it is a relatively shallow sense. Such a breakdown is quite compatible with an underlying phenomenal unity. Of course, we have not demonstrated that no breakdowns of access unity involve a breakdown of phenomenal unity, but this discussion does strongly suggest that one cannot infer a breakdown of phenomenal unity from a breakdown in access unity. To accept a breakdown of phenomenal unity, one would need a quite distinct reason. An opponent might try to argue that the Sperling case is a case where phenomenal unity breaks down. For example, 
the opponent might argue that the phenomenology of seeing each individual cell involves a detailed letter but that the phenomenology of seeing the whole matrix does not and that any global phenomenology here involves only hazy patches. Such a response would seem unmotivated and implausible on the face of it, at least in the absence of much supporting argument. If the phenomenology of each letter is detailed, then there seems to be good reason to hold that this phenomenology is present in a global phenomenal state. And even if it is coherent for an opponent to hold this, it is equally coherent, and seemingly more plausible, to deny this and to hold that the experience of the letters is phenomenally unified. The mere coherence of the denial is enough to show that one cannot infer a breakdown in phenomenal unity from a breakdown of access unity. 5. Can phenomenal unity break down? We think that there is a strong prima facie case that the unity thesis is true. This prima facie case is brought out by the fact that there seems to be something inconceivable about phenomenal disunity. It is difficult or impossible to imagine a subject having two phenomenal states simultaneously without there being a CONJ ointment phenomenology for both states. And there is a sense that something about the suggestion is incoherent. This prima facie inconceivability whether it takes the form of unimaginability or apparent incoherence gives at least some reason to believe that cases in which phenomenal unity breakdown are impossible, so that the unity thesis is true. But this is only a prima facie case. There are some possible scenarios that humans cannot imagine, and there are arguably some possible scenarios that no being could imagine. In addition, the judgment of incoherence in this case is not so strong that it could not be incorrect. So the prima facie case for the unity thesis needs to be balanced with the case against the unity thesis. A number of philosophers and scientists have argued that the unity of consciousness can break down. So to assess the unity thesis, one needs to examine these arguments in order to see what force they have against the unity thesis as we have understood it. By far the most common reason for holding that the unity of consciousness can break down is grounded in neuropsychology. It is widely held that patients in various unusual neuropsychological states have a disunified consciousness. The paradigm case here is that of a split-brain patient, whose corpus callosum has been severed for medical purposes, preventing the left and right hemispheres of the cerebral cortex from communicating directly, although there is still some connection through lower areas of the brain. Such patients behaves in a surprisingly normal fashion much of the time, but in certain circumstances they behave quite unusually. For example, when presented with different pictures in different halves of their visual field, example a cat on the left and a dog on the right, and asked to report the contents, the patient will report seeing only a dog, since the left hemisphere, which dominates speech, receives input from the right visual field. When asked to write down what she sees with her left hand, is controlled by the right hemisphere, such a patient may slowly write cat, with the right hand, she may write dog. If patient writes with her left hand on a paper visible in her right visual field, a conflict may occur when she sees what is written. In some cases, the right hand scratches out what the left hand has written. It is often held that in cases like this, consciousness is disunified. On one interpretation, example Puxati 1981, there are two distinct subjects of consciousness, one corresponding to each hemisphere. Such an interpretation is actually compatible with the unity thesis, since the unity thesis requires only that every subject have a unified consciousness. More threatening to the unity thesis are interpretations on which there is a single subject with a disunified consciousness. Some, Example Marx 1980, hold that the subject has two separate streams of consciousness, at least under experimental conditions. Others, example Lockwood 1989, hold that the subject has a fragmented consciousness with non-transitive unity between the states, for example, the experiences of cat and of dog might each be unified with some background emotional state but not with each other. Others, example Nagel 1971, hold that our conceptual framework in speaking of subjects may simply break down in this area. Adjudicating this question requires a very detailed examination of both the empirical details and the philosophical analysis of these phenomena, which we cannot provide here. Here, 
we will simply note that given what we have said so far in this chapter, the advocate of the phenomenal unity thesis has a natural line of response. It is plausible that in split-brain cases, there is some sort of breakdown of access unity. If we assume that there is a single subject, then it seems that the subject in the preceding case has at least a weak sort of access both to the presence of a cat and to the presence of a dog and can use each in reasoning and in the control of behavior. But it seems that the subject has no access to a conjunctive content involving both the cat and the dog. The conjunctive content is not reported and plays no apparent role in reasoning and in the control of behavior. So this may well be a case in which access unity fails. In this case, it seems that two accessed contents are not jointly accessible because of a disconnection between the relevant access mechanisms. But as we have seen, a breakdown of access unity does not entail a breakdown of phenomenal unity. So the possibility remains open that split-brain subjects have a unified phenomenal field, with some sort of CONJ ointment phenomenology subsuming each of the separate contents. It is just that the subject has pathologies of access, so that the contents of the field are accessible only singly and not jointly. If so, the subject in the experiment described has a phenomenal field that includes experiences of both a cat and a dog. The subject simply has no CONJ ointment access to these contents. Of course, this implies that the subject has highly imperfect knowledge of her conscious states. She will believe, in both halves of the brain, that she is experiencing only one image of an animal when in fact she is experiencing two. Still, it is plausible for many other reasons that knowledge of consciousness is fallible, and it is not unreasonable to suppose that in cases of brain damage, this fallibility might be quite striking. Nothing here proves that this interpretation is correct. It does suggest, however, that we should not be too quick to conclude that these cases involve a breakdown of phenomenal unity. Most of those who have discussed these cases have not carefully distinguished the relevant notions of unity and consciousness, an exception is Marcel 1994, who distinguishes reflexive consciousness from phenomenal experience and argues that the disunity concerns the former, and have often discussed things in terms of access and related functional notions. Once we distinguish access unity from phenomenal unity, it becomes clear that the direct evidence concerns access disunity, not phenomenal disunity. To establish phenomenal disunity requires substantial further argument. It may be that such arguments can be given, but the case is far from clear. One might say something similar about other disorders of consciousness, such as dissociative identity disorder, multiple personality disorder. In this case, it seems that there are pathologies of access between different parts of a cognitive system. But it seems quite tenable to hold that there is nevertheless a single field of consciousness at any given time, subsuming the conscious states of the subject, even if they are in certain respects mutually inaccessible. Of course, as in the split-brain case, subjects may well have various false beliefs about their own consciousness, example that the various states belong to different subjects, but again this is not unexpected. To completely assess this thesis requires much further analysis. But for now, we conclude that the empirical case against the phenomenal unity thesis is at best inconclusive. Given the strong prima facie positive case for accepting the phenomenal unity thesis, this suggests that the unity thesis remains quite plausible. 6. Formalizing the unity thesis this section is philosophically technical and can be skipped. 6.1 More on subsumption and entailment. For further analysis, we need to clarify the phenomenal unity thesis and the corresponding notion of phenomenal unity. We have said that a set of states is phenomenally unified when there is something it is like to be in all those states at once. When this is the case, the subject will have a phenomenal state, corresponding to the CONJ ointment what it is like, that subsumes each of the states in the original set. So phenomenal unity can be seen as a sort of subsumptive unity, and the phenomenal unity thesis on the table is a sort of subsumptive unity thesis. Subsumptive unity thesis, for any set of phenomenal states of a subject at a time, the subject has a phenomenal state that subsumes each of the states in that set. 
there are also closely related total and pairwise subsumptive unity theses that require subsumptive unity only for pairs of phenomenal states or only for the complete set of a subject's phenomenal states at a time, but we can focus on the preceding thesis for now. As it stands, the notion of subsumption is something of an intuitive primitive. There are some things we can say about it. It is a relation among token phenomenal states. It is plausibly reflexive, a state subsum s itself, antisymmetric, if a subsum s b and b subsum s a, then a equals b, and transitive, if a subsum s b and b subsum s c, then a subsum s c. Note that reflexivity eliminates any apparent problem of regress in the unity thesis, if a and b are subsumed by c, there is no need for a further state to subsume a and c, since c subsum s itself. The paradigm case of subsumption is the relation between a complex phenomenal state and a simpler state that is intuitively one of its components. One might think of subsumption as analogous to a sort of myriological part-slash-whole relation among phenomenal states, although this should be taken as an aid to intuition rather than as a serious ontological proposal, at least at this point. It is also useful to stipulate that subsumption holds between a phenomenal state and less specific states that intuitively correspond to the same experience, for example, that the state of experiencing a sharp pain subsum s the corresponding state of experiencing a pain. This sort of subsumption is required in order for a highly specific total phenomenal state to be able to subsume all of a subject's phenomenal states, including unspecific states. It should be noted that there are alternatives to analyzing phenomenal unity in terms of subsumption. Often phenomenal unity is analyzed in terms of an intuitive relation of co-consciousness, where this relation is taken as primitive. We think that the analysis in terms of subsumption runs deeper in certain respects than a primitive analysis in terms of co-consciousness and offers the promise of further analytic tools, as discussed later but the exact relation between these notions is an open question. Dainton 2000 gives a thorough and insightful analysis of the unity of consciousness in terms of a primitive co-consciousness relation, Bain 2001 b discusses the relationship between the different accounts 3. The notion of subsumption is connected to the notion of what it is like in at least the following sense, when a subsum s b, what it is like to have b is an aspect of what it is like to have a. Of course, this appeals to the unexplained notion of an aspect. One might try to go further by defining subsumption wholly in terms of the notion of what it is like as follows, a phenomenal state A subsum S phenomenal state B when what it is like to have A and B simultaneously is the same as what it is like to have A. This seems to capture the connection articulated earlier, and it also can ground the connection between subsumptive unity and the original definition of phenomenal unity. If there is something it is like to be in a set of states, as the original definition requires, then this phenomenology will correspond to a phenomenal state A of the subject, and it is clear that the state will subsume the states in the original set in the sense defined earlier. It is arguable that the defined notion of subsumption goes beyond the intuitive notion in certain respects, someone might hold that the what it is like locution can be read such that what it is like to have a and b differs from what it is like to have a even when a subsum s b, and we will not rely on it in what follows. Nevertheless, it can serve as a useful aid to the understanding. Extending this line of thought, one could say that a state a precisely subsum s a set of states s when what it is like to be in a is the same as what it is like to simultaneously be in the members of s tn if a precisely subsum s s, a subsum s each of the members of s, but the reverse entailment does not hold. For example, a subject's total state of consciousness subsum s each of the subject's visual experiences, but it does not precisely subsume the set of them. One could then articulate a correspondence thesis that holds that for any set of phenomenal states of a subject at a time, there is a corresponding phenomenal state that precisely subsum s that set. The correspondence thesis is formally stronger than the original subsumptive unity thesis, the existence of a total phenomenal state suffices for the truth of the original thesis, but it does not suffice for the truth of the correspondence thesis. The correspondence thesis nevertheless has some intuitive plausibility, and one could argue that this thesis, rather than the subsumptive unity thesis, 
best captures the idea articulated in the original phenomenal unity thesis. The difference between these theses will not be important for our purposes, however. 6.2. Subsumption, Entailment, and Gestalt Unity There is a close relation between subsumption and entailment. Let us say that a state P entails a state Q when it is impossible, logically or metaphysically impossible, for a subject to instantiate P without instantiating Q. Tien it seems clear that when a phenomenal state P subsumes a phenomenal state Q, P will entail Q for example, if P involves the phenomenal character as of seeing a red book and hearing a bird singing, and if Q involves the phenomenal character as of seeing a red book, then it is impossible to have P without having Q. The same goes with any case of subsumption. By its nature, the subsuming state carries with it the subsumed state. Note that strictly speaking, entailment is a relation among state types, while subsumption is a relation among state tokens. For present purposes, we can regard entailment as derivatively a relation among state tokens, so that one state token entails another when there is entailment between the corresponding state types, although see the discussion later. We will generally pass over this nicety in discussion, acknowledging it where it is relevant. Note also that a phenomenal state A entails a phenomenal state B IFF, necessarily, a subject in A is also in B not if the content of A entails the content of B4. The close relation between entailment and subsumption raises an interesting possibility, perhaps we can simply define subsumption in terms of entailment. Th it is, perhaps we can hold that phenomenal state A subsumes B when A entails B. If this were possible, instead of relying on a novel primitive relation, we could analyze unity in terms of a well-understood relation that allows the use of standard logical tools. To help assess this possibility, we can define a corresponding notion of unity and a corresponding unity thesis. Let us say that a set of phenomenal states of a subject at a time is logically unified when the subject has a phenomenal state that entails each of the phenomenal states in that set. Logical unity thesis, for any set of phenomenal states of a subject at a time, the subject has a phenomenal state that entails each of the states in the set. This gives an attractively simple formulation of the unity thesis that has some intuitive force. Unfortunately, there is an obstacle to replacing subsumption by entailment. We know that when a subsumes B, A entails B, but the reverse is not obviously the case. In fact, there are two ways in which it may seem that A could entail B without subsuming B. First, a and B might correspond to intuitively distinct experiences that share a type. For example, a subject might have two pains at the same time or two experiences of red and so will have two distinct phenomenal states of the same type. In this case, one state type will entail the other, as the types are identical, so if entailment among tokens is derivative on entailment among types, one state token will entail the other. Here it is not plausible to hold that one state subsumes the other. What it is like to have A and B simultaneously is quite different from what it is like to have A. One might instead refine the definition of entailment among state tokens, requiring that it is impossible for one token to exist without the other, in addition to the requirement that one type cannot exist without the other, but one can also deal with this case by a strategy discussed below. Second, a and B could be intuitively distinct phenomenal states that do not share any simple type but are nevertheless necessarily connected. This would involve a sort of gestalt unity that involves constraints on the co-occurrence of distinct phenomenal states. For example, perhaps there are cases where feeling a pain in one's shoulder while also experiencing a splitting headache produces a unique sort of pain that could not be experienced in the absence of the headache. Or perhaps seeing a certain person in the middle of a crowd produces a unique sort of visual experience of that person that could not be had in the absence of the experience of the crowd. Or perhaps, to use an example from Dainton 2000, the experience of the boundaries of a Kanasa triangle is of a special sort that could not be had in the absence of the circles in which the triangle is embedded. In this sort of case, we can say that the pain is gestalt unified with the headache, the experience of the person is gestalt unified with the experience of the rest of the crowd, and the experience of the boundaries is gestalt unified with the experience of the circles. 
whether there are really any cases of Gestalt unity is arguable. One could argue that in the cases in question, it would be possible, perhaps in some very different context, to experience the pain without the headache or to have the visual experience of the person without that of the crowd or to have that of the boundaries without that of the circles. Nonetheless, it is not implausible that at least some experiences put some constraints on concurrent experiences and that one cannot mix and match experiences arbitrarily. If this is so, then there is at least a weak sort of gestalt unity since the presence of one phenomenal state puts constraints on the nature of concurrent phenomenal states. In this case one can even say that the presence of one phenomenal state entails the existence of another phenomenal state, where the second is understood as an instantiation of a sufficiently unspecific phenomenal property. If there is gestalt unity, then there will be cases in which one phenomenal state entails another phenomenal state without the first subsuming the second in any intuitive sense. For example, the experience of the boundary of a Kanasa triangle might entail something about the experience of the nearby objects, but the experience of the nearby objects does not intuitively subsume that of the boundary of the triangle. Similarly, the experience of the shoulder pain might entail the experience of the headache, but it does not intuitively subsume the experience of the headache. Intuitively, what it is like to have the pain and the headache goes beyond what it is like to have the pain, even if the former is entailed by the latter. 6.3. Logical Unity and Subsumptive Unity if there is gestalt unity, then subsumption cannot be understood in terms of entailment. But this does not mean that we must give up on the logical unity thesis. Even if subsumption cannot be understood in terms of entailment, one can make a case that the logical unity thesis entails the subsumptive unity thesis. To see this, we can first note that not all phenomenal states are gestalt unified. Even if some pairs of phenomenal states are gestalt unified, it seems very unlikely that all pairs are, and it seems much more plausible that most pairs are not. Given a typical pair of phenomenal states had by a subject such that neither subs ums the other, it usually seems to be straightforwardly possible that a subject could have an instance of the first state without the second. When I see the red book and hear the bird singing, there seems to be no good reason to deny that I could have a visually identical experience without hearing the bird singing and so on. Dainton 2000 gives a more extended argument for the conclusion that Gestalt unity is not universal and is in fact rare. If there can be pairs of states that are not Gestalt unified, it also seems that there can be subjects none of whose states are Gestalt unified. One simply needs a subject all of whose basic phenomenal states are independent in the way described above, each of them could occur without any of the others. There seems to be no obstacle in principle to such a subject, and one could even argue that our own phenomenal states are often like this. Let us say that such a subject is gestalt-free. In gestalt-free subjects, the gestalt cases of entailment without subsumption will not arise. So, setting aside for a moment any other cases of entailment without subsumption, we can say that if the logical unity thesis holds, the subsumptive unity thesis holds at least when restricted to gestalt-free subjects. Now let us assume that the subsumptive unity thesis holds for gestalt-free subjects, for any set of phenomenal states of a gestalt-free subject, there is a subsumming phenomenal state. If so, it is very plausible that the subsumptive unity thesis holds for all subjects. If there is always a subsumming state in gestalt-free cases, there will plausibly always be a subsumming state in gestalt cases. There is nothing about Gestalt unity that makes the existence of a subsumming state in such cases less likely. If anything, the situation is the reverse. In a case of Gestalt unity, the experiences will be connected in such a way that the existence of a subsumming state will be more likely, not less. So if there are cases in which Gestalt unified states are not phenomenally unified, there should equally be cases in which Gestalt free states are not phenomenally unified. So the subsumptive unity thesis for Gestalt-free subjects plausibly leads to the subsumptive unity thesis for all subjects. We are close to establishing a connection between the logical unity thesis and the subsumptive unity thesis in general. But we still need to deal with the other case of entailment without subsumption, 
in which a subject has distinct simultaneous experiences that share a type. We can deal with this in an analogous way. Let us say that a subject has duplicate experiences when the subject has two intuitively distinct experiences that share a maximally specific phenomenal type, two pains or two color experiences with exactly the same quality, say. It is not entirely obvious that duplicate experiences are possible, but in any case, let us say that a duplicate-free subject is a subject without duplicate experiences. It is plausible that if the subsumptive unity thesis is true when restricted to duplicate-free subjects, it is true also of subjects with duplication. If it is possible for duplicate experiences not to be subsumed by a common experience, it will be equally possible for non-duplicate experiences not to be so subsumed. As with Gestalt phenomena, there is nothing about duplication per se that contributes to a breakdown of phenomenal unity. So the subsumptive unity thesis for duplication-free subjects plausibly leads to the subsumptive unity thesis for all subjects. Combining the last two cases, we can say that the subsumptive unity thesis restricted to gestalt-free, duplication-free subjects plausibly entails the subsumptive unity thesis for all subjects. But it is also clear that the logical unity thesis entails the subsumptive unity thesis for gestalt-free, duplication-free subjects. In such subjects, a phenomenal state T that entails all phenomenal states will also subsume all phenomenal states since we have removed the relevant gaps between subsumption and entailment. One might worry that one gap remains. By ruling out duplication, we have ruled out the possibility of entailment without subsumption for maximally specific phenomenal states, but it remains open that two sufficiently nonspecific states of the same type might entail each other without subsuming each other. Nevertheless, since T entails maximally specific versions of each of these nonspecific states, T will subsume these maximally specific states, and so T will subsume the nonspecific states. So T subsumes all of the subject's phenomenal states. We have established that the logical unity thesis entails the subsumptive unity thesis for gestalt-free, duplication-free subjects, and we have established that the latter thesis plausibly entails the subsumptive unity thesis for all subjects. So the logical unity thesis plausibly entails the subsumptive unity thesis. In reverse, the subsumptive unity thesis clearly entails the logical unity thesis. So it is plausible that the subsumptive unity thesis holds if and only if the logical unity thesis holds. The only obstacle to this equivalence will arise if there are breakdowns of phenomenal unity that are solely due to gestalt unity or to duplication, but there seems to be little reason to take that possibility seriously. If this is correct, we can assess the truth of the subsumptive unity thesis by assessing the truth of the logical unity thesis. This latter task is in some respects more straightforward, since we no longer have to deal directly with the primitive notion of subsumption. This also allows the possibility of using familiar logical tools to formulate and assess versions of the unity thesis. We will look more closely at some versions of the thesis in the following section. 6.4 Logical Unity and Conjunctive Closure There are three versions of the subsumptive unity thesis, the pairwise version, the general version, and the total version. There are correspondingly three versions of the logical unity thesis, holding that there is logical unity among either any two states of a subject at a time, any set of states, or the complete set of states. We can state this more directly as follows. Pairwise logical unity thesis, necessarily, for any two phenomenal states had by a subject at a time, the subject has a phenomenal state that entails both original states. General logical unity thesis, necessarily, for any set of phenomenal states of a subject at a time, the subject has a phenomenal state that entails each state in the set. Total logical unity thesis, necessarily, for any conscious subject at a time, the subject has a phenomenal state T such that for any phenomenal state A of the subject at that time, T entails A. As before, it is clear that the general thesis entails the pairwise thesis and the total thesis as special cases. The total thesis also entails the general thesis and the pairwise thesis since a state that entails all of the phenomenal states of a subject will also entail any pair or any set of states. 
Arguably the pairwise thesis does not entail the other two theses because of the formal possibility that there might be entailing states for any finite set of states but not for infinite subsets. We can start by focusing on the total logical unity thesis since this corresponds most closely to the total phenomenal unity thesis, which arguably captures the central intuition behind the unity of consciousness. Intuitively, we can think of T, the entailing state in the thesis, as the subject's total phenomenal state, capturing what it is like to be the subject at that time. If such a state exists, it will fulfill the requirement of the total logical unity thesis. One can also approach the matter in logical terms. Let us say that the conjunction of a set of states is a state C such that necessarily, a subject is in C if and only the subject is in each of the states in that set. Like entailment, conjunction is fundamentally a relation among state types and derivatively a relation among state tokens. Note also that the conjunction of states is quite different from the conjunction of the contents of states. 5. This identifies C at least up to mutual entailment. For present purposes, it is useful to assume that when two states A and B mutually entail each other, i.e., necessarily, a subject is in A if and only if the subject is in B, then the two states are identical. If so, then C is identified uniquely. Nothing that follows rests essentially on this assumption one could rephrase things in terms of equivalence classes of states but this makes the discussion easier. We can then propose a natural candidate for T, the conjunction C of all of a subject's phenomenal states at a time. It is clear that if T exists, tentails C, since tentails each of the conjunct of C. And it is clear that if T exists, C entails T, since T is itself a phenomenal state. So if T exists, then T is identical to C, and C is therefore a phenomenal state, by the earlier criterion for state identity. It is also clear that if C is a phenomenal state, then C will satisfy the total logical unity thesis with T equals C. We can therefore say that an appropriate T exists if and only if C is a phenomenal state. Let us say that a set of states is conjunctively unified when the conjunction of the members of that set is itself a phenomenal state. Then from the discussion here, it follows that the total logical unity thesis is equivalent to the claim that the set of a subject's phenomenal states is conjunctively unified. Total conjunctive unity thesis, if C is the conjunction of all of a subject's phenomenal states at a time, then C is itself a phenomenal state. As before, someone might think that a thesis of this sort is trivially true, but this would be incorrect. It is trivial that for any set of phenomenal states of a subject at a time, there will be a conjunctive state C that entails each of the original states, but it is non-trivial that C will itself be a phenomenal state. That is, it is non-trivial, although very plausible, that there will be something it is like to be in C, some global phenomenal character that a subject will have if and only if the subject is in C. Those who deny the original unity thesis will deny the existence of such a phenomenal character and so will deny that C is itself a phenomenal state. In effect, we have seen that the original phenomenal unity thesis is equivalent to a thesis about the conjunctive closure of co-instantiated phenomenal states, where co-instantiated states are states had by the same subject at the same time certain conjunctions of states in this class must also be states in this class. This is very useful since conjunctive closure is amenable to relatively straightforward analysis. One can also formulate conjunctive closure theses that are closely related to the other versions of the logical unity thesis. There is a pairwise version and a general version. Pairwise conjunctive unity thesis, for any two phenomenal states of a subject at a time, their conjunction is a phenomenal state. General conjunctive unity thesis, for any set of phenomenal states of a subject at a time, their conjunction is a phenomenal state. These theses are not quite formally equivalent to the corresponding versions of the logical unity thesis. To see this, note that it is at least a formal possibility that two states might be logically unified but not conjunctively unified. For example, it is at least formally possible that the conjunction of all of a subject's phenomenal states might be a phenomenal state but that the conjunctions of certain pairs and subsets might not be. If so, then these pairs and subsets will be logically unified but not conjunctively unified. 
In this case the pairwise and general conjunctive unity theses will be false, but the pairwise and general logical unity theses will be true. However, it is clear that these conjunctive unity theses entail the corresponding versions of the logical unity thesis. They are also interesting and plausible theses in their own right. The first says that for any two phenomenal states A and B of a subject at a time, there will be something distinctive that it is like to be in A and B, that is, a distinctive CO and J ointment phenomenal character that a subject will have if and only if the subject is in both A and B. The second says the same thing for arbitrary sets of co-instantiated phenomenal states. These theses are not formally trivial, but they are highly plausible theses about phenomenal consciousness. These theses are closely related to the correspondence thesis discussed in the previous section. All three theses are simple and elegant. The pairwise conjunctive unity thesis says that the class of phenomenal states is closed under pairwise co-instantiated conjunction, the conjunction of two co-instantiated phenomenal states is a phenomenal state. The general conjunctive unity thesis says that the class of phenomenal states is closed under general co-instantiated conjunction, the conjunction of any set of co-instantiated phenomenal states is a phenomenal state. The total conjunctive unity thesis says that the class of phenomenal states is closed under maximal co-instantiated conjunction, the conjunction of a maximal set of co-instantiated phenomenal states is a phenomenal state. The total conjunctive unity thesis remains the core version of the unity thesis, but all of these theses are plausible and useful. Each of them can be used as a tool in assessing the status of the unity of consciousness, its consequences, and its compatibility with various theories of consciousness. 6.5 Hurley, Shoemaker, and what it is like All of the conjunctive unity theses are stated simply in terms of the notions of phenomenal state, co-instantiation, and conjunction. In addition, the notion of a phenomenal state is tied constitutively to the notion of there being something it is like to be a given subject or to be in a given state. So we have an account of unity that requires little more than the existing what it is like conception of phenomenal states. This stands in tension with a claim in a very interesting analysis by Hurley, 1998, 165-66, who argues that the unity of consciousness cannot be characterized subjectively and that suppositions about the structure of consciousness are not captured by the what it is like test, so that we need to appeal to further objective properties to give an account of unity. This claim is grounded in the claim that in a case where unity breaks down, there is no what it is like that captures the structure of a subject's consciousness. Hurley backs up this claim by considering two cases, I, two subjects, one experiencing red and hot, the other experiencing red and dizzy, and, two, a partially unified single subject, in whom red and hot are unified, red and dizzy are unified, but hot and dizzy are not. Hurley argues that no what it is like facts can distinguish these two cases. From the claim that there is no what it is like that characterizes a disunified subject, however, it does not follow that one cannot characterize unity in what it is like terms. Indeed, following Hulley's own claim, one can hold that unity breaks down precisely when there is nothing it is like to have all of a subject's conscious state simultaneously. We can distinguish case, I, from case, 2, by noting that in case, 2, both subjects have a phenomenal state that subsumes all of their phenomenal states, whereas in case, I, the subject has no such phenomenal state. Of course, our characterization of unity appeals to something more than phenomenal states themselves, it also appeals to subsumption and to co-instantiation in a subject. Perhaps Hurley would count these notions as in some sense objective. There is no point in arguing over terminology here, but we can at least note that subsumption is a phenomenal relation, fixed by phenomenology alone, if a subsum s b, then the phenomenology of A guarantees that it subs a mess B. In addition, subjects are simply the bearers of phenomenal states, so we are staying quite close to home in characterizing unity this way. Hurley might extend her argument by suggesting case, 3 a bifurcated subject with two different, but indistinguishable, tokens of red in separate streams. In this subject, red, is unified with hot, red 2 is unified with dizzy, 
and no state in either pair is unified with a state in the other pair, Hurley 1998, 166 seems to point towards such a case. If, 3, is possible, one could argue that it could not be distinguished from, 2, by talk of subjects and their phenomenal states alone. We would need to appeal to the identity of phenomenal states, a single red experience is involved in both complex experiences in, 2, but not in, 3. There are a number of things one could say in response. One might concede that what it is like talk cannot distinguish the two different cases of disunity, 2, and, 3, but hold that it can nevertheless distinguish unity from disunity, which is the most important work we needed to do. If the unity thesis is true, then cases of disunity will be impossible, and distinctions among impossible cases will not matter for characterizing the structure of consciousness. More deeply, one can suggest that Hulley's argument shows at best that one cannot distinguish the cases in terms of the distribution of phenomenal state types. If we appeal to facts about the distribution of phenomenal state tokens, things are straightforward, there is a token experience that is subsumed by two different complex experiences in, 2, but not in, 3. It may be that, 2, and, 3, will be introspectively indistinguishable, so that the structure of consciousness is not transparent to a subject. Nevertheless, a characterization of the structure of consciousness in terms of phenomenal relations among phenomenal state tokens is still, in a deep sense, a characterization in subjective terms. Our characterization of unity in phenomenal terms also stands in tension with a claim by Shoemaker, 2003. Shoemaker suggests that if a conscious state is understood as one with a phenomenal property, i.e., one such that there is something it is like to be in it, this leads to consciousness atomism, the view that the factors that make a state conscious are independent of the factors that make two states unified. Our discussion here suggests that this is false. What it is for two conscious states to be unified can be understood in terms of the existence of a more complex conscious state, where both the simple state and the complex states are characterized by what it is like to be in them. So the factors that enter into unifying conscious states are the same sort as those that enter into those states being conscious in the first place. At one point, Shoemaker characterizes consciousness atomism differently, as the view that whether a state is conscious will be independent of whether there are other conscious states with which it is co-conscious. The account here is neutral on this claim. For all we have said here, it may be possible for there to be a subject with a single conscious state. This claim does not seem to us to be obviously objectionable, and it is compatible with the more important view that the factors that enter into consciousness are the same as those that enter into co-consciousness. In fact, the definitions of unity that we have given here suggest that any account of what it is to be a phenomenal state will automatically yield a theory of what it is for two such states to be unified. We need simply to apply the theory to the relevant conjunctive states in order to determine whether they are phenomenal states. In this way, any substantive theory of phenomenal consciousness can yield unified definitions of consciousness and co-consciousness. It is precisely because of this that the unity thesis, if it is true, puts strong constraints on a theory of phenomenal consciousness, as we will see. 7 Applications of the Unity Thesis We have already mentioned the objection that the conjunctive versions of the unity thesis are trivial, that is, that it is trivial that the conjunction of a set of co-instantiated phenomenal states is itself a phenomenal state. It is clear that the thesis is not formally trivial in that there are many classes of states that are not closed under co-instantiated conjunction. For example, states of the sort talking with X where X is an individual are not closed under co-instantiated conjunction. Closer to home, there are also many classes of mental states that are not closed under co-instantiated conjunction. For example, the class of belief states does not seem to be closed under conjunction. Let us say that a belief state is the state of believing some proposition. Then it is not the case that the conjunction of any set of belief states is a belief state. For example, if A is the state of believing that P, and if B is the state of believing that Q, there is plausibly no belief state that a subject will be in precisely when they are in A and B. 
The only tenable candidate for such a belief state is the state of believing that P and Q, but there are well-known reasons to believe that a subject can believe P and believe Q without believing the conjunction P and Q. For example, P and Q might be believed in different compartments of a compartmentalized mind. It may even be that, for some P, a subject can believe that P and separately believe that P without believing the contradiction P and P. It also seems quite possible that a subject can have many different beliefs without accepting the massive conjunction of the contents of all of those beliefs. If this is right, then the conjunction of co-instantiated belief states will not in general be a belief state. So the class of belief states is not closed under co-instantiated conjunction. It may seem plausible or even obvious that the class of phenomenal states is closed under conjunction. But if so, this is a substantive thesis about the class of phenomenal states and its difference from other classes of mental states. It may even be a conceptual truth, in some sense, that the class of phenomenal states is closed under co-instantiated conjunction. But if so, this is again a substantive thesis about the concept of a phenomenal state and a way in which it differs from the concept of a belief state and other sorts of states. The substantive nature of the thesis is also revealed by the fact that it puts strong constraints on theories of consciousness. We have seen that the unity thesis is prima facie plausible, and there seem to be no strong arguments against it. If this is right, then the unity thesis puts a prima facie constraint on theories of consciousness, they must be compatible with the unity thesis. In particular, any account of phenomenal states must be compatible with the total conjunctive unity thesis. Whatever phenomenal states are, according to a given account, the class of phenomenal states must be closed under total co-instantiated conjunction. A number of prominent theories of consciousness appear to be incompatible with this constraint. 7.1. The Higher Order Thought Theory one example is the higher-order thought theory of consciousness put forward by Rosenthal, 1997, and others. Not all higher-order thought theorists intend the theory as an account of phenomenal consciousness, example Leakin 2000 explicitly rejects the idea, but we are concerned only with versions of the theory that are aimed at phenomenal consciousness. The central idea of these theories is the following. Higher-order thought thesis, a mental state M is phenomenally conscious if and only if a subject has a higher order thought about M. Here, a higher order thought about M should be understood as a thought by the subject with the content I am in M. The thesis will usually be modified and qualified in some ways. For example, Rosenthal holds that for M to be conscious, the higher order thought must be brought about in the right sort of way and in particular must be a non-inferential thought. Rosenthal also holds that only sensory states can be phenomenally conscious, so that we would have to insert a qualification to that effect in the preceding definition. This is arguably a mere verbal difference, however, since Rosenthal holds that there will be something it is like to be in a state whenever it is the object of the right sort of higher order thought, whether the state is sensory or not. In any case, for our purposes we will take the thesis in the simple form above. Our arguments should apply straightforwardly to most modified versions. Is the higher order thought thesis compatible with the unity thesis? It is easiest to approach this question by considering the conjunctive versions of the unity thesis. The conjunctive versions say that the class of phenomenal states is closed under conjunction. So we can ask, on the higher order thought theory, is the class of phenomenal states closed under conjunction? We can start by thinking about phenomenally conscious mental states. If A and B are phenomenally conscious mental states, is A and B necessarily a phenomenally conscious mental state? Assuming the higher order thought thesis, this translates into the following, if a subject has a higher order thought about A and a higher order thought about B, does the subject necessarily have a higher order thought about A and B? That is, if the subject has a thought I am in A and a thought I am in B, does it follow necessarily that the subject has a thought I am in A and B? It seems not. It is surely possible for a subject to think I am in A and I am in B without connecting these into a thought I am in A and B. We can take a case like those discussed earlier, in which a subject has contradictory beliefs, knows that she has each belief, 
but never puts the two together. She might have the thought I believe P and the thought I believe P without ever putting these two together into a thought I believe both P and P. This might be strange or unusual, but there is nothing contradictory about it. There would only be something contradictory here if the beliefs of a subject are necessarily closed under logical consequence, but of course no subject's beliefs are closed under logical consequence. The same is even clearer where total conjunctivity is concerned. On the higher order thought theory, if a subject has a number of phenomenally conscious mental states, is their conjunction a phenomenally conscious mental state? That is, if a subject has mental states A and, and has the thoughts I am in A. I am in A, does the subject necessarily have the thought I am in A and A and A? Again, it seems not. One might reasonably argue that this entailment does not even hold typically, let alone necessarily. That is, it is arguable that a typical subject with these higher order beliefs would not have the complex conjunctive belief. Whatever one says here, it is hard to dispute that it is possible for a subject to have the individual higher order beliefs without the complex conjunctive belief. So it appears that if the higher order thought view is true, the class of phenomenally conscious mental states is not closed under coinstantiated conjunction. This already contradicts the central intuition behind the unity thesis, that necessarily, if there is something it is like to be in each of a set of states, there is something it is like to be in all the states at once. On the higher order thought view, this thesis will clearly be false. The official version of the unity thesis is stated in terms of phenomenal states, not phenomenally conscious mental states. The analysis of phenomenal states is slightly trickier since advocates of the higher order thought view have not usually talked about phenomenal states and phenomenal properties directly. But given that higher order thought theorists hold that there is something it is like to be in a mental state when the subject has a higher order thought about it, they presumably hold that what it is like to be in that state is determined by the content of the higher order thought. If so, it seems that phenomenal properties will be the properties of having higher order thoughts with certain contents and that phenomenal states will be the states of having such higher order thoughts. Do phenomenal states, understood this way, satisfy the unity thesis? It seems not, for much the same reason as before. Here it is useful to take the entailment version of the unity thesis, that necessarily, when a subject has a set of phenomenal states, the subject has a phenomenal state that entails each of the individual states. When a subject has a set of higher order thoughts H. H N, does the subject necessarily have a higher order thought HH such that being in HH entails being in high HN? It seems not, for the usual reasons. A subject might think I am in A and I am in B without any higher order thought, example I am in A and B, such that having that thought entails having the original thoughts. The problem is not that the higher order thought theory provides no way to understand phenomenal unity. It can do so in a natural way. Two phenomenally conscious mental states A and B are unified when the subject has a higher order thought about them not just singly but jointly. And two phenomenal states, the states of having higher order thoughts I am in A and I am in B are phenomenally unified when there is a complex phenomenal state that entails them, that is, if there is a complex higher order thought such that having the complex thought entails having the specific thoughts. This requirement will arguably be satisfied when the subject has a complex higher order thought such as I am in A and C B. The problem is rather that on this account, there is no reason to believe that phenomenal states or phenomenally conscious mental states will always be unified. Certainly it will not be necessary that they be unified, and it seems plausible that in a typical case they will not be unified. So the higher order thought thesis is incompatible with the unity thesis. It is clearly incompatible with the conjunctive and logical versions of the unity thesis. It is therefore also incompatible with the subsumptive version since any failure of logical unity automatically entails a failure of subsumptive unity. So if the higher order thought thesis is true, the unity thesis is false. And if the unity thesis is true, the higher order thought thesis is false. Proponents of the higher order thought thesis might reply in a number of ways. Most straightforwardly, 
they might reply by denying the unity thesis. This is a tenable response since the truth of the unity thesis cannot be taken for granted. Still, there is a strong intuition that the unity thesis is true, so the incompatibility is at least a cost of the higher order thought thesis. Proponents might also embrace a more limited version of the unity thesis, arguing, for example, that unity holds typically but not necessarily, or that it holds given contingent facts of human psychology but not for all possible beings. Here there would still be the cost of denying the intuition of necessary unity, and there would be the added difficulty of defending the claim that unity holds in the relevant range of cases when there seems to be no obvious reason why complex conjunctive thoughts about all the objects of our higher order thoughts should typically exist. Higher order thought theorists might also respond by finding fault with the argument for incompatibility. They might hold, for example, that it is necessary that the class of mental states that are objects of higher order thoughts is closed under conjunction. This would be a difficult case to make in face of the apparent possibility of the failure of this principle, and in face of the general phenomenon that beliefs are not closed under logical consequence. Finally, proponents might modify the higher order thought thesis to make it compatible with the unity thesis. To do so, they must modify the definition of a phenomenally conscious mental state. It could be held, for example, that a mental state is phenomenally conscious when either, I, it is the object of a higher order thought or, 2, it is the conjunction of states that are the objects of higher order thoughts. This sort of disjunctive account would be contrary to both the letter and the spirit of existing higher order thought views, which hold that a conscious state is one that the subject is conscious of. One could also raise questions about whether this thesis delivers any substantive unity of consciousness or merely a stipulated sort of unity of consciousness that holds trivially. Insofar as the unity of consciousness seems to be a substantive fact about consciousness, one could argue that this modified version of the higher order thesis does not really account for it. Of course, all of this is debatable and could lead to fruitful further discussion. But the prima facie incompatibility between the two theses is at least interesting. The incompatibility extends straightforwardly to other higher order views of consciousness, including views on which a conscious state is an object of a higher order perceptual state or the object of some other sort of higher order representational state. The existence of a set of higher order perceptual states does not entail the existence of a complex conjunctive higher order perceptual state, and the same goes for other sorts of representational states. So if the unity thesis is true, these theses are false, and vice versa. 7.2 Representationalism. The unity thesis is also incompatible with many representationalist views of consciousness. According to representationalist views, example Dritzk 1995, Thai 1995, all phenomenally conscious mental states are representational states, that is, states with representational content. This is commonly allied with a further functional criterion to yield the following. Representationalist thesis, a mental state is phenomenally conscious if and only if it is a representational state that plays an appropriate functional role. We will focus on this broadly functionalist variety of representationalism. The details of the relevant functional role differ among representationalists, but it is typically held to involve some sort of access and control. One can then say that what it is like to be in a mental state is determined by the content of the representational state on the condition that it plays the relevant functional role. On this sort of view, then, a phenomenal state is a state of having a certain sort of representational state play the appropriate functional role, where distinct phenomenal states are individuated by distinct representational contents. Two phenomenal states P and P2 are conjunctively unified when there is a phenomenal state P that entails each of the original states. On the representationalist account, two phenomenal states pi and p, corresponding to representational states a i and a2, with contents c and c2, playing the relevant functional role, will be conjunctively unified when there is a phenomenal state p corresponding to representational state a, with content c, playing the relevant functional role, such that p entails pi and p. This will occur if and only if the existence of a playing the role entails the existence of both a, 
and A2 playing the role. The only reasonable way to satisfy this is for the content of A to entail the content of A, and the content of A, that is, for C to entail both C and C, or for C to entail C and C. For example, if A, has content red to the left, and A2 has content green to the right, pi and P2 will be conjunctively unified if there is a state A, playing the role, whose content entails red to the left and green to the right. So two phenomenal states, corresponding to two representational states, will be conjunctively unified if and only if there is a conjunctive representational state, playing the appropriate role, whose content entails the conjunction of the contents of the original representational states. The unity thesis is true if and only if necessarily, every set of phenomenal states is conjunctively unified. On the representationalist view, is this the case? It seems not. It seems at least possible to have a state with content C and a state with content C2, each playing a certain role, without having a state with content C and C2 that plays the role. We saw this earlier in the case where the relevant role involves accessibility, it is possible that C is accessible and C is accessible without C and C being accessible. Something similar will hold for any functional role involving access and control. If this is so, then representationalist theses in the relevant class are incompatible with the unity thesis. As before, representationalists could respond in a number of ways. They could deny the unity thesis, at the cost of denying a strong intuition. They could modify it to apply to a more limited range of cases, at the cost of some intuition and perhaps some empirical constraint. For example, in the Sperling case, this representationalist may have to deny that the subject has a phenomenally unified visual field. They could modify the representationalist thesis to allow a disjunctive definition that stipulates that conjunctions of phenomenal states are phenomenal states, at the cost of endangering the substantive status of the unity thesis. Alternatively, they could move to a different sort of representationalism, the sort discussed in Chapter 11, that is not so closely tied to functionalism. For example, it might be held that phenomenally conscious states are representational states whose content is represented phenomenally or that they are representational states with some other property that is not functionally defined. The resulting version of representationalism might be compatible with the unity thesis, as well as being independently more plausible than the previous versions, at the cost of giving up the reductive aspirations of many representationalist views. One might also argue that other non-representationalist forms of functionalism are incompatible with the unity thesis on the general grounds that there will not be the relevant conjunctive property among states playing the functional role. The details will depend on the details of the functionalist theory and in particular on the account that is given of phenomenal states and properties. These accounts can vary between functionalist theories and are often not clearly articulated, so it is difficult to give a general analysis of such theories with respect to the unity thesis. Nonetheless, it is clear that it will be at least highly non-trivial for a functionalist account to satisfy the unity thesis. If the foregoing is correct, then the unity thesis is incompatible with higher-order thought, and other higher-order representation, views of consciousness, with many representationalist views of consciousness, and with many functionalist views of consciousness. So the unity thesis is clearly non-trivial. Nevertheless, it has strong independent plausibility as a thesis about phenomenal states. So the incompatibility of the unity thesis with these views of consciousness should be seen as at least prima facie evidence against these views. 8. Explaining the unity thesis. If the unity thesis is true, how is its truth to be explained? We do not know the answer to this question, but in this concluding section, we explore some possibilities. One common strategy is to try to explain unity in functional terms. For example, one might try to explain unity in terms of some sort of informational integration or in terms of serial processing in the brain. One obvious problem with this sort of strategy is that it is not clear why this sort of functioning should yield phenomenal unity, as opposed to something like access unity. An equally deep problem is that, for reasons similar to those discussed in the previous section, 
it seems inevitable that this sort of functioning will be present contingently and that it will be possible for conscious states to exist that do not stand in the relevant functional relations. If so, unity, on these analyses, will obtain only contingently, and the unity thesis will be false. If unity is to obtain necessarily, as the unity thesis suggests, we must look elsewhere. Much of the reason for accepting the truth of the unity thesis comes from the fact that its denial seems to be inconceivable and perhaps incoherent. This suggests that the unity thesis may be at some level a conceptual truth, although perhaps a deep conceptual truth, whose roots are revealed only by a deep analysis of our concepts. The central concepts involved in the unity thesis are that of a phenomenal state and that of a subject, along with various additional notions such as subsumption, entailment, conjunction, and so on. So one might hope that some light could be shed by attention to the concept of a subject or by attention to the concept of consciousness. One natural suggestion is that our concept of a subject of experience is somehow premised on unity. For example, one could suggest that ascriptions of subjecthood require as a precondition that subjects correspond to unified phenomenal fields. In the spirit of a sort of bundle theory of the subject, one could argue that we have a prior notion of a phenomenal field and that we then associate subjects with phenomenal fields. If this is the case, we would expect that every subject would have a unified consciousness. A subject with two distinct phenomenal fields, for example, would be ruled out as a conceptual impossibility. Where there are two phenomenal fields, there will automatically be two subjects. How might this work? Our articulation of the notion of a phenomenal field in this chapter appeals to subjects and co-instantiation, but one might argue that these can be bypassed. For example, one might appeal to a primitive relation of subsumption, or of co-consciousness, among phenomenal states that makes no presuppositions about subjects of those states and then define a phenomenal field as a maximal phenomenal state, a phenomenal state that is not subsumed by any other phenomenal state. But even if something like this works, there is a deeper problem. This strategy might explain why distinct phenomenal fields correspond to distinct subjects, but it cannot explain why states of consciousness come packaged into unified phenomenal fields in the first place. For example, nothing in this strategy explains why a phenomenal state cannot be subsumed by two different phenomenal states such that no further phenomenal state subsumes both of these in turn. More generally, Nothing here explains why the subsumption relation does not hold in an unsystematic and fragmented manner. It is possible that an analysis of subsumption itself could do some work. For example, one could argue that subsumption is conceptually akin to a myriological part-whole relation and so must hold reflexively, antisymmetrically, and transitively, perhaps in a way that allows no overlap. Still, this conceptual stipulation does not really make the problem go away. It simply raises the question of why conscious states come packaged as parts and wholes. One might then take a different approach. Instead of focusing on the concept of a subject, one could focus on the concept of consciousness itself. It could be argued that our basic concept of consciousness is not the notion of a simple phenomenal state what it is like to experience such and such at a time. Rather, our basic notion of consciousness is that of a total phenomenal state, what it is like to be a subject at a time. This yields a holistic rather than an atomistic view of consciousness. On this approach, we do not start with basic atomic states of consciousness and somehow glue them together into complex states. Rather, we start with a basic total state of consciousness and then differentiate it into simpler states and ultimately into atomic states. If this were truly our basic notion of consciousness, then it might explain why the unity thesis is true. On this view, any non-total phenomenal state is derivative on a total phenomenal state that subsumes it. It is then to be expected that any phenomenal states of a subject at a time are all simply aspects of what it is like to be that subject at that time. As such, it is to be expected that for any set of co-instantiated phenomenal states, there will be a subsuming state. On this view, the most basic problem with the theories of consciousness discussed in the last section is that they are atomistic rather than holistic, starting with simple states rather than total states. If this view is right, 
then any such analysis of consciousness will be a misanalysis from the start. It is not obvious that this sort of conceptual claim on its own yields a substantive unity thesis. But one might naturally tie this analysis to a corresponding substantive view of the metaphysics of consciousness. In nature, it may be that the most basic sort of conscious state is the total phenomenal state, the phenomenal field, or even the phenomenal world. One these total states are basic, but they are not featureless. They come with a complex structure from which one can differentiate many aspects. As an analogy, one can think of a quantum wave function, which is a basic state in physics but which nevertheless has a complex structure. So metaphysically, simple conscious states might be derivative on total conscious states. If so, we would have a clean explanation of why a substantive unity thesis is true. This sort of suggestion is highly speculative and much needs to be worked out. For example, it is far from obvious that our basic concept of consciousness is that of a total state of consciousness, and one needs to make a direct case for this. In addition, the corresponding metaphysics needs to be worked out in much more depth. But there is at least some plausibility in the idea that the concepts of consciousness and states of consciousness are fundamentally holistic rather than atomistic. This squares well with our intuition that consciousness is necessarily unified. In any case, whether the substantive claims that we have made in this chapter are correct or incorrect, we hope to have pinned down some of the crucial issues. It is clear that there is much need for further work in analyzing the notion of unity, in assessing the truth of the unity thesis, and in seeking an explanation of its truth. It is likely that such work will be philosophically fruitful. Appendix, Two-Dimensional Semantics One Introduction Two-dimensional approaches to semantics, broadly understood, recognize two dimensions of the meaning or content of linguistic items. On these approaches, expressions and their utterances are associated with two different sorts of semantic values that play different explanatory roles. Typically, one semantic value is closely associated with an expression's referent, while the other is associated with the way that reference depends on the external world. Two-dimensional semantics is usually understood as a version of possible world semantics, so that each dimension is understood in terms of possible worlds and related modal notions. In possible world semantics, linguistic expressions and slash or their utterances are first associated with an extension. The extension of a sentence is its truth value, for example, the extension of Plato was a philosopher is true. The extension of a singular term is its referent, for example, the extension of Don Bradman is Bradman. The extension of a general term is the class of individuals that fall under the term, for example, the extension of cat is the class of cats. Other expressions work similarly. One can then associate expressions with an intention, which is a function from possible worlds to extensions. The intention of a sentence is a function that is true at a possible world if and only if the sentence is true there. The intention of Plato was a philosopher is true at all worlds where Plato was a philosopher. The intention of a singular term maps a possible world to the referent of the term in that possible world, the intention of Don Bradman picks out whoever is Bradman in a world. The intention of a general term maps a possible world to the class of individuals that fall under the term in that world, the intention of cat maps a possible world to the class of cats in that world. It can easily happen that two expressions have the same extension but different intentions. For example, Quine's terms chordate, creature with a heart, and Renata, creature with a kidney, pick out the same class of individuals in the actual world, so they have the same extension. However, there are many possible worlds where they pick out different classes, any possible world in which there are creatures with hearts but no kidneys, for example, so they have different intentions. When two expressions have the same extension and a different intention in this way, the difference in intention usually corresponds to an intuitive difference in meaning. So it is natural to suggest that an expression's intention is at least an aspect of its meaning. Carnap, 1947, suggested that an intention behaves in many respects like a free gene sense, the aspect of an expression's meaning that corresponds to its cognitive significance. For example, 
it is cognitively significant that all Renatas are chordates and vice versa, this was a non-trivial empirical discovery about the world, so that Renata and chordate should have different free gene senses. One might naturally suggest that this difference in sense is captured more concretely by a difference in intention and that this pattern generalizes. For example, one might suppose that when two singular terms are cognitively equivalent, so that A equals B is trivial or at least knowable a priori, for example, then their extension will coincide in all possible worlds, so they will have the same intention. One might also suppose that when two such terms are cognitively distinct, so that A equals B is knowable only empirically, for example, then their extensions will differ in some possible world, so they will have different intentions. If this were the case, the distinction between intention and extension could be seen as a sort of vindication of a free gene distinction between sense and reference. However, the work of Kripke, 1980, is widely taken to show that no such vindication is possible. According to Kripke, there are many statements that are knowable only empirically but are true in all possible worlds. For example, it is an empirical discovery that Hesperus is phosphorus, but there is no possible world in which Hesperus is not phosphorus, or vice versa, as both Hesperus and phosphorus are identical to the planet Venus in all possible worlds. If so, then Hesperus and phosphorus have the same intention, one that picks out the planet Venus in all possible worlds, even though the two terms are cognitively distinct. The same goes for pairs of terms such as water and H2O. It is an empirical discovery that water is H2O, but according to Kripke, both water and H2O have the same intention, picking out H2O in all possible worlds. Something similar even applies to terms such as I and David Chalmers, at least as used by me on a specific occasion, I am David Chalmers expresses non-trivial empirical knowledge, but Kripke's analysis entails that I am David Chalmers in all worlds, so my utterances of these expressions have the same intention. If this is correct, then intentions are strongly dissociated from cognitive significance. Still, there is a strong intuition that the members of these pairs, Hesperus and Phosphorus, Water and H2O, I and David Chalmers, differ in some aspect of meaning. Further, there remains a strong intuition that there is some way the world could turn out so that these terms would refer to different things. For example, it seems to be at least epistemically possible, in some broad sense, that these terms might fail to co-refer. On the face of it, cognitive differences between the terms are connected in some fashion to the existence of these possibilities. So it is natural to continue to use an analysis in terms of possibility and necessity to capture aspects of these cognitive differences. This is perhaps the guiding idea behind two-dimensional semantics. Two-dimensional approaches to semantics start from the observation that the extension and even the intention of many of our expressions depend in some fashion on the external world. As things have turned out, my terms water and H2O have the same extension and the same, crip can, intention. But there are ways things could have turned out so that the two terms could have had different extensions and different crip can intentions. So there is a sense in which for a term like water, the term's extension and its Kripken intention depend on the character of our world. Given that this world is actual, it turns out that water is HO, and 2, its Kripken intention picks out H2O in all possible worlds. However, if another world had been actual, example Putnam's twin Earth world, in which XYZ is the clear liquid in the oceans, water might have referred to something quite different, Example XYZ, and it might have had an entirely different Kripken intention, example one that picks out XYZ in all worlds. This suggests a natural formalization. If an expression's Kripken intention itself depends on the character of the world, then we can represent this dependence by a function from worlds to intentions. As intentions are themselves functions from worlds to extensions, this naturally suggests a two dimensional structure. We can represent this structure diagrammatically as follows. This diagram expresses an aspect of the two-dimensional structure associated with the term water. It is intended to express the intuitive idea that if the H2O world turns out to be actual, as it has, 
then water will have a Kripken intention that picks out H2O in all worlds, but if the XYZ world turns out to be actual, as it has not, then water will have a Kripken intention that picks out XYZ in all worlds. Intuitively, the worlds in the column on the left represent ways the actual world can turn out, these are sometimes thought of more precisely as possible contexts of utterances and sometimes as epistemic possibilities, while the worlds across the top reflect counterfactual ways that a world could have been, these are sometimes thought of more precisely as possible circumstances of evaluation and sometimes as metaphysical possibilities. It is sometimes said that worlds on the left column, one world per row, making up the first dimension of the matrix, correspond to different worlds considered as actual, while the worlds in the top row, one world per column, making up the second dimension of the matrix, correspond to different worlds considered as counterfactual. Thus two-dimensional matrix can be seen as a two-dimensional intention, a function from ordered pairs of worlds to extensions. Such a function is equivalent to a function from worlds to intentions and, seen this way, can be regarded as capturing the intuitive idea that a term's intention depends on the character of the actual world. One can also recover the intuitive idea that a term's extension depends on the character of the actual world by examining the diagonal of this matrix, the cells that correspond to the same world considered as actual and as counterfactual. In the earlier example, where the H2O world is considered as actual and as counterfactual, then water picks out H2O, while if the XYZ world is considered as actual and as counterfactual, then water picks out XYZ. We can say that an expression's primary intention is a function mapping a world W to the term's extension when W is taken as both actual and as counterfactual. So the primary intention of water maps the H2O world to H2O, the XYZ world to XYZ, and so on. We can then see how pairs of terms with the same extension and the same Kripken intention might nevertheless have different two-dimensional intentions and different diagonal intentions. For example, water and H2O have the same Kripken intention, but it is plausible that if the XYZ world had turned out to be actual, they would have had different Kripken intentions. Water would have had an intention that picked out XYZ in all worlds, while H2O would still have had an intention that picked out H2O in all worlds. If so, then these terms have different two-dimensional intentions and different diagonal intentions. One can make a case that something similar applies with Hesperus and Phosphorus and with I and David Chalmers, the members of each pair have a different two-dimensional intention and a different primary intention. If so, then this begins to suggest that there is some sort of connection between an expression's two-dimensional intention, or perhaps its diagonal intention, and its cognitive significance. One might even speculate that an expression's diagonal intention behaves in some respects like a free gene sense, so that a version of Carnap's project might be vindicated. A number of different two-dimensional approaches to semantics have been developed in the literature by Kaplan, 1979, 1989, Stallnaker, 1978, Chalmers, 1996, 2000, and 2A, 2004A, and Jackson, 1998, among others, and closely related two-dimensional analyses of modal notions have been put forward by Evans, 1979, and by Davies and Humberstone, 1981. These approaches differ greatly in the way that they make the foregoing intuitive ideas precise. They differ, for example, in just what they take the worlds in the left column to be, and they differ in their analysis of how a term's intention and slash or extension depends on the character of the actual world. As a result, different approaches associate these terms with quite different sorts of two-dimensional semantic values, and these semantic values have quite different connections to cognitive significance. In many cases, the connection is limited in scope, applying to index cycles, Kaplan, to descriptive names, Evans, and to expressions that involve actually, Davies and Humberstone, while Stallnaker's later work rejects a connection to a priority altogether too. to two-dimensionalism. In recent years, a number of philosophers, Example Chalmers 1996, 2002A, 2004A, 
Jackson 1998, 2004, see also Bratton Mitchell 2004, Lewis 1994, Wong 1996, have advocated a two-dimensional approach on which first-dimensional semantic values are connected to a priority and cognitive significance in a much stronger and more general way. On this approach, the framework applies not just to index icons and descriptive names but also to expressions of all sorts. Proponents hold that any expression, or at least any expression token of the sort that is a candidate for having an extension, can be associated with an intention that is strongly tied to the role of the expression in reasoning and thought. The term two-dimensionalism is often used for views of this sort. Five core claims of two-dimensionalism are as follows. T1, every expression token, of the sort that is a candidate to have an extension, is associated with a primary intention, a secondary intention, and a two-dimensional intention. A primary intention is a function from scenarios to extensions. A secondary intention is a function from possible worlds to extensions. A two-dimensional intention is a function from ordered pairs of scenarios and worlds to extensions. T2, when the extension of a complex expression token depends compositionally on the extensions of its part, the value of each of its intentions at an index, world, scenario, or ordered pair, depends in the same way on the values of the corresponding intentions of its parts at that index. T3, the extension of an expression token coincides with the value of its primary intention at the scenario of utterance and with the value of the secondary intention at the world of utterance. T4, a sentence token S is metaphysically necessary iff the secondary intention of S is true at all worlds. T5, a sentence token S is a priori, epistemically necessary, iff the primary intention of S is true at all scenarios. In what follows I first clarify and motivate these principles without precisely defining all of the key notions or making a case for their truth. In later sections, I discuss how the relevant notions, especially the notion of a primary intention, can be defined in such a way that the principles might be true. These principles should not be taken to provide an exhaustive characterization of two-dimensionalism, but they lie at the core of the view. Start with claim, T.I. Here, a scenario is something akin to a possible world, but it need not be a possible world. In the most common two-dimensionalist treatments, a scenario is a centered world, an ordered triple of a possible world along with an individual and a time in that world. Other treatments of scenarios are possible, see Chalmers 2004, but I will use this understanding here. An expression's secondary intention, or what Jackson calls its C intention, is just its familiar post Kripken intention, picking out the extension of the expression in counterfactual worlds. For example, the secondary intention of a token of I as used by speaker A picks out A in all worlds. The secondary intention of water picks out H2O in all worlds. The secondary intention of Julius, Evans' term that rigidly designates whoever invented the zip, picks out William C. Whitworth in all worlds. More generally, any rigid designator picks out the same object in all worlds, or at least in all worlds where the object exists. An expression's primary intention works quite differently. I defer a full characterization but some examples give a rough idea. The primary intention of a token of I, evaluated at a centered world, picks out the designated individual at the center of that world. So the primary intention of my use of I, evaluated at a world centered on Napoleon, picks out Napoleon rather than David Chalmers. The primary intention of a token of water, very roughly, picks out the clear, drinkable liquid with which the individual at the center is acquainted. So the primary intention of my use of water, evaluated at a twin earth world centered on a subject surrounded by XYZ in the oceans and lakes, picks out XYZ rather than H2O. The primary intention of a token of Julius picks out whoever invented the zip in a given world. So the primary intention of Julius, evaluated at a world where Tiny Tim invented the zip, picks out Tiny Tim rather than William C. Whitworth. And so on. Thesis, T.I., also holds that expression tokens can be associated with a two-dimensional intention, 
roughly, a function from pairs to extensions. We can then say that at least on the understanding of scenarios as centered worlds, the primary intention coincides with the diagonal of the two-dimensional intention, i.e., the value of S's primary intention in a centered world W coincides with the value of S's two-dimensional intention at the pair, where W asterisk is the possible world element of W. Likewise, the secondary intention coincides with the row of the two-dimensional intention determined by the scenario of an utterance, i.e., the value of S's secondary intention at a world W coincides with the value of S's two-dimensional intention at, where is the scenario of utterance. However, for most purposes the two-dimensional intention of an expression is somewhat less important than its primary and secondary intentions, and the two-dimensionalist need not hold that an expression's primary and secondary intentions are derivative from its two-dimensional intention. Thesis, T2, says that the primary and secondary intentions of a complex expression depend on the primary and secondary intentions of its parts according to the natural compositional semantics. For example, the primary intention of I am Julius will be true at a scenario if the individual at the center of that scenario is the inventor of the zip in that scenario. Thesis, T3, states a natural connection between the intentions and the extension of an expression token. This thesis requires that for every utterance, just as there is one world that is the world of the utterance, there is also one scenario that is the scenario of the utterance. If scenarios are Understood as centered worlds, this will be a world centered on the speaker and the time of the utterance. When evaluated at the scenario and world of utterance, the primary and secondary intentions, respectively, of an expression token will coincide with the extension of the expression token. At other worlds and scenarios, however, the values of these intentions may diverge from the original extension and from each other. Turning to claims, T4, and T5 here, we can say that S is a priori when it expresses a thought that can be justified independently of experiences. S is metaphysically necessary when it is true with respect to all counteractual worlds, under the standard Kripken evaluation. Thesis, T4, is a consequence of the standard understanding of metaphysical necessity and the corresponding intentions. Thesis, T5, is intended to be an analog of thesis. T4, in the epistemic domain. Thesis, T5, is the distinctive claim of two-dimensionalism. It asserts a very strong and general connection between primary intentions and a priority, one much stronger than obtains with the other two-dimensional frameworks discussed earlier. It is possible that a two-dimensionalist might grant some limited exceptions to thesis, T5, say, for certain complex mathematical statements that are true but unknowable, while still remaining recognizably two-dimensionalist. However, it is crucial to the two-dimensionalist position that typical a posteriori identities involving proper names or natural kind terms, such as Mark Twain is Samuel Clemens or Water is H2O, have a primary intention that is false in some scenario. Consequences of the previous theses include the following. T6 a sentence token S is necessary a posteriori IFF the secondary intention of S is true at all worlds but the primary intention of S is false at some scenario. T7, a sentence token S is contingent a priori IFF the primary intention of S is true at all scenarios but the secondary intention of S is false at some world. So two-dimensionalism proposes a unified analysis of the necessary a posteriori, all such sentences have a necessary secondary intention but a contingent primary intention. Likewise, it proposes a unified analysis of the contingent a priori, all such sentences have a contingent primary intention but a necessary secondary intention. From the previous theses, one can also draw the following conclusions about the primary and secondary intentions of both sentential and subsentential expressions. Here A and B are arbitrary expressions of the same type, and A equals B is a sentence that is true IFF A and B have the same extension. For example, if A and B are singular terms, A equals B is just the identity statement A equals B, while if A and B are sentences, A equals B is the biconditional A IFF B. T8, 
A equals B is metaphysically necessary if F A and B have the same secondary intention. T9, A equals B is a priori, epistemically necessary, if F A and B have the same primary intention. It follows that for a posteriori necessary identities involving proper names, such as Mark Twain is Samuel Clemens, the two names involved will have the same secondary intentions but different primary intentions. Something similar applies to kind identities such as water is H2O. If this is correct, then primary intentions behave in these cases in a manner somewhat reminiscent of a free gene sense. 3. Epistemic two-dimensionalism. For these claims, especially claim, T5, to be grounded, we need to have a better idea of what primary intentions are. Clearly, they must differ from the two-dimensional notions such as Kaplan's characters and Stallnaker's diagonal propositions, at least as these are understood by their proponents. Here, I outline one approach, the approach I favor, to understanding primary intentions. This approach, which we might call epistemic two-dimensionalism, is elaborated in much greater detail in other works, Chalmers 2002a, 2004a, 2006. According to epistemic two-dimensionalism, the connection between primary intention and epistemic notions such as a priority requires that primary intentions be characterized in epistemic terms from the start. On this approach, the scenarios that are in the domain of a primary intention do not represent contexts of utterance. Rather, they represent epistemic possibilities dash, highly specific hypotheses about the character of our world that are not ruled out a priori. The value of an expression's primary intention at a scenario reflects a speaker's rational judgments involving the expression under the hypothesis that the epistemic possibility in question actually obtains. For example, water is not H2O is epistemically possible in the sense that its truth is not ruled out a priori. Correspondingly, it is epistemically possible that our world is the XYZ world, or at least that it is qualitatively just like the XYZ world. If we suppose that our world is the XYZ world, that is, that the liquid in the oceans and lakes is XYZ and so on, then we should rationally endorse the claim water is XYZ, and we should rationally reject the claim water is H2O. So the primary intention of water is H2O is false at the XYZ world, and the primary intention of water is XYZ is true there. Likewise, Mark Twain is not Samuel Clemens is epistemically possible in the sense that it is not ruled out a priori. Correspondingly, it is epistemically possible that our world is a world W where one person wrote the books such as Tom Sawyer that we associate with the name Mark Twain and a quite distinct person is causally connected to our use of the term Samuel Clemens. If we suppose that W is our world, then we should rationally endorse the claim Mark Twain is not Samuel Clemens. So the primary intention of Mark Twain is Samuel Clemens is false at W. According to two-dimensionalism, something similar applies to any Kripken a posteriori necessity. For any such sentence S, S is epistemically possible. It is also plausible that for any such S, there is a world W such that if we suppose that our world is qualitatively like W, we should rationally reject S. If so, then the primary intention of S is false at W. If this pattern generalizes to all a posteriori necessary sentences, then any such sentence has a primary intention that is false at some scenario, as thesis, T6, suggests. Here, primary intentions are characterized in thoroughly epistemic terms. The preceding claims are not in tension with the Kripken claims that water is H2O is metaphysically necessary or that water picks out H2O in all worlds. Even Kripke allows that water is not H2O is epistemically possible. As Chapter 7 notes, it is a familiar Kripken point that there can be an epistemic necessitation between two statements A and B even when there is no metaphysical necessitation between them, witness X is the source of heat sensations and X is heat. We simply have to strongly distinguish the sort of epistemic evaluation of sentences in worlds, which turns on epistemic necessitation, from the usual sort of counterfactual evaluation, which turns on metaphysical necessitation.
primary intentions are grounded in the former, secondary intentions are grounded in the latter. For defining primary intentions. It remains to define primary intentions more precisely. To generalize from the foregoing, we might suggest that the primary intention of a sentence S is true at a scenario WIFF. The hypothesis that W is actual should lead us to rationally endorse S somewhat more carefully, we can say that the primary intention of S is true at a scenario WIFF D epistemically necessitates S, where D is a canonical specification of W. It remains to clarify the notion of a scenario, a canonical specification, and epistemic necessitation. Scenarios are highly specific epistemic possibilities. In the centered world's version of epistemic two-dimensionalism, scenarios are identified with centered worlds. For any possible world W, it is epistemically possible that W is actual, or at least it is epistemically possible that a world qualitatively identical to W is actual. More precisely, it is epistemically possible that D is the case, where D is a canonical specification of W, in a sense I will discuss shortly. However, epistemic possibilities are more fine-grained than possible worlds. For example, the information that the actual world is qualitatively like a possible world W is epistemically consistent with various different epistemic possible claims about one's self-location. For example, it is consistent with the claims it is now 2004 and it is now 2005. To handle these claims about self-location, we model epistemic possibilities using centered worlds. The individual and the time marked at the center of a centered world serve as a you are here marker, which serves to settle these claims about self-location. For a given thinker, the hypothesis that a given centered world W is actual can be seen as the following hypothesis, D is the case, IMF, and the current time is G, where D is a canonical specification of the uncentered world corresponding to W and F and G are semantically neutral descriptions that pick out the individual and the time at the center of W. We can think of this conjunctive claim as a canonical specification of the centered world W. A canonical specification of an uncentered world W is a complete specification of W in semantically neutral vocabulary. To a first approximation, a semantically neutral vocabulary is one that is free of terms, such as names and natural kind terms, that give rise to Kripken a posteriori necessities and a priori contingencies. Restricting world specifications to a vocabulary of this sort avoids obvious problems that would arise if we allowed, for example, water is H2O into the specification of the XYZ world. For more on the characterization of semantic neutrality, see Chalmers 2006. A complete specification of W is a sentence D such that, I, D is true of W, and, 2, if E is a semantically neutral sentence that is true of W, then D epistemically necessitates E. We also need to define epistemic necessitation. To a first approximation, we can say that D epistemically necessitates SIFF accepting D should lead one to rationally endorse S, without needing further empirical information, given idealized reflection. On a refined definition, we can say that D epistemically necessitates SIFF a conditional of the form DDS is a priori. The refined definition is arguably better in some difficult cases, but for many purposes, the first approximation will suffice. Because they are defined in epistemic terms, there is an inbuilt connection between primary intentions and the epistemic domain. In particular, there will be a strong connection to a priority. When a sentence token S is a priori, then it will be epistemically necessitated by any sentence whatsoever, this is especially clear for the second understanding of epistemic necessitation given earlier, so its primary intention will be true in all scenarios. When a sentence token S is not a priori, then its negation will be epistemically possible, and S will be false relative to some highly specific epistemic possibility. As long as there is a scenario for every epistemic possibility, then the primary intention of S will be false in some scenario. If so, then thesis, T5, will be correct. Still, on the centered world understanding of scenarios, thesis, T5, 
is non-trivial and is denied by some philosophers for reasons discussed in Chapter 6, Section 6-8. Some hold that there are more conceivable scenarios than centered metaphysically possible worlds. For example, some hold that there is an omniscient being is conceivably false, it is not a priori, but is true at all centered worlds. If so, then sentences like these are counterexamples to T5. Similar potential counterexamples arise from conceivable situations involving zombies, according to the type B materialist. I argue in Chapter 6 that there are no such counterexamples and that a conceivability possibility thesis, CP in the language of Chapter 6, equivalent to T5, is true, but the issue is controversial. Alternatively, there is a version of epistemic two-dimensionalism in which scenarios are more strongly dissociated from ordinary possible worlds. On this approach, scenarios are understood in more purely epistemic terms as maximally specific epistemic possibilities. They can be constructed as maximal a priori consistent sets of sentences in an ideal language. On this construction, thesis, T5, is all but guaranteed to be true. For example, even if it is necessary that there is an omniscient being, as long as it is not a priori that there is an omniscient being, there will be scenarios in which there is no omniscient being is true. Likewise, if it is not ruled out a priori that there are zombies, there will be scenarios in which there are zombies is true. The epistemic construction of scenarios allows many of the semantic and epistemological benefits of two-dimensionalism even for those who are skeptical about associated metaphysical claims. So for the semantic and epistemological purposes of chapters 8, 9, 11, and 12, this construction is at least as useful as the centered world construction. For the metaphysical purposes of chapter 6, the centered world construction is crucial. In what follows, I largely use the centered world construction for reasons of familiarity and concreteness, but most of what I say can easily be translated to the epistemic construction. One can define the secondary intention of a sentence in a similar, if more familiar, way. The secondary intention of S is true at a world WIFF D metaphysically necessitates S, where D is a canonical specification of W. Here a canonical specification can be characterized much as before, although it is not necessary to impose the restriction to semantically neutral vocabulary. Metaphysical necessitation could be taken as basic, or perhaps better, we can define it in terms of subjunctive conditionals, D metaphysically necessitates S when a subjunctive conditional of the form if D had been the case, S would have been the case is true. One can likewise define the two-dimensional intention of a sentence. The two-dimensional intention of S is true at IFF D epistemically necessitates that D metaphysically necessitates S, where D is a canonical specification of the scenario V and D is a canonical specification of the world W. If we understand epistemic necessitation in terms of a priori material conditionals and metaphysical necessitation in terms of subjunctive conditionals, this will be the case IFF D proper superset symbol, DS, is a priori, where the outer conditional is material and the inner conditional is subjunctive. This discussion of the intentions of sentences can be extended to the intentions of subsentential expressions in a reasonably straightforward way. For details, see Chalmers 2006. The Roots of Epistemic Two-Dimensionalism The epistemic two-dimensional framework is grounded in a thesis about the scrutability of reference and truth. This is a version of the thesis discussed in Section 3 of Chapter 7, once subjects are given enough information about the character of the actual world, then they are in a position to make rational judgments about what their expressions refer to and whether their utterances are true. For example, once we are given enough information about the appearance, behavior, composition, and distribution of various substances in our environment, as well as about their relations to us, then we are in a position to conclude, without needing further empirical information, that water is H2O. And if instead we are given quite different information, characterizing our environment as a twin earth environment, then we will be in a position to conclude that water is XYZ. Of course, if we allow the enough information to include arbitrary truths, such as water is H2O, 
the scrutability claim will be trivial. But we can impose significant restrictions on the information without compromising the plausibility of the thesis. For example, one can argue that even if we restrict ourselves to truths that do not use the term water or cognates, it remains the case that given enough truths of this kind, we are in a position to know the truth of water is H2O, see chapter 6. The same goes for many or most other terms, plausibly including most names or natural kind terms. The upshot is that there is some reasonably restricted vocabulary V, such that for arbitrary statements T, then once we know enough V truths, we will be in a position to know, without needing further empirical information, the truth value of T. Just how restricted such a vocabulary can be is an open question. Chapter 7 argues that PQTI, a conjunction of microphysical, phenomenal, and index -ical truths along with a that's all truth, can serve as a basis, but this claim is not required here. All that is required for present purposes is that some semantically neutral vocabulary, conjoined with index -ical terms such as I and now, is sufficient 3. This suggests that for any true sentence token S, there is a V-truth D such that D epistemically necessitates S, in that a subject given the information that D will be in a position to rationally endorse S, given ideal rational reflection. Furthermore, it appears that in principle, no further empirical information is needed to make this judgment, if such information were required, we could simply include it, or equivalent qualitative information, in D to start with. This strongly suggests that there is a non-empirical warrant for the transition from D to S. In particular, one can make the case that in these cases, the material conditional D proper superset symbol S will be a priori. This case is made at length in Chapter 7. If this is correct, then D epistemically necessitates S in the second, stronger sense given earlier. The scrutability claim does not apply only to the actual world. It is plausible that for all sorts of scenarios, if we are given the information that the scenario is actual, then we are in a position to make a rational judgment about the truth value of arbitrary sentences. For example, if we are given a complete qualitative characterization of the bodies visible in the sky at various times, with the feature that no body is visible both in the morning sky and the evening sky, then we should rationally reject the claim Hesperus is phosphorus. This sort of judgment is part of the inferential role associated with our use of the terms Hesperus and Phosphorus. The point is general, for any expression we use, then given sufficient information about the actual world, certain judgments using the expression will be irrational, and certain other judgments using the expression will be rational. It is arguable that the expressions of any language user will have this sort of normative inferential role. This is just part of what being a language user involves. It is this sort of inferential role that grounds the primary intention of an arbitrary expression, as used by an arbitrary speaker. A given sentence token will be associated with a raft of conditional rational judgments across a wide variety of scenarios. This raft of conditional judgments corresponds to the sentence's primary intention. Something very similar applies to subsentential expressions. For a singular term, for example, there will be a raft of conditional rational judgments using the expression across a wide variety of scenarios, and these can be used to define the extension of the expression relative to those scenarios, see Chalmers 2006, so we will have substantial primary intentions for a wide range of sentential and subsentential expression tokens. For reasons discussed in Chapter 6, Nothing here requires that the expressions in question be definable in simpler terms, such as in semantically neutral terms, or that they be equivalent to descriptions, even to rigidified descriptions or descriptions involving actually. The inferential roles in question will exist whether or not the term is definable and whether or not it is equivalent to a description. These claims are quite compatible with Kripke's epistemological argument that terms such as Gödel are not equivalent to descriptions. In effect, Kripke describes a scenario W, where someone called Schmidt proved the incompleteness of arithmetic, and then it was stolen by someone called Gödel, who moved to Princeton, and so on. Kripke's argument might be put by saying that, I, W is not ruled out a priori, and, 
2. If we accept that W obtains, we should reject the claim Gödel proved the incompleteness of arithmetic, so, 3. Gödel proved the incompleteness of arithmetic is not a priori. A two-dimensionalist will put this by saying that the primary intention of Gödel proved the incompleteness of arithmetic is false at W, so that the primary intention of Gödel differs from that of the prover of the incompleteness of arithmetic. If Kripke's argument generalizes to other descriptions, it will follow that the primary intention of Gödel is not equivalent to the primary intention of any such description. But nothing here begins to suggest that Gödel lacks a primary intention. Although the primary intention of an expression may not be equivalent to that of a description, one can often at least approximately characterize an expression's primary intention by using a description. For example, one might roughly characterize the primary intention of a typical use of water by saying that in a centered world W, it picks out the dominant clear, drinkable liquid with which the individual at the center of W is acquainted. One might also roughly characterize the primary intention of Gödel by saying that it picks out that individual who was called Gödel by those from whom the individual at the center acquired the name. However, these characterizations will usually be imperfect, and it will be possible to find Kripke-style counterexamples to them. Ultimately, a primary intention is not grounded in any description but rather is grounded in an expression's inferential role. 6. Two-dimensionalism and semantic pluralism. Two-dimensionalism is naturally combined with a semantic pluralism, according to which expressions and utterances can be associated with many different semantic, or quasi-semantic, values by many different semantic, or quasi-semantic, relations. 4. On this view there should be no question about whether the primary intention of the secondary intention is the content of an utterance. Both can be systematically associated with utterances, and both can play some of the roles that we want contents to play. Furthermore, there will certainly be explanatory roles that neither one plays, so two-dimensionalism should not be seen as offering an exhaustive account of the content of an utterance. Rather, it is characterizing some aspects of utterance content that can play a useful role in the epistemic and modal domains. Likewise, there should be no question about which of the two-dimensional frameworks that have been developed by various theorists is the correct framework. Each framework offers a different quasi-semantic relation that associates expressions with two-dimensional semantic values, and each of these may play an explanatory role in different domains. Each has different properties. Most importantly, primary intentions have a stronger connection to a priority and cognitive significance than the semantic values described earlier. These differences arise from the differences in the way the semantic relations are defined. Kaplan and Stallnaker define their two-dimensional notions in terms of certain sorts of context dependence, while Evans defines his notions in terms of a prior notion of content and Davies and Humberstone define theirs in terms of the behavior of an actually operator. Primary intentions are not defined in any of these ways but instead are defined in epistemic terms. Because they are defined in epistemic terms, primary intentions can often vary between tokens of an expression type. This will happen most obviously for context-dependent terms such as tall, for which tokens in different contexts will be associated with different inferential roles. Primary intentions may also vary among different tokens of the same name, especially by different speakers, for different tokens of the same demonstrative, example this or that, and perhaps also for different tokens of the same natural kind term. It follows that, in these cases, a primary intention does not constitute an expression's linguistic meaning, where this is understood as what is common to all tokens of an expression type or as what is required for any competent use of the expression. Instead, a primary intention can be seen as a kind of utterance content. Even if they are not always part of linguistic meaning, primary intentions are nevertheless a sort of truth conditional content. The primary intention of an utterance yields a condition under which the utterance will be true. For example, the primary intention of there is water in the glass will be true at some scenarios and false at others, and the utterance will be true if the primary intention is true at the scenario of the utterance, roughly, 
if the glass picked out by the individual at the center of the scenario contains the dominant watery stuff in the environment around the center. This can be seen as an epistemic truth condition for the utterance, specifying how the truth of the utterance depends, epistemically, on which epistemically possible scenario turns out to be actual. This contrasts with the metaphysical truth condition corresponding to the secondary intention, which might be seen as specifying how the truth of the utterance depends, metaphysically, on which metaphysically possible world is actual. Again, there is no need to decide the question of which of these is the truth condition associated with an utterance. Are primary intentions a sort of semantic content? This depends on how we understand the notion of semantic content. If we stipulate that the semantic content of an utterance is truth conditional content, then primary intentions are a variety of semantic content. On the other hand, if we stipulate that semantic content is linguistic meaning in the sense just discussed or that semantic content is always associated with expression types and not tokens, then primary intentions are not in general part of semantic content, though they may be part of semantic content for some expressions, such as some index icons and qualitative expressions. In any case, once we are clear on the various properties of these intentions, nothing important to the framework turns on the terminological question of whether they count as semantic. A semantic pluralist can allow that for some explanatory purposes it may be useful to modify two-dimensionalist semantic values in some respects. For example, one might define the structured primary intention of a complex expression as a structured entity involving the primary intentions of the simple expressions involved in the expression's logical form. One might likewise define structured secondary and two-dimensional intentions. Given compositionality, a structured primary intention will determine an unstructured primary intention, and likewise for the other intentions, but the reverse need not be the case. This means that structured primary intentions are finer grained than unstructured primary intentions. For example, all a priori truths will have the same unstructured primary intention, one that is true at all scenarios, but they will have different structured primary intentions. The fine grainedness of structured intentions makes a difference for certain purposes, described later. What are propositions, according to two dimensionalism? Some two-dimensionalists, example Jackson 1998, hold that propositions are sets of possible worlds, in which case a given utterance expresses two propositions, a primary proposition and a secondary proposition. This view is naturally combined with the view that there are no necessary a posteriori propositions, necessary a posteriori sentences have both a primary proposition that is contingent and knowable only a posteriori and a secondary proposition that is necessary and knowable a priori. Other two-dimensionalists may hold that propositions have more structure than this. For example, one could hold that propositions are structured entities involving both the primary and the secondary intentions, and slash or perhaps the two-dimensional intention, of the simple expressions involved. A two-dimensionalist of this sort may allow that there are necessary a posteriori propositions. A semantic pluralist view tends to suggest that there are numerous entities that can play some of the explanatory roles that propositions are supposed to play and that there is no need to settle which of these best deserves the label proposition. My own view, see Chalmers forthcoming, is that if one has to identify propositions with one sort of entity that can be modeled in the framework, there is a good case for choosing structured two-dimensional entities of some sort and in particular those discussed as candidates for free gene senses in the following section. However, one might also allow that, at least for some purposes, propositions should be seen as entities that are finer grained than any two-dimensional objects, so that propositions can be associated with intentions without themselves being intentions. In any case, Core two-dimensionalism as characterized earlier is compatible with a wide range of views here. 7 Applications of Two-Dimensionalism I will briefly sketch some applications of the two-dimensionalism outlined in the previous section. I, Free Gene Sense, Chalmers 2002b, forthcoming. Thesis, T9, says that two expressions A and B have the same primary intentions IFFA equals B is epistemically necessary. 
This is reminiscent of the free gene claim that two singular terms A and B have the same sense IFF A equals B is cognitively insignificant. It suggests that primary intentions can play at least some of the roles of a free gene sense, individuating expressions by their epistemic role. Of course, there are some differences. For example, primary intentions are not as fine-grained as free gene senses, a priori equivalent expressions, such as 7 plus 3 and 10, will have different free gene senses, but they have the same primary intention, though they will usually have different structured primary intentions. Further, there are differences between primary intentions and free gene senses in the case of index cycles. For example, uses of I by different speakers have the same primary intention, whereas Freya held that they have different senses. Relatedly, where Freya held that sense determines reference, primary intentions do not determine extensions in a strong sense, although they may still determine extension relative to context, as two expressions may have the same primary intentions and different extensions. Still, one may nevertheless think of primary intentions as a broadly free gene aspect of an expression's content. One can also use the two-dimensional framework to define semantic values that behave more like Freya's own senses. We might stipulate that the sense of a simple expression token is an ordered pair of its primary intention and its extension, that is, an ordered pair of its free gene and russell Lien content, as explicated in Chapter 11, and that the sense of a complex expression token is a structured complex made up of the senses of its parts. Now, most pairs of a priori equivalent expressions, such as 7 plus 3 and 10, will have different senses. The only potential exceptions will arise if there are a priori equivalent but cognitively distinct simple expressions, which is not obvious. Furthermore, uses of I by different speakers will have different senses. And now, sense determines reference in the strong sense. So entities of this sort might be seen as very much akin to free gene senses, and we might think of the structured entity associated with a sentence token as akin to a free gene thought. See Chalmers, forthcoming, for much more on this. 2. Contents of Thoughts, Chalmers 2002a. One can extend the earlier framework so that primary and secondary intentions are not just associated with sentences but also with thoughts, where these are understood as a current mental states. For example, my thought water is H2O will have a contingent primary intention, false in the XYZ scenario, but a necessary secondary intention. One can then argue that a thought's primary intention is a sort of narrow content, content that is shared between intrinsically identical thinkers. For example, when Oscar on Earth and twin Oscar on twin Earth say water is wet, the thoughts they express will have different secondary intentions, so secondary intentions are a sort of wide content, but they will have the same primary intention. 3. Conceivability and Possibility, Chapter 6 If thesis, T5, is correct, it licenses a certain sort of move from conceivability to possibility. Let us say that S is conceivable when it is epistemically possible, that is, when S is not ruled out a priori. If, T5, is correct, then when S is conceivable, the primary intention of S will be true in some scenario. If scenarios are centered worlds, then there will be some centered, metaphysically possible, world W satisfying the primary intention of S. This does not entail that S is metaphysically possible, but it nevertheless allows us to draw conclusions about metaphysically possible worlds from premises about conceivability. As discussed in Chapter 6, reasoning of this sort is central to some uses of conceivability arguments in the philosophy of mind. 8. Objections to Two-Dimensionalism A number of objections to two-dimensionalism have been made in the literature. Some objections, the first eight considered here, rest on the attribution of views to which two-dimensionalism is not committed. They might be considered objections to certain versions of two-dimensionalism, but they do not apply to the epistemic two-dimensionalism that I have outlined. Other objections, the next two considered here, show that the claims of two-dimensionalism must be restricted in certain respects. Still others, the last three considered here, raise substantive issues whose adjudication is an ongoing project. 
What is held constant? Block and Stallnaker 1999. Evaluation of primary intentions turns on claims about what a term such as water would have picked out in counterfactual circumstances. This raises the question of what is held constant across worlds in counting an expression as a token of water. If only orthography is held constant, then many tokens of water is watery will be false, if reference is held constant, then no token of water is H2O will be false. So to yield the desired results, a two-dimensionalist must hold constant some intermediate sort of content, such as free gene or descriptive or narrow content. But it is question begging for a two-dimensionalist to presuppose such a notion of content. Response dash. Evaluation of primary intentions does not turn on metalinguistic claims about what a term would have picked out in counterfactual circumstances. One could define an expression's contextual intention as a mapping from worlds containing a token of the expression to the extension of that token in that world. The question of what is held constant would then become relevant, one would obtain different sorts of contextual intentions depending on just what one counts as a relevant token. But primary intentions are not defined like this. They simply turn on the epistemic properties of an expression in the actual world. For example, it is epistemically possible, not ruled out a priori, that there are no utterances, and so the primary intention of there are no utterances will be true in an utterance-free world, whereas the contextual intention of there are no utterances will not be defined there. Because properties of counterfactual tokens are irrelevant to the evaluation of primary intentions, except in some special cases, the problem of what is held constant does not arise. Twin Earth intuitions are irrelevant, Soames 2004. Intuitions about the reference of water as used on Twin Earth are irrelevant to the meaning of our term water, as the term water on Twin Earth has a different meaning. Response Again, evaluation of primary intentions does not depend on the reference of homonymous terms in counterfactual worlds. Rather, it depends on certain epistemic properties associated with uses of water in our world. For example, if we are given the information that the liquid in the oceans and lakes is and has always been XYZ, we should conclude that water is XYZ. This is a fact about the inferential role associated with uses of our term water. Epistemic two-dimensionalism uses this inferential role to analyze an aspect of the content of these uses of the term. Names and natural kind terms are not index cycles, NIMS 2004, Soames 2005 two-dimensionalism entails that terms such as water are really disguised index cycles that can pick out different reference in different contexts. But such terms are not index cycles. Any utterance of the English term water in any context picks out H2O. Response, epistemic two-dimensionalism does not entail that names and natural kind terms are disguised index cycles, and it is consistent with the claim that any utterance of the English term water refers to H2O. If primary intentions were Kaplanian characters or contextual intentions, then the claim that water refers to H2O in any context would be inconsistent with the two-dimensionalist claim that the primary intention of water picks out XYZ in the twin Earth world. However, primary intentions are not Kaplanian characters or contextual intentions. To ground the desired behavior of primary intentions, the two-dimensionalist simply requires the plausible claim that it is epistemically possible, i.e., not ruled out a priori, that water is XYZ. This claim is consistent with the claim that, given that water actually refers to H2O, all metaphysically possible tokens of the English term water refer to H2O. Names are not rigidified descriptions, Soames 2005. Two-dimensionalism entails that names and natural kind terms are disguised rigidified descriptions, of the form the actual phi for some phi. However, Kripke's epistemic arguments show that names are not rigidified descriptions, as do considerations concerning the way that names and descriptions behave in belief ascriptions. Response, two-dimensionalism does not entail that names and natural kind terms are rigidified descriptions. I have noted already that Kripke's epistemic arguments are accommodated by the observation that primary intentions cannot always be encapsulated into a description. Furthermore, as noted earlier, 
it is consistent with two-dimensionalism to hold that names and natural kind terms, unlike rigidified descriptions, have the same referent in any context of utterance. It is also consistent with two-dimensionalism to hold that the primary intention of a name or natural kind term may vary between speakers. The account of belief ascriptions given in Chalmers, 2002a, does not entail that names will behave like rigidified descriptions in belief contexts and handles the relevant data straightforwardly. Speakers lack identifying knowledge, Burn and Pryor 2005, Schiffer 2003. Two-dimensionalism requires that every name n, at least as used by a speaker, be associated with a uniqueness property phi, such that at most one individual has phi, and also requires that the speaker have a priori identifying knowledge of the form n is phi, but speakers in general lack this sort of knowledge. Response, two-dimensionalism does not require that speakers possess identifying knowledge. It is true that primary intentions can be associated with uniqueness properties, or better, uniqueness relations, because of the role of centering, but speakers need not have beliefs about these uniqueness properties, example of the form n is phi. Epistemic two-dimensionalism simply requires that speakers have a conditional ability, of the sort discussed in chapter 7, to determine the referent of n, or better, to determine the truth value of claims using n, given relevant information about the character of the actual world and given idealized rational reflection. This conditional ability need not be grounded in the possession of identifying knowledge. Furthermore, the invocation of rational reflection makes this a normative claim that idealizes away from the speaker's cognitive limitations. For example, even if children cannot actually identify a referent across all circumstances, there may still be idealized inferential norms on how they should update their relevant beliefs given relevant information about the world. These norms are all that the framework requires. Ordinary expressions are not ambiguous, Beeler 2002, Marconi 2005. Two-dimensionalism explains the difference in truth value between 1. It is metaphysically necessary that water is H2O. 2. It is epistemically necessary that water is H2O. By saying that water expresses its primary intention in the first context and its secondary intention in the second context, but this entails implausibly that water is ambiguous. Further, this view cannot handle combined contexts such as it is metaphysically necessary but not epistemically necessary that water is H2O. Response dash. Two-dimensionalism does not hold that ordinary expressions are ambiguous. Water has exactly the same content in both 1 and 2. In both contexts, and in all contexts, it has both a primary intention and a secondary intention, or equivalently, it has a complex semantic value involving both a primary and a secondary intention. This does not entail that water is ambiguous any more than the distinction between character and content entails that index cycles are ambiguous. The distinction between 1 and 2 is handled is handled instead by the difference between the modal operators. The semantics of these operators are such that it is metaphysically necessary that S is true when S has a necessary secondary intention, while it is epistemically necessary that S is true when S has a necessary primary intention. Combined contexts are handled in the obvious combined way. Two-dimensionalism cannot handle belief ascriptions, Soames 2005. It is natural for two-dimensionalists to hold that X believes that S is true when the subject has a belief whose primary intention is the primary intention of S, but this view gives the wrong result in a number of cases, and no better two-dimensionalist treatment of belief ascriptions is available. Response the view of belief ascriptions mentioned here is considered and rejected in Chalmers, 2002a, and to the best of my knowledge no two-dimensionalist endorses the view. The account of belief ascriptions developed in Chalmers, 2002a, forthcoming, straightforwardly handles most of the puzzle cases developed by Soames. Two-dimensionalism requires global descriptivism, Stallnaker 2003-2004. Two-dimensionalism holds that the primary intention of an utterance or a belief is determined by the internal state of the speaker or believer. This requires an internalist metasemantic theory, showing how intentional content is determined by internal state. 
The main candidate for such a theory is the global descriptivism of Lewis, 1984, which holds that the content of our utterances and beliefs is determined by whatever assignment of content yields the best fit between the beliefs and the world. But global descriptivism is false. Response, two-dimensionalism does not require global descriptivism. Of course, there is not yet any satisfactory theory of the basis of intentionality, but there are many possible internalist alternatives. For example, one might hold that the primary intention of a mental state is determined in part by its internal functional role and in part by associated phenomenal states, where the latter may be especially relevant for phenomenal and perceptual concepts. The wrong sentences are a priori, two-dimensionalism requires the claim that sentences such as Hesperus, if it exists, is phosphorus are not a priori, while sentences such as Julius, if he exists, invented the zip are a priori. However, these claims are incorrect. The former sentence expresses a trivial singular proposition that can be justified a priori, while the latter sentence expresses a non-trivial singular proposition that cannot be justified a priori. Response if one stipulated that a priority of a name involving sentence is to be understood in terms of the a priori knowability of an associated singular proposition, these, controversial and counterintuitive, claims would be correct. However, the two-dimensionalist takes this as good reason to reject the stipulation or at least stipulates a different understanding of a priority for the purposes of the framework. For these purposes, an utterance can be said to be a priori when it expresses a belief, or at least an occurrent thought, that can be justified non-empirically, yielding a priori knowledge. There is an obvious epistemic difference between beliefs expressed by typical occurrences of Hesperus is Hesperus and Hesperus is Phosphorus. No amount of non-empirical reasoning can convert the latter belief into a priori knowledge, but the former is easily justified a priori. Note that on this definition of a priori, Two different beliefs might be related to the same singular propositional content while differing in their epistemic status, the epistemic status attaches primarily to belief tokens, not to belief types or to propositional contents. This epistemic difference at the level of thought can be used to ground the relevant claims about the a priority of utterances. More generally, the primary intentions of utterances are grounded in the normative, cognitive role of associated thoughts. Primary intentions are not linguistic meaning. Different speakers can use the same name, Fred, or natural kind term, water, with quite different cognitive roles and with distinct patterns of epistemic evaluation. If so, the same expression will have different primary intentions for different speakers. So an expression's primary intention is not part of its linguistic meaning, where this is understood as meaning that is associated with an expression type simply by virtue of the conventions of a language. Response, this point is correct. Primary intentions are not always part of linguistic meaning. For example, it can happen that an identity statement, example Bill Smith is William Smith, can be cognitively insignificant for one speaker, example his wife, who uses the two names interchangeably, but not for another, Example a colleague who uses the names in quite different domains without knowing that they are coextensive. If so, then the primary intentions of the names will coincide for one speaker but not for another, so that the primary intention of at least one of them must vary across speakers. Primary intentions can also vary for context-dependent terms such as tall and heavy. The moral is that for maximal generality, primary intentions should be associated with expression tokens, or with utterances of expression types, rather than with expression types. Primary intentions are insufficiently fine-grained. Cognitively distinct expressions may have the same primary intentions. When expressions are equivalent a priori, their primary intentions will coincide. For example, logical and mathematical truths all have the same primary intention, true in all scenarios, and have the same secondary intention, too but these truths clearly differ in meaning and in cognitive significance. So two-dimensional semantic values do not exhaust meaning, or utterance content, and are not as fine-grained as free gene senses. Response, 
a two-dimensionalist can accommodate many of the relevant cases here by invoking structured intentions. This will distinguish between different logical and mathematical truths, for example. The only residual problem will arise if there are pairs of simple expressions that are equivalent a priori but are cognitively distinct. It is not obvious that there are such pairs, but if there are, there is more to meaning than primary intentions. We might say that primary intentions individuate expressions by their idealized cognitive significance and so do not capture differences in known idealized cognitive significance. One might try to capture these differences by moving to intentions that are defined over a space of finer-grained epistemic possibilities. Alternatively, a two-dimensionalist might simply allow that, in addition to intentions, expressions are associated with finer-grained semantic values, such as the structured semantic values discussed earlier, that lie behind and determine these intentions. In any case, this point is no threat to the two-dimensionalist who is a semantic pluralist. Primary and secondary intentions are not all there is to meaning, but utterances can nevertheless be associated with primary and secondary intentions in a way that can play the various explanatory roles described earlier. There are epistemic possibilities that correspond to no centered world, Yablo 999, 2000, and 2. A key two dimensionalist claim holds that when S is not ruled out a priori, then there is some centered world at which the primary intention of S is true. This may be so for typical Kripken a posteriori necessities such as water is not H2O, but there are other sentences for which the claim is false. For example, it may be that the existence, or non-existence, of a god is necessary without being a priori. If so, there is no god, or there is a god, is not ruled out a priori, but it is necessarily false. There appears to be no relevant difference between primary and secondary intentions here, so the primary intention is true in no possible world. Something similar applies if the laws of nature in our world are the laws of all possible worlds. If these views are correct, then the space of epistemic possibilities outstrips the space of metaphysical possibilities in a way that falsifies the two-dimensionalist claim. Response All of these purported counterexamples rest on controversial claims about modality or a priority, and I argue in Chapter 6 that none of them succeed. I also argue there that the concept of metaphysical modality itself has roots in the epistemic domain, so that there cannot be strong necessities that exhibit this sort of disconnect between epistemic and metaphysical modalities. Still, the existence or non-existence of strong necessities is a delicate and controversial issue. A two-dimensionalist can remain neutral on this issue by understanding scenarios not as centered metaphysically possible worlds but instead as maximal epistemic possibilities. Then even if no metaphysically possible world verifies there is no God, some maximal epistemic possibility will verify there is no God, so there will be a scenario at which the primary intention of the sentence will be true. Understood in this neutral way, two-dimensionalism does not ground inferences from conceivability to metaphysical possibility, those inferences will turn on a further claim about the relationship between scenarios and metaphysically possible worlds, but it can still play much the same role as before in the epistemic and semantic domains. This version of the framework suffices for the purposes of chapters 8, 9, 11, and 12, although not for the purposes of chapter 6. Complete canonical specifications are not available, Schroeder 2004. Epistemic two-dimensionalism requires that there be semantically neutral specifications of a given scenario that are complete in that they epistemically determine the truth value of arbitrary judgments. However, there may be some features of the world, such as intrinsic physical features, that cannot be captured in a semantically neutral specification. Response, it is not clear whether there are intrinsic properties that cannot be captured in a semantically neutral specification, but if there are, this will be irrelevant to epistemically determining the truth value of any of our sentences. When information about these features is needed to epistemically determine the truth value of a sentence in a scenario, a semantically neutral characterization of the features, example an existential or a Ramsey sentence characterization, will suffice. 
such a characterization may not suffice for metaphysical determination and for evaluating truth values of sentences in counterfactual worlds according to their secondary intentions, but semantically neutral specifications are needed only for primary intentions. The minimal size of a vocabulary that can epistemically determine the truth of all sentences is an important open question, which I address in forthcoming work, but there is good reason to believe that some semantically neutral, and index -ical, vocabulary suffices. It should also be noted that if we take the purely epistemic approach to scenarios described in the previous response, a restriction to semantically neutral vocabulary is not needed, and so the issue here does not arise. Objections to the role of a priority, Block and Stallnaker 1999, Yablo 2002. It is true that there is an epistemic relation between information about the world and claims about reference. For example, given the information that we are in the H2O world, appropriately characterized, we should conclude that water is H2O, and given the information that we are in the XYZ world, we should conclude that water is XYZ. It is also true that we can make these conditional inferences from the armchair without needing to perform further investigation of the environment. Nevertheless, these inferences are not justified a priori. The inferences are justified in part by background empirical knowledge of the world, Block and Stallnaker 1999, or by peeking at our own judgments, Yablo 2002. As a result, primary intentions are not connected to a priority as strongly as the two-dimensionalist supposes. Response, in Chapter 7, Jackson and I argue that these connections are in fact a priori. Although empirical facts about the world can play a causal role in determining the relevant patterns of inference, there is good reason to believe that they do not play a justifying role. Chalmers 2002b response to Yablo. It is also worth noting that even a skeptic about a priority can use the epistemic two-dimensional framework. Even if the relevant inferential connections are not a priori, one can still use them to define primary intentions, and the resulting primary intentions will still behave much as they are supposed to, assigning a necessary intention to Hesperus is Hesperus but not to Hesperus is Phosphorus, for example. The connection between primary intentions and a priority will be lost, but primary intentions will still be strongly connected to the epistemic domain.